joint meeting of city council, our regular meeting, and our Shoreline Regional Park Community special meeting of April 27, 2021. I'm going to read the usual announcement as required. This meeting will be conducted in accordance with State of California Executive Order N-29-20, dated March 17, 2020. All members of the City Council are participating in this meeting by video conference with no physical meeting location. Members of the public wishing to observe the meeting live may do so at mountainview.legistar.com, on YouTube at mountainview.gov slash YouTube, and on Comcast Channel 26. As noted on the meeting agenda, members of the public may provide oral public comments during the public comment period for an item by signing up at mountainview.gov slash cc underscore speakers or by phone by dialing 669-900-9128 and entering webinar ID 989-3776-6577. Any emails received by 4.30 p.m. today were received directly by the City Council. Emails received after 4.30 p.m. will not be read during the meeting, but will be entered into the record for the meeting. All votes will be taken by roll call vote. So I'd like to ask you to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Now we'll now turn it over to, I think I'm gonna turn it over to our new city city clerk, Glazer, um, who will do the roll call, attendance by roll call. Council member Abby Koga. Here. Council member Hicks. Councilmember Lieber? Here. Councilmember Matichuk? Here. Councilmember Showalter? Here. Vice Mayor Ramirez? Here. Mayor Kamei? Here. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we'll move on to item two, which is our swearing in ceremony for our city clerk. So we'll move on to item 2.1, which is the oath of office for our city clerk. Heather Glazier. Am I saying that right, Heather? Okay. We will now view the swearing in of our new city clerk via pre recorded video. So let's roll the video. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, I, state your name, Heather Glazer, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith, that I will bear true faith, and allegiance, and allegiance, to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and that I will well and faithfully, discharge the duties, discharge the duties, upon which, upon which, I'm about to enter, I'm about to enter, congratulations, thank you. Yay! Virtual applause. <laughs> Wonderful. What a great video. Thanks so much. Um, City Clerk Glazier, would you like to say a few words? I just wanted to say it's an honor and privilege to be with you all this evening. It's only been about a week that I've been on the job, but I've already had such a warm welcome from the council and the staff and the community. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for your support, and I'm really looking forward to the days and weeks and months and years to follow. So thank you. Thank you so much. We're very, very happy to um, have you with us. Um, would any member of council like to, to say a few words to uh, our new city clerk pleasure? Uh, well, I can I can start things off here. Um, so 
purchased um, after you know several months of, of um, working with our wonderful interim city clerk, Ms. Vonder Linden, who we'll be honoring later. It's just really nice to have our permanent city clerk here with us. And we know you moved um, from Southern California to Northern California. We won't say which side is better uh, of the state, um, but we were just thrilled to have you. And um, thank you for serving our city of Mountain View. We really appreciate it. Uh, Council Member Hicks. Yeah, I'll keep it super short. I just want to say I'm sorry we aren't here in person to welcome you. It's kind of strange to, to welcome you from, and to be saying goodbye to Sylvia, but to welcome you from while I'm sitting, frankly, in my dining room alone. Um, but uh, I hope to welcome you in person very soon. Thank you. Councilmember Mattachek. Thank you. So, Heather, we are so happy you are here. Um, welcome. We really look forward to working with you. Um, I feel like we've got uh, a lot going on in here in Mountain View, but I know you are up for it. And we greatly appreciate you uh, being our new city clerk. So thank you and welcome. Okay, thank you. Council Member Abekola. Thank you. I just wanted to say a quick welcome aboard. We're, we're glad to have you. Um, we went through quite an extensive process to, to find our new city clerk. And um, it's great that you rose to the top. And I look forward to working with you um, for the next several years. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Walter. Yeah, I just want to add to all the welcomes. We're very glad you're here. We were really impressed by your um, all of your qualifications and uh, certainly all we've seen just in this first week <laughs> has been great. So we're looking forward to um, working with you for many years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Lieber. I know that I speak for everyone in saying that we're really thankful to have you on board and you're, you're joining a, a very strong uh, appointee team. And um, I know that the city clerk's office staff has been able to greet you and work with you um, so far and is really looking forward to the time ahead. So all good wishes for success. Great, thank you. Well, welcome again, uh, Ms. Glazier. We're, we're thrilled to, to have you. So I'd now like to turn it over to public comment. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on your phone. And we'll do a two minute timer uh, displayed on the screen if possible. And we'll start with Alexander Brown. Hey Heather, uh, welcome to the city. You have no idea what you just got into, but it's gonna be fun. And I look forward to working with you. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Brown. All right. That looks like it concludes our public speakers. So we can turn it back to council. And I'd like to move on to item three, which are our presentations. So we'll start with item 3.1, which is our Monarch Preservation and Natural Habitats Proclamation. And I know that there are quite a few people from, I think, the public who um, are in attendance about this one. So I'll just read the proclamation. Whereas the monarch butterfly is an iconic North American species whose multi-generational migration and metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly has captured the imagination of millions of Americans. And whereas both the Western and Eastern monarch populations have seen significant declines with less than 1% of the Western monarch population remaining while the Eastern population has fallen by as much as 90%. And whereas I, Ellen Kamei, Mayor of the City of Mountain View, signed the National Wildlife Federation's Mayor's Monarch Pledge and have included the following meaningful actions to protect the monarch butterfly. And whereas the City of Mountain View has committed to the following three actions as part of the pledge. One, continue the native plant enhancement project at Shoreline at Mountain View that has been ongoing for the past 10 years to increase biodiversity to benefit many local species, including monarch butterflies. Two, engage with the community garden groups and urge them to plant native milkweeds and nectar producing plants. And three, host a native seed giveaway facilitated 
through the Mountain View Public Library's Seed Library Program to make milkweed seeds available to the public with additional education and outreach, a butterfly friendly planting being conducted as part of the city's Arbor Day Tree Giveaway Program. And whereas every resident of the city of Mountain View can make a difference by planting native milkweed and nectar plants to provide habitat for monarch butterfly and pollinators in locations where people live, work, play, learn, and worship. Now, therefore, I, Alan Mayor of the City of Mountain View, along with my colleagues on the City Council, do hereby proclaim April 27th as the Mayor's Monarch Pledge Day. Uh, would any member of Council like to say a few words before we turn it over to public comment? Council Member Hicks. Um, I just wanted to say I, I find this very important and I've had a lot of members of the public encourage us to do this and I, you know, I, I recently learned that uh, biodiversity loss and species extinction is um, a, a problem, you know, large as large and on par with, with uh, climate crisis, um, but that we can do things about it in the city. Um, that as we as we turn more and more of our rural land over to monoculture with pesticides, if we change over, do many of the actions that you just named uh, in our own yards, our parks, and um, you know the the planting strips and other opportunity areas in the city, we can uh, turn species extinction around. So thank you so much for declaring the proclamation. Thank you, Council Member Hicks. I was I was happy to. Anyone else want to provide a, a few words before we go to the public? All right, seeing no other hands, I'll turn it over to the public so we can do um, another timer for two minutes. And we have um, Bruce England. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Kame. Um, I know that Green Spaces Mountain View members and others in the community will be pleased to see that you've chosen to sign the pledge. Of course, signing the pledge is just the first step. Now to come are the further steps we need to take to support what the pledge represents. This means providing guidance and reference materials to those in the community endeavoring to make the best decisions around their planning choices. And further, that we follow the same guidelines for city properties, including parks and other open spaces and for schools and businesses. There's been much discussion lately in Mountain View around expanding green spaces throughout our infrastructure, including in proximity to walkways and bikeways, realizing the concept of complete green streets along the way for our city. Um, I'll just mention that monarch butterflies are but one among many pollinator species, and plant choices can differ among them. So for those hoping to participate in all of this, please consider all pollinators that are compatible with our region. Thanks. Great, thank you. Shawnee Kleinhouse. Good evening, Mayor Kame and City Council members. Thank you for signing the pledge. It's wonderful to see this um, great intent and project moving forward. Um, our organization helped with the uh, restoration project on Permanent the Creek at Shoreline, and our volunteers really enjoyed it. And it's the outcome is absolutely lovely. So thank you for that too. And um, hopefully you can bring back the butterflies. It's so sad to see that they're gone. And I do want to support what Bruce said, which is really could, you know, like tree giveaways, maybe give a milkweed to everyone who's willing to plant it in his garden, you know. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Annette Hertz. Yeah, hello, this, this is Annette. Um, I'm actually here for a different meeting. Um, and I'm very pleased to hear that I, I have been working from home for the last year now, and I have twice have seen a monarch in my garden. So they are in Mountain View. And uh, um, I really like the idea of the, uh, um, the, the seed, the milkweed seed giveaway. I would totally be in line for that one. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I couldn't unmute my own self. <laughs> Celia Palmer. Hi. Um, 
I'm also with Green Spaces Mountain View, um, and um, I really appreciate um, your pledge, and I'm really excited for that in Mountain View's future. I would love if Mountain View could become one of the bee cities USA, um, supporting pollinate lots and different pollinators. Um, and um, I appreciate all the actions we're going to take, and I'd also love to see things at the um, city level, for instance, um, eliminating the use of pesticides and uh, herbicides within our city parks. Um, so while we encourage our residents to do that, we can start um, with, you know, looking internally um, at that, too. I know I love that in Los Altos they have the sign saying, excuse our weeds, we don't spray here. So maybe we could do something similar to that. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Linda Ruthruff? Hi, I'm Linda Ruthruff. I'm the conservation chair of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Uh, we are thrilled that you're planning to plant milkweed. We're thrilled that there's become an understanding that the choices we make in our gardens and in our landscaping have a huge impact on the environment and on other creatures. Um, I would also like to um, say that the monarch butterfly isn't the only butterfly that's in trouble, unfortunately. And so it's not just native milkweed that needs to be planted. It's uh, a lot of butterflies have a sp specific plant that they need for their eggs and for their caterpillars to grow on. So you know, to be able to expand this a little more would be wonderful to start looking into what are the pollinators that are in trouble in this area and what can we plant in addition to milkweed that will help them all survive. So thank you for taking this on and it's a very exciting project. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, I think that concludes our public comment. So I will um, bring it back to item 3.2, which is our recognition of our outgoing interim city clerk, Sylvia Vonder Linden. And Ms. Vonder Linden, is she back? Okay, there you are. I see your camera on now, wonderful. Okay, so I'd like to read the proclamation first. The proclamation reads, was the office of the city clerk a time honored and vital part of local government exists throughout the world and the oldest among public servants. And whereas interim city clerk Sylvia Vonderlinden has provided expert assistance and a can-do attitude with city clerk recruitment was underway. And whereas interim city clerk Sylvia Vonderlinden provided needed help, need, sorry, needed leadership to this office of the city clerk and diligently served the Mountain View community from November, 2020 through April, 2021. And whereas the city council, city staff, and the city of Mountain View recognize the invaluable contribution of interim city clerk Sylvia Vonder Linden during her tenure with us. Now, therefore, I, Ellen Kamei, Mayor of the City of Mountain View, along with my colleagues on the city council, do recognize interim city clerk Sylvia Vonder Linden and further extend appreciation to her for the vital services she performed and the exemplary dedication she showed to the Mountain View community and residents. Uh, would any member, yes, let's give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> and um, would any member of the council like to, to say a few words? Yes, council member Hicks. Yeah, I'll keep it short and sweet, but thank you so much, Sylvia. I, I have to say I was a little, scared when we went clerkless that uh, nobody would be able to step in in the interim and you more than fulfilled my expectations you made it you, you know I, I didn't see everything behind the scenes but you made it easy and thank you so much and i, I personally will miss you thank you council member abe koga Yes, thank you, Sylvia, for all of your um, dedication. I think you hit the ground running as soon as you joined us, and we didn't miss a beat, and I'm just, just uh, really um, impressed and um, grateful. And mostly I'm just, I really enjoy working with you, your um, positivity, your, um, your, your energy, just really, um, you know, kept things running and um, always made me smile. 
And so um, thank you again um, for all that you've done and we'll miss you, but please keep in touch. Councilmember Matichek. Thank you. So Sylvia, I just want to say thank you very much for filling in during this time. We really appreciate all that you've done for the council and the city and I wish you all the best and thank you again. Thank you. Councilmember Lieber. I uh, just so much appreciate everything that you've done for us. You kind of dropped in like the, the Mary Poppins of city clerks <laughs> and have been so wonderful with the public and with all of the staff and so patient with us as council members. So we thank you so much and uh, don't be a stranger. We want to see you in Mountain View. Um, because we definitely count you as one of ours now from now on permanently. So thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you, Councilmember Showalter. Yeah, I just want to echo what lots of people have said. It's been a pleasure to work with you, and I really appreciate all the effort you went to to help onboard um, me and uh, Sally as we, we joined the council this January. And um, best wishes and don't be a stranger that would be terrible thank you great thank you city manager mccarthy thank you mayor so uh sylvia i want to just thank you so much on behalf of all the council appointees and the department head team and the whole organization for stepping up and being there for us when we needed it um, i've had the pleasure of working with you in two places now and um, as everyone said, your positivity and your passion for the career and being a clerk is certainly something that everyone knows and can see and feel. So thank you so much for everything that you've done. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, I have to get um, my thanks into Sylvia, which is I, I've never met a more humble public servant than you. I know that you didn't even want us to put this on the agenda tonight, <laughs> but we couldn't let you get away without us being able to express our thanks, especially since we've had to interact, you know, for the most part, completely virtually. And so what an interesting time to have to, um, you know, come back and, and come back to the profession, because I think that you came out of retirement just to help us. So we are just so grateful that you came back in the middle of, you know, a, a, a global pandemic. And um, we're just, we're so grateful to have done that. And then you've just been all about service to our, our residents and in our community. And you've really just exemplified what it means, I think, to be a city clerk, but also to be a public servant. So we're just, okay. it's, a, it's an honor to have had the opportunity to work with you, even in this brief time. So thank you so much. It was my honor and my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very touched. Thank you. Good. All right. All right. So I'd also like to um, uh, open it up for public comment. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide public comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or star nine on your phone. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Von Der Oh, I, I we snuck a hand up. I don't. I saw a hand and then it disappeared. <laughs> Oh, I, I hope that's not Alex messing with me there. <laughs> um, well, I think we just need to give another virtual round of applause to Ms. Vonderlin, and thank you so much for your service to the city of Mountain View. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, so now we can move on to item um, 3.3, which is our COVID-19 update by our city manager, um, Ms. Kimber McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. I'm going to start sharing my screen now for the update. Okay. So we'll start off like I always do with uh, just a snapshot of where we're at right now with our numbers. So uh, countywide, we are uh, almost at 118,000 positive cases since COVID began. In Mountain View, we have a little over 3,000 cases. Um, since the last update on April 13th, there have been 67 new cases. So um, although the numbers are definitely trending downward, as we all know, we are still seeing 
a, a decent number of cases countywide and um, even here in Mountain View, they're just not increasing as much as we've seen over the last several months. Um, so this is another uh, dashboard that I've uh, shown very often and it really is um, indicative of how the county has ramped up the vaccine efforts. So what you're looking at here is a snapshot of how many vaccines have been given. So the blue line represents the first dose of vaccines. The green, uh, the green lines represent uh, the second dose. So those two combined um, are residents that have had their full, full doses. And the pink that you see along the top is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so those are counted as both doses. Um, as we all know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is only one dose. So right now, uh, countywide, there is 36.7% of residents over the age of 16 that have been vaccinated. So uh, they definitely are seeing higher numbers of people um, getting vaccinated, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. Uh, and there's also a lot more appointments that are available now than have been in the past. So uh, this is very encouraging news that we're at almost 37% countywide. So I hope with the next update, we will be close to 50%. In terms of what's going on with the county vaccine update, so as I mentioned, right now there are open appointments at all county sites right now for anyone who wants to be vaccinated who's over 16. Uh, the county is also going to be opening up more evening, weekend, and even walk-in appointments, so this is new. Um, the goal is to have at least 40% of uh, folks vaccinated by the end of June, but uh, it could, could take longer. Uh, depending on how many people are able to get in with all of these open appointments and depending on walk-ins, it could even be um, higher than that. Yesterday, the county announced that all of um, or most all of the county vaccination sites will accept drop-ins, and that does also include our site here in Mountain View at the community center. So you'll see on this slide that our drop-in appointments, or excuse me, just the drop-ins are available through this Friday from 8.30 to 5.45 p.m. Uh, you can still schedule appointments using the sccfreevax.org. Um, also, I'll note that just last week, the Bay Area Health Officers did concur with the findings of uh, the Scientific Review Board that said that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is safe and that Bay Area health providers are resuming the administration of that vaccine. In terms of where we're at with reopening the economy, we are still in the orange tier. We have been in the orange tier since the 24th of March, so it's been about five weeks. Um, this chart that you're seeing shows how a county can move from one tier to the next. So again, we're in that orange tier. So in order for us to move to the yellow tier, which allows for more of the economic sectors to be open, we have to have an adjusted case rate below 2%. So right now our case rate is at 3.2. So we're a little too high to move into that next yellow tier. But again, as more uh, vaccines are administered and as more people are um, getting vaccinated, we hope that we see that, that number come down so that we can move into that yellow tier. In terms of how many um, vaccines we've done, so far we have vaccinated almost 51,000 uh, vaccines at our uh, community center. And just last week alone, there were almost 7,000 vaccines. So again, um, drop-ins are allowed. We do have extended hours continuing through May 7th. That's Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 6.30 p.m. So they are offering uh, more evening hours. Um, testing is still encouraged. Um, we already have done a little over 16,000 tests at city facilities since last summer um, and a little over 4,000 in 2021. Um, then moving to an update on our rent relief program, uh, there really isn't too much of a change from the last update. And that's because we are still um, administering the funding to uh, CSA and they are working through other funding sources. So, uh, so far there's a little over 2,000 checks that have been cut uh, and almost $4.4 million worth of the program. I also wanna let everyone know that we are really close um, to finishing our home key Mountain View site. So the pictures that you're seeing are 
pictures of our construction in action, and you can see one of the modular units being placed there on the bottom. Uh, this is our 90 to 100 day, 120 day interim housing program. So it will house single adults or uh, couples and families um, and really try and help them return to a more stable housing option. Uh, we have partnered with Life Moves for this. And we are really hopeful that construction will be complete uh, by the end of this week. So we are anticipating that clients will be able to move in by next month. And I would just encourage everyone to visit the mountainview.gov slash home key webpage. Uh, we will have a grand opening details for this site really soon. Um, so you can go to that website and get all of the updates. So before I close, I will end by thanking uh, city staff and for this week's thank you, it goes to our Center for the Performing Arts staff for launching our very first virtual Mountain View Film Festival. Uh, this festival offered 26 films in two days and it was a mix of feature films and documentaries, short films, and even films that uh, people shot on their mobile phones. And the theme was race, equity, and inclusion. Films from around the world were screened everywhere from Iran, France, Canada, Spain, the UK, and of course, all over the United States. Uh, they also arranged four panels with industry experts on ways to include more voices of people with disabilities, um, equity opportunities for the youth voice, and even creating more diversity in sounds uh, behind the scenes. So I want to thank them for putting this really innovative and fun virtual event together. They did a tremendous job on it um, just these past few days ago from, the, from April 24th to 25th. So with that, I will just remind everyone to mask up, um, do a drop-in vaccine appointment if you can, make an appointment, and continue to stay safe and healthy. So thank you, Mayor. I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you. Do any council members have any questions for the city manager about her presentation? Okay. All right, would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click raise hand in Zoom or press star nine on your phone and we'll display the two minute timer. We have our first hand here. Oh. <laughs> Maybe this will be my fate tonight. The hand disappeared. <laughs> so we can bring it, we can bring it back. All right, so um, I just, I'll just share, I know that today we had a, a pop-up vaccine site at St. Joseph's Parish Church on Hope Street, um, which, I, which I did stop by. Um, they said that they had about um, 500 um, doses available for folks, so tried to work to spread the word. And so we, the pop-ups have been um, something that the community has been asking for because you don't have to make the appointment. You can just drop in whenever you need. And so as we hear more about this, we'll be sure to, to work to make sure that the community is hearing about this. But it was a completely fabulous partnership with St. Joseph's Parish. They already had this really large um, tent um, in their courtyard. And what was wonderful is it provided a really cool location for them to get the um, vaccines uh, all ready and set to go. So um, that we got lots of positive feedback from our county who said we had a great, great facility and we were easy to work with. So that's wonderful. All right. I think that concludes our presentations for item three. So we'll move on to item four, which is our consent calendar. These items will be approved by one motion, unless any member of the council wishes to remove an item for the discussion. The reading of the full text of resolutions and ordinances will be waived unless a council member requests otherwise. A motion to approve the consent calendar should include reading the title of the ordinance attached to item 4.2. Would any member of the council like to pull an item? Council member Matichek. Thank you. Um, I just want to register a no vote on item 4.1. Um, I think the 2019, minute, 2019 minutes need another pass, uh, similar to the last time we talked about these. So I'm just registering a no vote on 4.1. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lieber. Well, thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll be abstaining on the 2019 minutes and um, 
Voting only on the 41321 council minutes on um, item 4.1. Okay. Anything else from council members? City Clerk Glazier, did you get those um, abstentions that we'll be able to note? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so if no members would like to pull an item, um, would any member of the public on the line like to provide uh, comments on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on your phone. All right, I'm not seeing any. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mayor. I'll go ahead and move the consent count calendar, uh, including 4.2, adopt an ordinance of the city of Mountain View, adding Article 5 to Chapter 38 of the Mountain View City Code relating to firearms on city property. To be read in title only for the reading waived. And I'll also note um, the no vote recorded by Council Member uh, Matichak uh, for 4.1 and the abstention recorded by uh, Council Member Lieber also for 4.1. Um, I do have comments on one item, but I'll wait for a second. Okay. Council Member Abe Koga. I second the motion. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. S Council Member Showalter, did you have a comment? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Ramirez, would you like to, your motion has been seconded by Council Member Abe Koga, so if you'd like to make your comment. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try and be pretty brief. So I submitted several questions related to 4.3, um, professional services, contract for planning services, and I appreciate uh, the responses from staff. Um, and so I'll be supporting the item, but I did want to highlight uh, the response to question one was a little alarming to me, uh, that the two vacancies for the planning roles have uh, have been vacant <laughs> for, for a lot longer than I was anticipating. Um, and uh, I know we're currently working on a study or evaluation of CDD, so I'm hoping that there's uh, a lot that we can learn about ways to fill these vacancies and um, you know address some of the challenges associated with staffing within that department. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to flag that as, as an issue that I think we do need to do a deeper dive on, especially relative to the other vacancies that were provided by staff. Again, thank you uh, for, for a later item. These two have been vacant for, for an unusually long period of time, which is why we have the need for contract services. But I think ideally we'd find a way to, to fill these roles. And if this isn't working, I think of some other way of, uh, of addressing these concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hicks. Yeah, I just want to strongly support what Council Member Ramirez just said. I think those are important positions to fill. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any other comments on the motion? Okay, seeing none, I will turn it over to City Clerk Blazier for the roll call vote. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Yes. Council Member Abby Koga. Aye. Councilmember Hicks? Yes. Councilmember Lieber? Aye. Councilmember Matichek? Yes. Councilmember Showalter? Yes. Mayor Kamei? Yes. Motion carries? Great. Thank you. All right. So that closes um, item four. So we can move on to item five, which is oral communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the council on any matter not on the agenda. Speakers are allowed to speak on any topic for up to three minutes during this section. State law prohibits the council from acting on non-agenda items. Please note that later tonight in item 7.1, the council will be hearing the budget status report and updates to the general operating fund forecast and American Rescue Plan Act funding. If you have comments related to that discussion, it is appropriate to make them during the public comment period for item 7.1. As we start with oral communications, Shawnee Kleinhouse made arrangements in advance to share a presentation and will have up to seven minutes to present if the following members are also uh, in the attendee box, which are Annette Hertz, Jim Zorski, 
Celia Palmer, Somali Bala, April Webster, Guli Kiana Pendleton, Catherine Trejo, Linda Ruthreff, Mackenzie Mossing, Doug Raybert, Jill Halloran, and Matthew Daughter. I know we're double checking. It looks like everyone is here. Yes, I see the city clerk shaking her head. All right, so we will turn it over to Shawnee Kleinhouse for her seven minute presentation. And I am going to go and unmute you, Shawnee. There you go. Thank you. So, uh, the presentation I'm giving tonight is on behalf of Green Spaces Mountain View and Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And just kind of trying to raise awareness about light at night and the impacts on our ecosystems and our health. And this is a picture of the Milky Way taken from Skyline Boulevard above Cupertino. Next slide will show you what light pollution looks like from um, the from space and you can see population centers in North America, including the Bay Area. The next slide, please, will show you uh, where Mountain View is in the Bay Area. You can see the Bay, you can see Sacramento, and you can see that it is very, very bright. Uh, so why is that a problem? So next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we don't see the Milky Way anymore. We basically don't see the twinkle, twinkle little star that we all sang uh, uh, and maybe still do. And light is sort of like sugar. We crave it, we want it, we like it, and it's not that good for us. So there is a uh, light that we look at in terms of artificial light at night, when, uh, whether we need it and sometimes we have too much. When we use light that we don't need or it's too much light, we call it light pollution. And the transition to LED that we have all experienced really helped us with benefits of saving energy and saving maintenance and cost, but also have the drawback that uh, there is more and brighter lighting and harmful spectrums. And I'll get a little bit more into the spectrum that we use and the wavelengths. So, and why that is important. So, like, oops, uh, next. Uh, the biological effects of light, they affect all living things, whether it's a plant or bacteria or an elephant or a shark or a human, because the response to light is so is biological. We, we evolve with light. And so daily and seasonal uh, changes in lighting provide uh, our cues for physiological and behavioral um, um, biological responses that include anything from um, mating or migration or just even sleep and diseases in humans. Um, also, attraction to light is detrimental for a lot of insects and birds. And, you know, maybe when we look at monarchs, can also look at some of the moths at night that are attracted to light and usually die in that because of that. And light pollution is indicated as one of the reasons why we're losing insects on the planet. Next. So the light spectrum that is harmful, what you see here is a, a spectrum of the light and light when we look at it is white or yellow, but inside it has wavelengths and the arrows show you the blue light that is included in the light that we see as yellow or white. It's measured in Kelvin and the color temperature, the more blue it has, the more harmful it is. Uh, street lights in Mountain View are 4,000 Kelvin. You can see it has with the arrow showing you a very large blue peak, meaning it's not very uh, healthy. Uh, but now Mountain View is moving in neighborhoods to 3,000 uh, Kelvin in residential areas, which is better and can still do better and eliminate the entire blue spectrum if you get to 2,400. Next. Uh, so these are just lights on Villa and Brian. <laughs> one of them is white and one of them is yellow. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because people really prefer the yellowish tint of the color of the light to the uh, white. And these lights are next to each other. It's just one of them. Is, I don't know why. One is yellow and one is white. Next. Um, and this is really interesting because in Tucson they did an experiment and dimmed the lights and measured from the satellite to see what happens when we dim the lights to 30% of normal on street lights. What they found out is they saved a lot of energy, 
light pollution decreased, people did not complain because eyes are really good at adjusting to light, to dark, if it's not completely dark, right? And uh, there was no more accidents, no additional uh, complaints or, or, um, or safety issues. But what they did find is that a lot of the light pollution did not come from city lights. And because of that, the recommendations they made, um, the study, the people who studied this, they recommended that cities should actually look at both uh, private properties, whether it be a car dealership or an office or anything, a parking lot, and their own lights in devising how to reduce light pollution and make it a better environment for people and for all the wildlife that still share our uh, landscape. So next one is um, the city of Cupertino. They just passed uh, recently, a few weeks ago, the bird safe design and dark sky ordinance. As soon as they passed it, the recommendations from the International Dark Sky Association changed. <laughs> but um, so maybe when you do yours, it will be a little better. Um, but they did look at uh, private properties and separately the city, not including the ordinance, but being addressed are city lights. Uh, in San Jose, next slide, uh, they have um, in, uh, citywide design guidelines and standards and there's a lot of over lighting there but they do say to keep the maximum color temperature for outdoor lighting below 2700 kelvin which is very good and this is for private properties at least during the migration uh, except for outdoor uh, for celebration in, in in around christmas time they allow more lighting then same with uh cupertino next I think that's my light, last slide. Uh, slide that ju just says, use only the light you need. You need just as much, no more. Shield the light so they don't, you don't spill the light to the sky and not to your neighbors. Choose warm lights rather than cold lights. That's the spectrum of the uh, how much Kelvin you use. And use a lot of timers and motion sensors and so on to make sure that you um, don't use light when you don't need to. Um, there's a lot more, but I only have seven minutes and I'm probably over, so thank you. <laughs> Just in the nick of time, Shani. <laughs> Perfect timing. So, um, I'll be, I think you know we're, we're not able to um, engage on this since it's uh, a non-agendized item. Um, so we aren't able, able to ask any other questions of you. But thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so we'll move on to um, our oral, our regular oral communications from the public, which will be three minutes. So if we could just get the three minute timer up and our first speaker will be Gracia Alfaro. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Grecia Alfaro Ruiz y yo soy una estudiante en la Universidad de uh, el Estado de San José en el programa de maestría del trabajo social. I am here today to talk about the people who are impacted by the Mountain View Motorhome Ban, Measure C. Estoy aquí ahora para hablar sobre las personas que están afectadas por la provisión de las casas móviles en las calles de Mountain View. Yo tuve el gran honor de poder hablar con algunos de los residentes de las casas móviles. Yo tengo algo en común con ellos. Nacimos en un país que no tiene los suficientes recursos para cuidar a su gente apropiadamente. Y vinimos a los Estados Unidos a buscar una vida diferente. We migrated to the United States looking for, for different opportunities. With this policy, the city of Mountain View is criminalizing poverty. The individuals living in motorhomes cannot afford housing, which is often why they live in motor homes. Asking them to relocate their homes is problematic alone, and spending almost a million dollars on signs to enforce this ban is concerning, especially when the root issue here is lack of affordable housing. I strongly demand that the city council members reconsider the negative impacts that this policy is having on vulnerable populations, and that they assess that the money that they are spending on these signs, it's a lot of money for signs. I believe that this money could be use more wisely um, and I also demand that community members who voted for this policy take some time to visualize the people who are directly impacted by their vote. Think about the mother who works two jobs and is still unable to afford housing. 
Think about the young woman who is going to college during a pandemic and does not have access to use electricity to do her homework or attend Zoom meetings. Or the elderly man who has worked his whole life in the United States and his social security benefits are not enough to pay for an apartment. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Alexander Kondrakin. Yes, hello. Right. Hello. Good, good evening, City Council members. My name is Alex Kondrahan. I'm currently getting my, I'm currently working towards my Master's of Social Work with San Jose State University and have been working within social services and different agencies for the past three years throughout Santa Clara and parts of San Mateo County. I've seen and worked with a lot of individuals who are struggling to survive in our county and have from the fight to secure consistent housing to finding both physical and mental health services, I have seen the challenges that these people face daily. I'm here to speak to you about the RV ban that had gone to full effect this month. The ban would have people and their families forced to move or potentially have their home towed away or be forced to pay fines that frankly cannot be paid. My colleagues and I have gone out and spoken with individuals who live in these communities and there are a few themes that we have heard that I'd like to bring to the attention of the City Council. The first and biggest theme was of desperation and hopelessness among those who live, who live there. The pandemic has shown and highlighted the daily struggles that has not been seen in the public eye. Jobs were lost and finances were destroyed for many. I believe I could safely assume that everyone here has felt the financial panic that this pandemic has created. The people who, in this, who live in this community are not an exception. The people that live in these communities work constantly to be able to afford the bare necessities. It becomes a matter of choosing certain necessities over others. Do I eat today or do I buy gas and stay warm for the night? No individual should be forced to make that choice. Another thing that I want to address was the feeling of being betrayed or the feeling of being stereotyped. In our interviews, individuals express that the criticism that the people living in these RVs are either alcoholics or drug addicts, drug addicts was felt among the community and government. When bans such as these happens, it characterizes the population in a negative light and from a case manager perspective, adds unnecessary layers when working with these individuals. They don't trust us to help them. But I'm not gonna sit here and demonize you. I believe the demonstrations in 2019 against the ban that you were fully understanding of the costs. I understand that Measure C was passed with the will of the majority and that civil servants, and as civil servants, you uphold the majority wants. Where I do ask for your effort and leadership though is in the creation and support of expanding self safe parking options for these individuals and increasing services that are being given to them. Home key is a start, but more is needed. The people want to help and they're being great, they want to be part of the greater community, but it cannot be done when these options are limited to only what is easy. Just as easy as it is to spend nearly $1 million on signs, we must be as easy to create additional solutions rather than the typical California response of pushing individuals out onto someone else's care. Thank you, City Council. Thank you. Alexander Brown. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. All right, uh, first I'd like to fully endorse Shannon's presentation. I lived in Tucson back when they had the sodium street lamps for the observatories and I love the warmer, gentler lighting. Uh, the night should be dark. I also strongly agree with the previous speakers about the narrow streets prohibition and its impact on those living in vehicles in Mountain View. It is an expensive and roundabout way to criminalize poverty and harm a vulnerable population. And it's really unfortunate that it's going through. Thanks. Thank you. Alan Whitaker. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to bring a concern to the attention of the council. My name is Alan Whitaker, a 28 year Mountain View homeowner. I'm representing myself and 22 of 23 households on the 2500 block of Alvin Street. We want the city of Mountain View to resume enforcement of the ordinance 19 point two set rather one nine point seven two parking in excess of 72 hours prohibited this is the abandoned car ordinance which this council suspended a year ago when a state of emergency was declared 32 foot narrow alvin street is feet from palo alto a city with no such ordinance suspension making our block an easy dumping ground our street is always clogged with cars from somewhere else today at 4 p.m was typical 32 cars parked on our block seven live here and there were two two spots available for parking amazing in comparison the 2400 block feet away there were 14 vehicles total three of them were contractors so not long lost long ago were street sweeping services which on the city's website states are crucial for safe and sanitary streets some of our seven, some of the seven neighborhood cars 
I mentioned are placeholders, just so the neighbors have spots to put their garbage bins out on garbage day. Otherwise, cars park every inch, even in front of your own driveway. And now with opening up, what's your plan? What's your plan when family and friends come to visit? Valet? It's unlikely our street or situation is unique within Mountain View. Our neighboring municipalities, which never suspended enforcement of abandoned vehicle ordinances, may address certain aspects of enforcement differently. This is something that Mountain View should explore. Talking to my neighbors is evident resentment exists for both those who park here for weeks on end and the lack of any recourse. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, that concludes our public comment. So we can bring it back to the council. Great, thank you. All right, so we can move on to item six, which is unfinished business. Item 6.1 is our strategic planning and roadmap for fiscal year 2021, 22, and 2022, 23. City Manager Kimber McCarthy will introduce this item and then transition to Lawrence Grieska, the city's consultant from Civic Makers, who will provide a brief presentation. After the presentation, we will take public comment. Following public comment, this item will have three components for council discussion based on staff's recommendations. It will be one, the strategic priorities, which will be led by Lawrence Gradeska. Two, the action plan led by principal management analyst Melvin Gaines. And item three, a vision statement led by city manager Kimber McCarthy. I will now turn things over to city manager Kimber McCarthy. I think we'll move, make sure to move all of the other speakers over. Great, thank you. Great, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, council members, members of the public. So this is the third uh, time that we are coming to council to talk to you all about uh, your strategic priorities and the action plan, which is formerly called the uh, City Council Major Goals, uh, which consists of your uh, priority projects and initiatives, and then also the uh, vision statement uh, that describes uh, Mountain View and, and where we are, where we want to be in the future. So at this point, um, I'm not seen uh, Lawrence yet in the uh, moved over yet in the uh, queue. So I will go ahead and uh, start with the uh, presentation right now and hopefully they will be able to join us. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, so Right now, just giving an update on where we're at with the process. Uh, so we started in February with the council survey and workshop. And um, throughout the month of March, uh, there were targeted focus groups that were held, as well as community workshops. And also civic makers met with uh, department heads and also did a workshop uh, with staff, um, really just to dig deep on uh, the strategic priorities and also really talk about uh, the vision. So, so council kind of set set that foundation in February. Uh, then there was a lot of interactive work with the community and with staff throughout March and April. And there was a uh, session also in March uh, where council provided further feedback and refinement to your priorities and the action plan. And that leads us to now, uh, where we are coming back with staff's recommendations um, and taking all the feedback that we received from council and uh, presenting recommendations to you on those strategic priorities and the action plan, as well as the vision statement. Um, and that really is the start of the uh, really brief presentation on where we're at now. So as you mentioned, Mayor, uh, right now we are at the point where uh, we will move into the uh, three components of, of this uh, agenda item where we'll talk first about the uh, strategic priorities. Uh, followed by the action plan, uh, and then finally the vision. So uh, that concludes just the brief part of the presentation. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to you uh, for public comment before we begin the next part of it. Okay, 
and great news i found lawrence and <laughs> lawrence did you have anything you wanted to add before we go into public comment no just apologies i was uh tending to the the child in the brief window i had before we started so uh okay. thank you um kimbra for for um setting the context and uh we'll uh have a council discussion after we hear from the public thank you mayor great of course no problem family first all right so we'll move it over to um public comment would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item if so please click the raise hand button in zoom or press star nine on your phone and we'll display the two minute timer uh, on the screen okay the first is robert cox Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, I'm here as a member of the steering committee at Livable Longview to thank the council and the staff for including livability and quality of life as a citywide strategic goal in the staff report. I ask the council to approve it and the other strategic goals and look forward to the implementation of the projects that support livability and quality of life goals, especially those designed to preserve the character of our downtown core. Um, uh, my co-member um, Louise Katz will be speaking more on this when her turn comes up, and I yield my time. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, next is Shawnee Kleinhaus. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. Uh, on behalf of Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, I wanted to express appreciation of the aspiration to protect habitat and biodiversity in Mountain View as expressed within uh, the strategic priorities. But I'm a little disappointed that ecology and biodiversity are not called out in their restorative approach or rewilding the city and only as a protective goal of what's already there. Um, as you pointed out yourself, uh, the need to restore habitat and create connectivity and habitat patches and maintain it in a way that is hospitable to birds and insects, butterflies, other animals. It's really, really critical that we start rewilding our cities. And Mountain View has really good uh, precedent in, in uh, North Bayshore and a very engaged group. And potentially the best way to answer staff's requirement, uh, ask a question of how to do that, would to have, be to have a stakeholder group or a working group with people from that spoke here before. I'm happy to help and look at all the documents that already exist on how to do that regionally and specifically in Mountain View and come up with a good plan. So um, I think it's really important to provide habitat, meaning food and shelter to a variety of insects uh, and birds and wildlife and establish the kind of connectivity that those habitat area needs so critters can move between them, find, find the next spot and really not only existing biodiversity, but also to restore and bring things back. So you can hopefully require more native plantings in new developments and city properties, but there is a lot more and a working group could really help. We did that in uh, Palo Alto for the Urban Forest Master Plan, and it's really working. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thank you. Louise Katz. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so on behalf of Liberal Mountain View, again, I wanted to second Robert's uh, statement that we are truly appreciative of the inclusion of quality of life issues um, and hope that this will be um, a, a vigorous and ongoing discussion. Uh, you mentioned in the last meeting that you heard many people, many representatives heard from many constituents how important this is. And um, it's a varied list that we have within the quality of life that um, our staff has presented. And in our opinion, they're all essential to Mountain View's future. We can't plan our city without relating our decisions to the quality of life. Um, so we hope that also that this will be a very inclusive process as the list is varied. We hope it will include your focus on businesses and schools and the needs of families um, who will be there to invest in our future. Thank you. Thank you. Albert Jeans. 
Good evening, Mayor Kamea, Council Members. Um, I just wanted to request that you consider dropping the continuation of the automatic guideway feasibility study. Um, I looked at the original study, which was finished in 2018. It's pretty comprehensive. And it struck me just reading that how feasible it is. And we're talking about $100 million per mile. And, you know, I just use Google Maps and you probably need at least a three mile segment just for a single line from the transit center to, you know, Google's headquarters. And, and of course, the study recommended a much wider network, which probably would bring the cost close to half a billion dollars. Now, this is for a city of 80,000 people. And plus, you know, how many people currently, well, pre-COVID, actually went from the transit center to Google? using private shuttles or whatever. I don't think it was that many. So how do the people, of, how do the residents of Mountain View benefit from, benefit from such a you know, huge project? I think, and plus now with COVID and you know, we don't know, we're not exactly sure what the post COVID scene will look like, but I think it's fair to say that things have changed. You know, working habits have changed. We don't know what the commute patterns will be like after COVID. And so I think it's wise to just put this on hold. If it looks like, you know, we're headed for, you know, gridlock traffic again, maybe we can look at it again. But even in those cases, I'm not sure this is the right solution for Mountain View. This is too big and too expensive for, you know, a city of our size. And this is something that might be more appropriate for something like San Jose or San Francisco, but not Mountain View. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, 650, last three digits are 793. If you are calling in on a phone number, I think you need to hit um, star, I think it's either star nine or star six to unmute. So it's a 650 phone number. The last three digits are 793. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Bruce Nagel. I'm, uh, I'm a member of uh, sustainability uh, groups in Mountain View, and I've lived in Mountain View for 40 years. The plan that you put together is impressive with a lot of the individual features of it. I do have a couple of comments in terms of how it will be implemented that I think may be useful in the end. First off, um, some of these have honest to goodness deliverables. Maybe this reflects to an action plan that really shows what's going to happen with it. The, the other thing that I think is important is that um, we have sustainability things and they're kind of linked throughout this. And that's good, um, but we should be showing how they how they interact. You know, there is if we reduce the amount of traffic by some of the uh, modes that are put in here to have more bicycle paths, that should somehow be reflected in this. And, and whatever you can do to have actual goals that can be seen, first off, ones that affect the uh, amount of greenhouse gas, as well as the things that are more concrete, like you know fewer bicycles or uh, fewer cars that are single, um, single occupancy. So a lot of good stuff here. Figure out how you can prioritize some of the stuff because the list is long and distinguished and figure out where some of the things interact with each other, especially as we need to continue to drive to a sustainability effort of being uh, carbon neutral by 2045. Thanks for the opportunity to speak, and thanks for all the work that went into this. Great. Thank you. Catherine Trejo. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, uh, Marty Wright and I have been residents of Mountain View since 1994. Uh, we live fairly close to Stevens Creek Corridor and to the trail. And uh, we very much appreciate um, the steps that Mountain View has made over the years that we have witnessed and sometimes participated in, in increasing both the biodiversity uh, and the people friendliness of the city. We're very grateful for that. We have noticed over the years that some biodiversity seems to have been affected by structure building. Uh, for instance, this year we have a noticeable decline in our uh, hooded oriole population, which we normally see in our backyard 
um, in great numbers. We think that it has to do with a lot of building in this uh, area that we live. And we appreciate that people do have to have a place to live and this is a wonderful place. But we're hoping that in the future, um, the city of Mountain View will include more biodiversity and think of planting things like oak trees in the parks and maybe more palm trees for the Orioles, as well as um, I love the idea of dark skies. I'm a, a stargazer myself and I would really appreciate um, any kind of movement that the city can make to uh, make our skies darker, even if it is just a tiny spot on the map. So thank you for all your hard work and um, hope to attend a city council in person again someday. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Gita Dev. Hello, am I on? Yes, you're on. Thank you, Mayor Kame and uh, City Council members. My name is Gita Dev. I am speaking on behalf of the Sierra Club. I was very pleased with our session last time and was very excited to hear the number of people who spoke on behalf of biodiversity as really important for their city and also to hear the same from several council members. And um, I must admit that I'm rather disappointed to see that it has not really risen to um, what I thought it would be, with that it would be one of the real priorities. As the world becomes more urbanized, I think city managers are recognizing the importance of providing habitat that can support biodiversity. And there's sort of a start of an urban wildlife movement. Um, this sort of awareness has been happening a lot around the world as people come to terms with the dramatic increase in our urban areas and the corresponding loss of wildlife. So it's really not enough for cities to just plant a million trees or have backyard gardens or build green roofs and smart streets. The trees and shrubs and flowers also need to benefit the birds, butterflies, and other animals. And they need to provide habitat for breeding shelter and food. And where possible, the habitat needs to be arranged in corridors so that wildlife too can travel just as we want to travel. So the cities the ones who once laughed off the idea that anything urban could be wild are now supporting urban biodiversity programs. And I hope that Mountain View will too. I know that San Jose is doing a rewilding program so now in some counties, canopy trees are asked to be 80% of planting rather than um, just a few, and that half of them need to be oaks because they all benefit uh, from caterpillars to songbirds. So, you know, a bird needs to bring like 6,000 caterpillars to raise a clutch of nestlings. So Sorry, Peter, your time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, B. Hansen. I think you just need to unmute B. B Hansen. All right, maybe we'll come back to B. Linda Ruthruff. Hi, Linda Ruthruff again, Conservation Chair, Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the California Native Plant Society. You see a lot of dead animals on our roads and highways. Do you ever wonder why these unfortunate animals can't avoid being hit and killed? The answer is that when their neurological systems developed, there weren't cars speeding along at 60 miles per hour. They simply aren't equipped to anticipate something moving at that kind of speed and to avoid it. They aren't equipped to survive the modern world. The same is actually true for us as humans. Our bodies and our minds and our neurological systems aren't equipped for all the challenges of modern life. We pay differently than the animals. We pay with increased blood pressure 
with digestive problems, with sleep problems, with chronic stress. Being in nature, however, is healing and restorative. We've seen how people flock to the parks during this pandemic. We need nature in our cities where people spend their time in order for residents to function at their best. We ask that you include prioritizing bringing nature into the urban environment with a priority on rewilding and regreening Mountain View. Thank you. Great, thank you. Alexander Brown. Oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, B's trying to unmute, but having some Zoom issues. Uh, I feel like Shannon was speaking to me as a resident of North Bay Shore. I fully support rewilding the area. Uh, please bring back all the peafowl. Uh, you know, I'd love to have more connected, vibrant green corridors full of life and fewer isolated grass squares, but no palm trees. I really dislike palm trees. Uh, picks native flora. There's plenty of them. I'm sure Google would love to help out up here, though they can speak for themselves on that. Also, I know it's already scheduled, so thank you for prioritizing protections for mobile home communities. I'm still anxious to see something on the books, but I'm more hopeful than ever. Thank you. I reserve my time. Wait, can I do that? I don't know if I can do that. I'm going to try to do that. Thank you. Tim McKenzie? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, sorry if I raised my hand earlier. I'm zooming on my phone for the first time, and I, I noticed I accidentally raised my hand during a public comment thing, and then no one else was speaking, and it may have been me. Um, I'm going to also steal Alex's remaining time. I'm not going to let him reserve it for himself, and I will take it for myself. I'm just kidding on that one. Um, but there's many, many things in, the, in this plan. I just, I just want to talk about a couple of them. Um, the first one in the staff report is the, just listed out is expand access to broad, uh, broadband access across communities. I would love to see municipal broadband just as a public service, uh, like uh, as a utility, this is, Silicon Valley is like the heart of the internet in the zeitgeist and the cultural mind. And I think people would be shocked about the type of internet access we he have here. I think it would be great for us to set a model of municipal broadband um, that could be shown across, across the rest of the country, um, or at least around the Bay Area, where tech is so heavily concentrated. Um, and uh, explore number three also, I'm not going to comment on all of them, but I'd like to mention number three, explore the feasibility of alternative mental health crisis response methods. That would be great. It'd be amazing if we could have a three digit number to call that would bring mental health responders first rather than uh, bringing armed agents of the state with weapons. Um, that are not trained to handle these situations uh, because if someone notices someone in crisis, they probably don't have the 10 digit number memorized. Um, so yeah, I would just, I wanted to mention those ones and then I'll also echo what uh, Alex said. It's great to be seeing uh, mobile home rent control. Um, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Yield that time. Thank you. Uh, Pei Ying Lee. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Paying she, her, hers. I want to emphasize some comments on the biodiversity requirements as supported by uh, community groups like Green Spaces MV and MVCSP. Also wanted to echo uh, Shani, Gita, and other public commenters from earlier about biodiversity. So first and foremost, um, thank you so much, um, council staff, for working on this and then this, this next phase of strategic priorities. Very excited to see that we're defining biodiversity requirements um, as a recommended project. I think one suggestion is to perhaps conduct a working group of or stakeholders group to leverage collaboration among cross-departmental staff, community organizations, and experts, as well as community members. And then one required objective for the community for that working group would be to have um, to determine the requirements for landscaping. And I think that working group could also determine the scope of work that would ultimately strengthen the integration and growth of biodiversity in nature into citywide planning and policies. Um, overall, I think we strongly suggest that this project at least manifest requirements around lighting um, that could be in temperature or walks for power, uh, bird safe standards, tree and plant palette, e.g. like 
no palm trees, as mentioned earlier, um, and an analysis of green connectivity for people and wildlife. Overall, the project um, would have an emphasis on native drought tolerant pollinator friendly landscaping choices. And I think another potential outcome of this project would be to describe biodiversity sensitive design elements in various land use types. So office and commercial spaces, transportation corridors, open spaces and residential areas, especially where dense. On a separate note, for this next step of the strategic priorities, we we're wondering how will the community feedback um, via the survey that will be sent out affect the strategic roadmap action plan? Uh, when and where will this community survey be available and will the results be returned to the community before um, the council meeting? Thank you so much. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, one more it looks like um, is Anna Marie Morales. You could put the timer back up. Looks like we got a great. Thank you. Hello. Hi. You have two minutes, oh. Anna Marie. Thank you. Sorry, I was having a little problem. Um, well, I wanted to thank everyone tonight for being here. Um, I'm really excited to um, talk about all these issues. I want to kind of echo what people are saying around biodiversity. Um, housing in Mountain View and keeping Mountain View diverse is really, really important. Um, so I'm really hoping that we'll make sure to have um, lots of conversations as well as actions around this. So I'm looking forward to seeing where everything goes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it looks like B, you're back. Let's try. Okay, I think that might be working now. Yes, we hear you. Go ahead, B. Yeah, um, I review um, those encyclopedias by Mayor Ramirez sends out uh, to make sure that uh, I represent the Mountain View mobile home community uh, when you have something on the agenda. Uh, and I uh, reviewed the council report that uh, shows that the ordinance is still on. Uh, your, your list of strategy, your, your list of projects. Uh, so I never want to have an opportunity to go by to remind you that we're looking forward to adapting that ordinance uh, in August or September, and I'm crossing my fingers that somebody else will interfere with that. Um, so basically, I just wanted to uh, let you know that we're out here. Uh, waiting for you to do something on the Mountain View Mobile Home Ordinance. Uh, really appreciate all of the support you've given us so far. That will do it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Joan McDonald. Hi. This is Joan Hi. McDonald. I have one comment about the potential surveys of the city. I think we all know that the way questions are asked in a survey determines the answers. And so it's very important to me that all stakeholders have representation on the development of any surveys that are going out to all of the residents so that the questions are neutral rather than slanted. The other thing that I want to mention is it almost doesn't matter what results happen from some surveys if we're talking about how much harm is done because of certain practices in the city. It doesn't matter whether 90% of the residents don't think there's any harm done. If one person feels harmed, that's enough for us to look at how to change things. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that looks like it concludes public comment, so we can bring it back to council. Great, 
just double checking that. So I think this moves us on to um, item, item one of the three things we're going to be talking about, which is our strategic priorities. So um, I, I'll close public comment and turn it back over to Mr. Goreska to kick off the recommended strategic priorities. And then uh, we'll move into council questions and discussion. Great. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, share with you before we get into uh, the strategic priorities, what we heard last time and talk a little bit about how we revise the strategic priorities based on your feedback. Uh, I wanted to thank you for your really thoughtful and thorough input uh, and congratulate you on landing on a really robust set of priorities for the city of Mountain View that aligns well with what we heard from the community and from staff. Um, what we did hear from you last time was um, support for incorporating quality of life at its own priority, um, which it is now. Um, in the staff report, you'll see the, the new draft priorities of which quality of life is one and livability. Um, we heard that you wanted to incorporate access to housing and assistance for the unhoused population into the intentional development and housing, popu uh, housing options priority, which we did. Um, and heard um, from you all and, and, and certainly from uh, the, the community, from um, our, our callers about the importance of incorporating biodiversity into sustainability and climate resilience. Um, there was a desire to reference a, a, a burgeoning mobility network uh, to create access across the, the city, various um, parts of the community in the mobility and connectivity priority. Uh, there was also uh, a real um, strong interest in uh, the importance of walkable access to parks and green space um, uh, as part of livability and quality of life. Uh, and finally, um, acknowledging innovation and workers as key parts of the economic vitality uh, priority. So uh, with that, um, where we landed uh, were these revised strategic priorities. Um, as mentioned, the, the, the big change was adding the livability and quality of life um, priority. And um, uh, you should all have had a chance to, to review this uh, in your staff report for the, uh, the public, for folks that haven't um, had a chance to, to see that. We'll just walk through the, the final uh, recommended language for each priority for community for all. Uh, preserve Mountain View's socioeconomic and cultural diversity, engage and protect vulnerable populations through equitable access to housing, transportation, and other programs and services. Livability and quality of life. Enhance Mountain View as a great place to live that values community health and well-being. Preserve Mountain View's unique history and wildlife habitats. Provide access to parks, open space, and other key amenities. Intentional development and housing options. Increase the quantity and diversity of housing options, including assistance for the unhoused. Provide opportunities for subsidized and affordable housing, as well as home ownership. And plan for neighborhoods with nearby transit, jobs, and amenities that balance density with livable green mixed-use development. Mobility and connectivity. Develop a mobility network that enhances connectivity across Mountain View and establishes green corridors. Promote transit and safe active transportation options that reduce vehicle trips and traffic and increase walking and biking. For sustainability and climate resilience, uh, minimize the city's greenhouse gas emissions and prepare for sea level rise. Protect local ecosystems and biodiversity. Support residents and businesses to adopt sustainable practices and use resources wisely. Economic vitality, invest in a beautiful, vibrant downtown that draws residents and visitors, create an environment where small, local, diverse businesses can thrive across the city, continue to work in partnership with the business community so that Mountain View remains a center for innovation with meaningful jobs for workers. And finally, organizational strength and good governance, continue to innovate, collaborate, and continuously improve to deliver a high-level customer service, recruit, develop, and retain top-notch staff, maintain fiscal responsibility and effective intergovernmental partnerships and communicate and engage regularly and transparently with our multilingual community. So um, I'm going to um, stop the screen share so we can uh, talk about this and everyone can see each other a little bit more easily. And uh, would love to hear from commissioners uh, about uh, what they think uh, if anything, we missed in um, in those priorities uh, based on the, the staff recommendation for for those uh, priority areas. And I see a hand from Councilmember Hicks. 
Well, I wasn't going to start off with what you missed. I was going to start off by saying um, that I'm, I'm generally happy with the way the, the priorities have come out. Um, I, I think that the one of the good things is that I think we were kind of stuck with our four goals that we'd had for a number of years and that we were, um, I know a lot of community members didn't think they encompassed everything that they wanted to do. I think mm -hmm. they were a little aspirational and they were never going to change. Um, I, I personally think that because we're, in my opinion, moving in the right direction, I don't, I personally don't feel a great need to tinker with them a lot more. I think that we can, um, you know, maybe do that over the years. Um, but I just thought I would say a few things. Um, first, I was going to talk about uh, livability. I'm really glad that that was added as uh, one of the strategic priorities um, in mind. And I, I know that livability can be an amorphous concept and that some people would say, well, shouldn't it include housing and so forth? And I think it should. But since we have called out housing as a separate um, strategic priority, I like the way it's framed here. Um, and, um, and, and I do particularly because we as a council have talked about uh, mental health and have been urged by the community to talk about mental health. I really think that this goal includes a lot of the things that we need to do as we urbanize to, um, to keep people people's health and well-being, I would probably add things like art and culture, community and public places. We can add that because I think all of those are the things that you need as you urbanize to um, to uh, to maintain people's uh, mental health and well-being. Um, but I like the fact that it has health and well-being in it, that it has history and wildlife. So we can add those additional concepts now or not. You know, like I said, I'm not going to wordsmith. Um, the other one I was going to, another one I was going to talk a little about is economic vitality. I feel like a little on this one we're confusing. There's the like um, the small businesses and the large businesses. I feel like when we talk about the downtown, in some ways, that's more a part of livability. That's part of. Um, building public places where you can go out and see your neighbors. Again, I'm not going to wordsmith. I don't care if it's left in economic vitality. Honestly, I think what's giving our uh, community a good amount of its uh, economic vitality is the, the tech sector, sector that our economy is kind of grounded in. But um, the one thing I would change under economic vitality is to talk not only, not only about uh, the walkability and so forth of our downtown, but also village centers that are in our general plan. I think that we we need more than just our downtown. I, I want to become more like a 15 minute city where no matter where you live, you can walk to a fairly, you know, walk, walk to a place where you can meet your neighbors. Um, you know, we have parks, but I think in East Wisman and North Bay Shore, and then in our general plan, there are other village centers named, and I would I would like those to be good public places as well. And then the last one I was going to mention is the um, I forget which number it is, but the strategic priority already under sustainability. I I would be I don't know if you can put the words up because sure. I, but I would be um, because we've gotten so much comment from the community on this. Um, and, and I don't think it's come out of nowhere. I've interfaced to some degree with our local group, uh, Green Spaces Mountain View, which frankly, that group has been populated from a number of different places, including sort of the school park fencing issues. And it's very broad. The number of people who come to that group is a very broad spectrum of our community. So another, and there is a call for, as people have been saying, real rewilding, because I think that's one thing people do want from their parks. They want to see, um, they want want to see more birds. Um, it's one of the things that that makes people feel happy. Um, so and and also it's a a big part of our climate crisis or our our um, environmental crisis is. Uh, species extinction. So we might add protect local ecosystems. 
Oh, let's see. I can't, the way I have my screen arranged, I can't see all of that. Let me protect local ecosystems and biodiversity through rewilding and other measures or something like that. And that's, that's all I have to say at this point. Great. Thank you. Council member Matichuk. Yes, okay. I'm going to ask a question. Um, sure. I thought tonight we were um, sort of finalizing this. Or, That's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. So the comments yeah. from Councilmember Hicks, um, you know, she's suggesting additions or tweaks to these. So are we going to discuss those or? Um, well, I, I think I'd like to hear from folks and then just ask if, if, if people can live with them as, as is. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, uh, that what I heard from council member Hicks was that, you know, she could take or leave uh, a couple of the things under economic, uh, uh, economic vitality, um, you know, potentially add village centers. I, I, let me reframe the, the ask here. Um, can you live with these? <laughs> Is that really, I think that's where we're at. Um, and, and so, um, thank you for, for the clarification on the process. Um, and really that's what, uh, I want to hear from all the council members. I think it's helpful to get your feedback on where we are now, but ultimately we do want to approve these and move forward. And, and, um, um, you know, and, and, that, and that's a kind of a, ultimately the question to ask ourselves to do that is, can we live with them as they are, uh, understanding that they, that they're living and, and will will change, um, in the future. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I actually, do have a few concerns um although in general um i think these are the right seven priorities um, and i appreciate how far they've come since the last time we talked about them but um i do have concerns because i feel like these set expectations with our community and i want to make sure our residents and visitors and people who work here uh, really have a clear understanding of what our priorities are and what they aren't. And so in areas where I feel like it's subject to interpretation, um, those are the ones that are concerning to me because I feel like it could be setting false expectations with people. And I, I feel like we've seen that over the past four years um, that I've been on council and I kind of like to avoid that um, because I, I want people to know really what we are trying to do um, not what they think we're trying to do. So, um, yeah, I've, I've said this before that it's, we, we can't really like guarantee or ensure. We can do a lot of stuff to promote, protect, enable, um, you know, incentivize, but some things are just not in our control. And so I want to make sure that is factored in here. So for me, um, I absolutely believe, you know, we're a community for all, um, but I think it's hard for us to say we absolutely are going to preserve our socioeconomic and cultural diversity, but I think we can do things to support that. Um, so I would change preserve to support, or I'm open to other words, um, because I, I think we all want to do that, but it, you know, it's preserving it is not entirely in our control. Um, people may choose to move away, um, situations change, and, and we just don't control that. Um, the other um, word in this first one, um, equitable access. And I thought, you know, what does that really mean? And I think that's a word that's sort of um, open to interpretation. And I want to set expectations that what we're trying to do is really provide access. I'm not sure we can guarantee it's going to be equitable, especially because different people might have different definitions of the word equitable. Um, so I tweak those two words in the first uh, priority. In the second one, um, I appreciate this being now a standalone one. And um, I would say that um, I would tweak it a little bit um, in that I, you know, I, I think it's more where we want to preserve Mountain View's unique character, not necessarily its history. 
I think history is what adds to the character of the city, um, but it's more than just the history. Um, and I, I struggle a little bit with preserve on that one too. Um, maybe there's a different word we could use there. Absolutely, we want to support it and do things to, um, you know, keep it here. But you know, I don't know that we can guarantee it. And I would also change um, this to be um, enhance or restore the wildlife habitats. I think it needs to be more than what's said here. Um, and provide access to parks, open space, and other key amenities. I would just say we want to provide parks, open space, and amenities. Um, you know, we, we're trying to have those distributed throughout the city, but I would just say we want to provide them. Um, on the third one, I would say we want to support an increase in the quantity and the diversity of housing. We don't build housing, we enable housing. We do a lot of rezoning, we provide incentives. Um, and so I, I don't want to say we're going to increase it. We're going to do things to try to make that happen, but we don't control that. Um, and then I, I personally, well, there is a technical difference between subsidized and affordable housing. I would just say affordable housing. That's what most people refer to it as in the community. Let's just make it simple. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Sorry, on number five, um, sustainability and climate resilience. Um, the second sentence there, I would say um, promote and enhance local ecosystems and biodiversity rather than protect. Because as we've heard, we need to increase, um, not just maintain what we have. And economic vitality, I would say support a beautiful, vibrant downtown. I'm not sure I want to say invest in it, but let's support it. Um, and that might be an investment in it, but let's support it. Um, and I would add the comment that Council Member, Member Hicks said about the village centers um, in other locations in the city. I would include that somehow here. So I guess I could sum that up by saying I, I can live with the seven, but I, I'm sorry, I, I had a lot of word tweaks because I do want to set expectations with our community of what we're really trying to do so it's very clear and so that we're all clear on what we're trying to do. Thank you. And um, are, are you, the way these are phrased now, um, you're unable to live with them? You would not be able to, to vote for these as is without some of those work tweets? I, I would not. OK, great. Um, thank you. Let's hear from um, the mayor. Hi. So um, I just thought um, just Hearkening back to the first question about the, the process, maybe um, City Manager McCarthy, you could talk to us a little bit about, um, because I, I wasn't sure if we're going, I didn't, I, I guess I didn't view it as all seven of us going through and talking, you know, adding our tweaks to the seven priorities. I think this is the third iteration of that. So can you just let us know what you need from us to move forward or if these are things you could take as feedback and then implement or can you please let us know, Miss um, McCarthy? Yes, thank you, Mayor. So um, I think at this point, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as Mr. Grodeska said, yes, we were, we are looking for council feedback on uh, what you can live with. But I also think if council members have a um, strong preference to maybe look at um, some of the wording and you all agree, then or there's a majority that agrees, we can certainly take that feedback and we will incorporate that as part of what we bring back and the recommendation in June. Um, so I think we are definitely trying to land in a place that you feel comfortable with. Um, and I think some of the, the items that were mentioned um, are similar things that were likely raised before. Uh, so I, I don't think it would be too difficult to, to make those you know, adjustments um, just to make sure that the language is compatible with, with what council would want. Um, so I think uh, that we can make that work. Um, but yes, I, I would just ask uh, if you all can be really specific on whether you would agree with, with what you've heard from your other council members, or if there's just something that's, you know, nagging at you that you really want to make sure that we look at, um, please raise that. But overall, we are looking to move forward on this and bring it back as a final recommendation. 
Thank you. Um, so can I give my comments? Yeah, please. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that just when my, my thoughts with when talking about the strategic priorities is um, I, I, I guess I don't mind them being a little bit more broad because these are things that need to live on for the next, you know, these have to live on for years. And how do we choose words for priorities that remain evergreen, right? So I, I don't feel closely tied to, um, you know, any, any further tweaks. I think that I am comfortable with moving from the four priorities to the seven. I think that really encapsulate the um, voluminous discussion that we had the, the last time. And I think for me, it's more about indicating to the community at, kind of at the heart of what the city is trying to do and that um, hopefully all of our council goals will go into those details of how we're going to illustrate the the priorities so um, you know I'm amenable to making some some changes um, if that makes my colleagues feel more comfortable but I think my general feedback is I'm comfortable moving to the from the four to the seven I do agree with the the categories um, that were drawn out. And I think part of it is, I guess, my hesitancy in going into too much wordsmithing is, um, you know, obviously words mean different things to different people. And so I don't I don't feel like when I hear like, for example, the, the economic vitality, vitality principle, whether you're a large business or a small business, I want you to have economic vitality. So I guess I just didn't see it in the same scope. Um, you know, I think we want a vi kind of a vibrant city and community overall. So I, that's where I feel not as perhaps wedded to the language, but see it as our, our projects being ways we can illustrate that and that the seven um, priorities are kind of like the overall overarching umbrella that everything can fall under and can encompass. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. So I, uh, I don't know if we're going to need a, a motion on the strategic priorities as they're written, but um, I just wanted to provide my feedback. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councilmember Lieber. Thank you. Um, well, I think it's always dangerous to give us another bite at the apple <laughs> to uh, because new ideas come up, and if I had my wish list, I'd love to see something about um, multi-age spaces and about children in the community and about having a welcoming um, community. But I, I also know that after we adopt these, very few people are actually going to look at them. And, and as the mayor kind of alluded to, what folks will look at are, are really our actions and those kinds of things. That's what's going to end up in the newspaper and people pay attention to and have an opinion about. So I'm I'm a hundred percent at peace with just adopting these. Great, thank you, uh, Councilmember Abikoga. Thank you. And um, first, I wanted to thank you um, and staff for your hard work. Um, this is greatly improved um, from the last iteration. I feel. And I think the expansion into seven um, goals was a, a good direction to take. Um, overall, I um, support the goals, um, but I think um, my, some of my colleagues brought up some um, key words, uh, phrases that, um, and, and I had a couple of others based on some of the public comment that we received earlier this evening. Um, and just like minor changes that I think would maybe clarify a bit. Um, but I, I, really, I, um, I think it was both council members, Hicks and Matichek, who mentioned village centers. And I think that is um, important because that actually ties back to our general plan update. And it's something that we've started on, but I think we still have a lot of work to do to, um, to realize these village, the village center concepts. So that would be something I would like to incorporate. Um, the other one, and I do agree with Councilmember Matichak when, when it comes to housing, um, you know, the more like all the conversations we have and frankly what's been going on with the state trying to intervene, you know, has been about cities building housing, but 
yes, yeah, cities don't build housing, developers build housing, cities enable housing to be developed. And I think that it is important to really start to clarify that because I, there's a lot of misconceptions and then from that we're getting, you know, uh, <laughs> a lot of ex, um, conversation and um, some, I'd have to say, unwelcome um, intervention <laughs> and, 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 and in some places. So I would support that. Um, and then just the minor tweaks was under sustainability uh, with GHG admissions. I think we're still working to reduce. So I was, would suggest adding reduce and minimize, uh, in front of minimize. Um, and then with, uh, let's see, local, the local ecosystem, I don't know, I just lost, oh, that's also in the same, um, what, based on what public, some of the public comment was um, saying, um, protect and I would add expand uh, lo local ecosystems and um, biodiversity. Um, and then on the mobility one, this is super minor, but I think it's um, worth clarifying um, in terms of reducing vehicle trips, I would add single occup occupancy vehicle trips. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Showalter. Hi, um, this is, I, I was very pleased to see these categories and particularly that there was a description. I think that helps a lot. And um, I, I think Council Member Lieber is right that a lot of the general public will not read uh, these very carefully, but the staff will read every word and they'll read it again and again. They will study it. So what we say matters here. And I really appreciate the fact that Council Member um, Matichek went over it with kind of a fine tooth comb. And I, I would really like to see us just make those changes because I think it just makes it better. Um, it's not that it's bad now, but it just makes it better. And we had that opportunity. Um, I would also, uh, of all the things that have been said, I, I, I'd like to see an economic vi vitality. I'd like to see that rewritten written a little bit um, to, because right now it seems to me that we're concentrating on small businesses. We have great small businesses and we have great large businesses and um, they, they, um, they, they all bring a lot to our community. So I think that needs to be rewritten to um, kind of uh, either not not say which size businesses or add in large. And um, other than that, uh, thank you very much. This is a great improvement. Thank you. Other uh, thoughts, comments? Uh, Vice Mayor Ramirez, anything to add? I was afraid you would call me. Um, so <laughs> well, I... it's hard for everybody else, so. <laughs> um, can I live with this? Yes insofar as they serve as categories for the projects we're going to talk about in a few minutes. I'm comfortable with all of the revisions proposed by my colleagues. What's missing? Objectivity, measurable goals, accountability, all of the stuff that I had talked about last time. Um, I've lost that battle, and that's okay. I'll fight it in a couple of years. Um, but I would love to see those incorporated next time. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Uh, well, it sounds like we have some work to do um, to, to do a revision here. Um, City Manager McCarthy, um, do you have thoughts about how to proceed? Would you like to, to take another pass at this and bring it back to council? Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I would love for some guidance from you about how you'd like to proceed. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. So I think that um, I captured uh, the feedback that I received just about some of those wording changes. And as, as long as uh, council is comfortable with that, we will just incorporate those into the final recommendation, which is coming to you all in June. So um, if you're all okay with that, that's what staff will do. Great. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, hopefully this next round of revisions will uh, address some of the, the final lingering uh, uh, concerns and issues, and we can uh, rubber stamp these as part of the, the, the roadmap. Uh, I guess with that, I'll turn it back to, to the mayor uh, for our uh, discussion of projects from the staff's recommended action plan. 
Sure. I think before we keep going, I just want to make sure that all of my colleagues were able to include all of their uh, all of their recommendations to you, uh, Mr. Gradeska, just so that sure. we know so that this is the process. So we've provided some feedback to you. We're going to see it in a final form on June 8th, and we'll be able to take that final vote. Did anyone have anything else within the seven priorities that they feel like was missed or anything like that? I just want to make sure we have um, we have more bites at the apple, as Council Member Weaver said, so that we can we can get this one right. I appreciate that. Uh, last call, as they say. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm hesitating to call it that, but yes. All right. And anything else? All right. All right. Now I feel comfortable. All right. We thank will now. Much. Thank you. We'll now turn it over to Melvin Gaines to discuss the action plan recommendations. And after the presentation, we will uh, do council questions and discussion. We'll turn it over to you, Mr. Gaines. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so now I get to discuss the, uh, the action plan recommendations. The strategic roadmap action plan is the work plan to accomplish the strategic priorities that you all just discussed and informed us of modifications you'd like. Um, next slide, please. The process to establish the action plan includes reviewing staff's list of recommended projects, discussing any projects that the council desires, as well as one project that staff would like additional clarity on, and then seeking council approval on the action plan projects. Next slide, please. So following the March 16th study session, staff assessed 46 potential projects to accomplish the, strate the strategic priorities. This assessment included reviewing input from council advisory bodies on which projects they believed were most important, as well as cross-departmental staff teams analyzing the workload impacts of each project and evaluating potential trade-offs of prioritizing one project over another. Ultimately, staff recommends 41 of the 46 projects that were considered. Nine projects were ranked as most important by five or more of the 10 council advisory bodies. Each of those projects are included in staff's recommended projects and staff did not recommend five projects. Uh, next slide, please. So I won't read each project as you all have likely seen them at this point and in, in your, I know you've all seen them and I'm sure the public has had an opportunity as well in their staff reports. Uh, but I will highlight the number of recommended projects in each strategic priority area. So community for all, there are five projects recommended. There are nine projects recommended under the intentional development and housing options. There are seven projects recommended under livability and quality of life. Next slide, please. Six projects are recommended under mobility and connectivity. Thriving local economy includes two recommended projects. Sustainability and climate resilience has six recommended projects. And organizational strength and good government governance includes six, six recommended projects. Next slide, please. Uh, in summary, staff recommends 41 projects and does not recommend five projects. We would like the City Council to discuss any projects that you have questions on or disagree with staff's recommendation. There is one project that staff requests that the City Council provide additional input on or clarity on, and that is the project to define biodiversity requirements for landscaping in Mountain View. We, we've heard a lot about biodiversity tonight, but we're really asking for council to provide as clear direction as possible on what the essential elements of biodiversity that you want the city to consider and what is the desired outcome from this project. Um, and with that, I will stop talking and ask uh, Mayor Kamei to guide the council through discussion of this project on biodiversity, as well as any other projects that the council would like to discuss. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Gaines. So um, perhaps we should, I'm just trying to think how we should start. Shall we maybe go over the clarification of the biodiversity item, and then maybe we can go through the 46 um, projects, and then we can also give feedback on the deferred. Does that work for everyone? 
I can't really see your faces yet. Mayor, Mayor Kamei, if I may. Yes, of course. Uh, so yes, thank you. I think um, starting off with clarifying the biodiversity would be great. Okay. Um, I, I wouldn't suggest that you go through all 46. So what we would ask is if council has any changes um, to any of those or any clarification. So that way we can just focus on the items that you want to talk about and don't have to go through all of them. But oh yes, uh, Sorry, that's what I meant. <laughs> okay, great. We're on the same page then. So yes, so starting with biodiversity is perfect. Okay, great. I just wanted to kind of roadmap as well for colleagues in the public on how we're going to do this. So, okay, so first we'll talk about defining biodiversity, and I see Councilmember Matichek's hand. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. No worries. Um, I think I brought this up last time, so I'm happy to expand on it. Um, though, as we've heard from uh, lots of folks, the goal of this is to um, provide food and shelter for a variety of insects, birds, and wildlife, and have connectivity between areas so that they can move safely um, between the areas um, when they, you know, are when they want to move to a new area and not be crossing busy highways. Um, and when you know as we've developed and as we become more urban a lot of the um, places where birds and wildlife used to live and eat have disappeared and when those disappear then the birds and the wildlife and the insects disappear so we want to try to bring that back so that's the goal of this um, as was mentioned palo alto um, recently completed a project and we might look at that um, as a template for what we might do. But um, I haven't looked at that. But what um, I think about when I think about biodiversity is we as a city require um, certain trees and plants to be diverse in new developments as well as on city property. And that would include things like, you know, sometimes we do less maintenance on shrubs and trees because that makes for um, a better place for birds and wildlife. Um, we have more of a natural look in places. Um, I think it might be that we change our definition of what are acceptable trees to be planted throughout the city, and we increase the amount of oaks, and we add some trees that, you know, um, they might require more water, but you could have those planted in the bioswales. And um, we want to make sure we have ones that are conducive to um, bringing back that diversity. But there's a balance there. And I don't want to say we completely discount things like root structure and the amount of water trees um, consume, but some amount of um, trees that have maybe not the best root structures or consume a lot of water um, because they add to the biodiversity that's important. So um, it's also important to plant some trees and shrubs that have fruit because that provides food for um, the birds and others. And um, I know some people were kind of horrified um, at uh, the dead trees that were left at the Charleston Retention Basin. But those trees, those dead trees actually have a purpose and it is to provide um, a place where birds could build a nest and stay. So um, we also would want to encourage green roofs and green walls. The green roofs can provide that connectivity um, in certain areas. Um, so I said, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm, I'm guessing what this involves is updating city documents um, and city requirements. And the documents I thought about were the Community Tree Master Plan, the Heritage Tree Ordinance, development plans, and any other uh, city document that we have that defines the requirements. So last time I talked about the lists that exist, I was not referencing lists of um, plants and trees that others um, might have produced. I was talking about 
where do the requirements and the lists exist within city documents? I'm only aware of a few, but there's probably more. So we should take a look at all of those. And yes, we can reference the lists that, you know, the experts put together. I just don't know where all those lists are in our documents. And th those are the lists I was talking about. Um, I think it's a good idea if we maybe form an advisory body, um, tap into the experts. A lot of them were involved in helping uh, Google do the wonderful job that has been in, done in North Bay Shore around the Green Loop. If you walk there, you will see all kinds of um, insects and um, you know butterflies and all the things that we are trying to provide the, the habitat so they'll come back. Um, so that's what I mean by um, this project. I don't know if others have other things they want to add to that, but that's what I mean by this project. Thanks. Great, thank you. Council Member uh, Showalter. A tremendous amount of work has been done over the last 20 years um, in, in, in the Bay Area to identify what is really needed to um, enhance the biodiversity of our area and, um, and to sort of uh, um, protect, we're never gonna get it all back. Uh, but to provide the connectivity that's needed. Um, I think that we can look to the San Francisco Estrin Institute has put together guidelines, the um, habitat conservation plan that was done for about 80% of the county were not included of it. And it has plans, there is a, um, all, all of the cities in um, Mountain View, I mean, not all the cities in Mountain View, all the cities in Santa Clara County have agreed to some riparian guidelines and these have a lot of information in them about, um, you know, about planting natives and the, and, and, and the things that, that, that uh, Council Member Babichek talked about, you know, providing shelter, providing food, um, providing connectivity. And, and, and different species need different spacing. Oaks are the particular one. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how, you know, we don't need to have an oak in every front yard. Um, but we do need to have them scattered for them to do their job, but we do need to have them sort of scattered around and, and that distribution has kind of been figured out by SFEI so we can, you know, we can go to them. I think the idea of having a, um, some sort of a, a community task force to work on this is really great. We have a lot of interested people in the community and um, that are very passionate about it that can bring this information together for us. Um, and um, the other thing I think that, that is really important for this is um, the biodiversity of the trees that we plant. You know, we want to plant more trees because they provide shade and uh, they, you know, they sequester carbon and they produce oxygen and, and you know, all of those things, they, you know, if they're just, they just created a, a um, an uh, atmosphere that's so much nicer for everybody. And, I, th and they, I think that another thing that we, we don't want to ever forget is that um, there's real economic value to this work. I mean, if you um, are trying to sell a house that doesn't have any trees in the front, uh, it, you know, it, at least from a, a national point of view, it, it'll take you at least it'll take you a lot longer and your house will be worth up to 15% more if you have trees in front of it. So, um, and if you, you know, if you look at uh, canopy coverage of the communities adjacent to us and um, you think about uh, where the, the um, richer communities are, their canopies are higher. I mean, it literally increases the property values, but that, but, but it, it just has, you know, the increase in the canopy that goes along with this biodiversity has so much value for us humans, as well as all the other creatures that we share the earth with. So um, I think the idea of putting together a, a, a task force um, like the one that worked with Google um, is really a good idea. And um, uh, I hope we can do that. Great, thank you. Council Member Hicks. So thankfully, the previous two council members have said much of what I, I was going to say. So I'll just uh, support what they said. Um, and and the, the other thing I was, the one or two things that were not yet said, I was uh, recently reading um, a paper by my uh, alma mater on the, sort of the history of parks. 
And in case people think that what we're doing or what we're talking about in terms of uh, rewilding parks and places is unusual, basically it says at this point in history, people are wanting more than just recreational space, more than just swimming pools and ball fields. They really do want to go to their parks to see birds and, and see creatures like that. Um, so we're, we're, when we take these steps, we'll be joining other surrounding cities. And I think we should turn to them, other cities who have similar rewilding plans. I've heard San Jose and Palo Alto named, and also other groups like the San, San Francisco Estuary Institute, the Sierra Club, Audubon. And I would like, as um, other council members have said, to have a, a task force to, of interested citizens within our own city, because there are a, a great number of, of interested people here. Um, so I just wanted to underline what, what other people have said tonight. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to provide input on the biodiversity item? All right, I look to staff. Does staff need any more clarification on this item? Ms. McCarthy and Mr. Gaines, no? No. Okay, great. So I think since we are done with this item, we have 46, I believe, recommended projects um, uh, for the action plan. Do any council members have any projects that they would like to speak about or pull or have any comments on? Okay. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, just to kick us off, so is the idea to collect the full list and then we'll come back and provide remarks or do you want the remarks right now? I think what the city manager had said is, you know, we're going to talk, we would talk about biodiversity. We would talk about the 46 uh, proposed projects. And then I think there are, there are others that are not recommended so that we can talk about that group. So I was trying to parse it out into the different kind of buckets, if that's okay with my with all of you. I was just trying to like structurally think about it. So we talked about biodiversity, we can talk about the 46 projects, and then if there's nothing for this, then we can just move on to, um, I think the kind of five or six projects. Um, Okay, so that works for me. The two projects I want to talk about are two that are not recommended, the Community Workforce Agreement and Performance Auditing. So I'll wait until after we've completed the recommended projects. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I, this is just a I guess, yeah, comments or anything for the recommended list. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, Councilmember Abe Koga. Thank you. Um, I, I support the recommended projects. I just wanted to clarify a couple. Um, I thought we the staff was asking us to clarify the Moffitt precise plan. I, I know staff has proposed a scope, and um, I I'm supportive of that. Um, although I guess I just wanted to in, include or ensure that we d include um, transportation circulation. That to me, that's one of the biggest um, concerns I have for this area in light of all of the um, proposed new developments that are happening. So um, I just wanted to make sure that that is included in the scope as well as open space needs. Um, and then the other item was on the um, TOT um, increase. Um, my intent, the very, to be very direct, is to look at um, a ballot measure to increase the TOT tax on the hotel occupant, the transit occupancy tax. So um, I wanted to just make sure that we are clear that that's the, that's the direction that I would like for us to um, explore heading to. And I think those were the two for now that are on, that are on the list. So thank you. Great, thank you. Council Member Lieber. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to comment on um, item three, um, the alternative mental health crisis response methods. 
Um, I think that the city manager might have some developments to mention under that um, in terms of alternative police response. But one of the things that I'm very interested in additionally is um, in having um, some kind of street outreach to people that um, maybe uh, getting into a situation uh, where they're dysregulated. And I know that Palo Alto works with um, Momentum for Mental Health uh, to do um, that kind of outreach um, to help folks that are on the street not get to the point where they're offending and become part of the criminal justice system. And um, then on item 20, um, the strategies for the middle income um, housing types. I'm very interested as things move along to see further definition um, on that because it's a very a broad um, topic. And then um, on item uh, 38, the um, development and implementation of an enhanced legislative program. I'm most interested in seeing us take positions on a limited set of bills, um, but I can't really at this time support what was proposed in this item, $100,000 uh, to go towards lobbying and towards a really intensive um, effort. I think that if we sort of dip our toes into the water this year and maybe support a limited set of bills and then um, next year look at a more intensive um, effort if things merit it. Um, but I know that some of the really worthy objectives that we have were not um, funding at uh, $100,000. And um, I know that some of our neighboring cities um, are pursuing that and maybe it's possible to leverage their experiences and to leverage what the county is doing in terms of their uh, legislative efforts. But for me right now with uh, the COVID situation, the housing crisis, um, with people that are in financial crisis, even though $100,000 is a relatively small amount of money to us. I, I think that we might possibly just be, um, you know, getting that money out the door and not getting uh, a huge amount of, of impact for that. So I'd rather see us like kind of go in a stepwise process where we get into the process a little bit and then um, uh, see how we're doing with it before we commit to uh, a larger amount of money. And then um, I also have some comments on the projects that were not recommended um, by staff. And, and I guess um, a question that I have on item 38 um, is that if we are taking an affirmative position in support of legislation, I'd like to see that come back to council so that we know that it actually happened and, um, and that we can be a little bit selective in what we're supporting. So those are my comments. Thank you, Council Member Matichek. Thanks. Um, so on item five, I support that, but I would like to see this broken out into two projects um, because I feel like there's been confusion about this one in the past. And so let's just clear it up and it would be um, develop uh, an ordinance to address wage theft citywide and the second one would be to develop a responsible construction ordinance. Let's just make it really clear. Um, on project 10, the Moffitt precise plan. So I think we need to be more specific there. Um, like is Moffitt, is it Moffitt Boulevard area? Is it just Moffitt Boulevard streetscape? Um, 
what streets is it between? Is it Central and 85 or Middlefield? So I, I would like us to have a discussion about that tonight so that we clarify it. For me, um, I appreciate the comments um, that uh, Council Member Abe Koga said about um, transportation and circulation and open space. Um, and then I'm also interested in the streetscape along Moffat Boulevard. Um, and I would say it would be between um, Central and uh, I originally was thinking Middlefield, but then I thought maybe it's a little bit further because maybe we want to define it for um, Shenandoah Square at the same time um, because we would want that to be a nice streetscape as well and potentially have open space. So I, I feel like we need to have that discussion. Um, Project 25, which is the AGT, um, I actually would just like to not pursue that project. Um, as was mentioned earlier during public comment, it's incredibly expensive. Um, I don't know that we're really going to need it. And we have so many other things that um, we're doing to address transportation and circulation in the city. Uh, I just feel like I, we can shelve this one for I'd say for a very long time. So for me, it's just drop it from the list. Um, then project uh, 31, um, I don't think we need to separate that one out. That's part of the um, sustainability action plan. And it, it seems odd to me that we'd separate out one and not others. So just leave it in the SAP for and um, Project 40, well, ultimately, I think we want to look at uh, TOT. I just am not feeling that this is the right time to do that. Um, so if we leave it on the list, I'd say it doesn't happen for um, a while, like a couple years. Um, I just um, am not, um, I'm, I'm just feeling like it's not the right time to do it right now. And let's see, the others are ones that um, staff is not recommending, so I think that's it for now. Thanks. Great, thank you. So I just wanted to let colleagues know I'm trying to take comments on all of the different projects that you are commenting on or have anything so we can circle back on discussion. And then I think we may need to take straw polls on the different projects that I'm taking notes of. And I know the city manager and I think Mr. Gaines are taking notes as well to help me. <laughs> so I just wanted you to know, and then also to clarify for the public uh, that we will take all the feedback and then we'll circle back to each one. All right, uh, Council Member Hicks. Okay, and I am so sorry as for your notes, I did not, I. I didn't take my notes with numbers next to them, so I'm going to just make this really hard for, for all of you taking notes. Um, so first, in terms of the Moffat Precise Plan, I, I appreciated staff's sort of narrowing of that down, but the, um, my big concern is that is, well, some of the things that people have have mentioned so far the the streetscaping and the circulation in parks. But my other concern is the the ground floor uses. I feel that it's really going to be it really should be. Let me put it this way. A lot of times when we develop, we say we're redensifying in order to help people get out of uh, single occupancy vehicles. But density alone doesn't do that. And I really feel if this is going to be the other half of our down, or I really feel this is the other half of our downtown, but we're developing it as if it's a suburb 20 miles away. Um, and we have, you know, there are all sorts of lots that are up for imminent, imminent reuse, including there's a large shopping plaza with like a laundry and a gun shop and some other things I don't remember um, that that I've heard may be for sale. And I don't want it to be a large surface parking lot right next to our downtown. Uh, to me, that's not appropriate. Um, and it's not a good use of land in our downtown. Um, and I agree with Council Member Matichuk when I, when she said it should include the interface with the Shenandoah property, 
I've also talked with um, high school um, school board members and said, you know, I would like that to interface with Moffat as if it's a part of our downtown, uh, you know, whether it's their theater, for instance, the high schools have wonderful music and theater productions. I would like to be able to walk down the street and go to one of those. I would like to interface more with that high school. I would like to develop that thoughtfully. Um, there's some talk of incorporating uh, the adult center across the street into that. Um, I, I think there's a big potential for some pretty rapid, well, I'll, I'll mention one other thing. I was very disappointed when the hotel developed there because a downtown hotel would have a lobby with maybe a restaurant or a bar facing the street that I would walk to and meet my friends, you know, friends of mine who live just off Moffat. And I don't think we're taking advantage of any of those things. I don't think we're using it as if it is the other half of our downtown. Now, if there's an easy way to do it, you know, maybe it's just a little more than what staff has said. Maybe it's just um, defining the the area and just say that there should be ground floor uses that come up to the street. But I don't want to I don't want to lose that opportunity. So, again, although I'd like to make it as easy as possible. Um, okay, my other comments as far as the lawn equipment goes, um, it, it, which is part of the the SAP four. Um, I don't care whether it's listed with it or separately, but I would like to make it a priority because it is a big community priority and it interfaces with some other things that um, that the state may be doing. And, and so um, whether it's listed together or not, I would like to do that. Um, the Transit Center Master Plan, I'm very interested in how it interfaces with our historic downtown, which is the only, you know, the 100 block of Castro is the only historic block and the most um, vibrant block we have, frankly, in the evenings. And I want to make sure that we don't destroy that. Um, and uh, let's see, I want TDM to include remote work. Uh, and Let's see if there's a, as far as the legislative program goes, I, I'm fine if we cut back on it. I think some of these other things are more of a priority. As far as the automated guideway goes, I would also be open to deferring that. And then I'm wondering whether the VTA Evelyn site, um, whether that's immediate or whether that can be deferred as well. Um, and, and then I had a question about the middle income housing. Is that the same as the R3? Uh, I thought a lot of that was being incorporated in the R3 rezoning, but maybe, maybe, um, maybe staff can clarify on that, um, whether it has a separate component that I am unfortunately not aware of. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaines. Mayor, may I ask a clarifying question to Council Member Hicks? Uh, you okay. mentioned defer on two projects, and can you clarify what you mean by defer? Is that saying that the project should be removed from the work plan, or are you suggesting that the project occur maybe in year two of the work plan? So um, I, yeah, I said that in a vague way so that other people can weigh in on it. I would either be, I would either be into putting them in the second year or um, the third year, which we are not talking about right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Michelle Walter. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, Moffitt, the Moffitt um, Boulevard, uh, um, the Moffitt Boulevard precise plan. First of all, we should change the name if we're going to do it because it's confusing to have it Moffitt. We think often think of Moffitt as Moffitt Field, and um, it's it's not just Moffitt Field. Um, but um, I um, I have concerns about this. We you know clearly. This area 
it, many of the things that Allison um, or Council Member Hicks said, I completely agree with, but I kind of come to a different conclusion about it. This should be the other part of our downtown. And I think that um, when we finish the transit center and, and we, um, we get the underpass, the bicycle underpass that connects Castro Street to Moffitt Boulevard, that's going to be... Um, just kind of a watershed moment in this neighborhood's life. And we wanna make sure that we have all of our planning organized and clear um, then. But um, I understand that uh, that construction of the, um, the underpass can't even possibly start until 2025, late 2025. So that would mean we really wouldn't need the precise plan um, completed until probably 2026 so that it, 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 it goes, um, you know, it's useful for all of this development that we um, need to take part. I do think that when we do this, we want to include the Shenandoah site. That's very important. Um, and I think we, we need to rethink um, whether or not what's already in the streetscape design that is already in the, um, the transit center um, program master plan is, is, is kind of what we were talking about um, several months ago, um, or I guess it was just last month <laughs> when we, we brought up Moffa Field. Um, so I, I think that um, this is important and we wanna do it thoughtfully, um, but I think it, it is something that we should defer. Um, another reason um, we, we hear again and again about the bandwidth of our staff and this is a significant project that will take a lot of thinking and um, need our, you know, our most experienced planners to work on. And um, so I, I think it would be wise to put this off. There may be some small components that we want to do right away, but, um, and we could kind of do that as a beginning, but I don't think we want to do a, um, uh, a, I think we want to do a comprehensive job of this when we do it. Um, and that's what concerns me about what we're describing here. This isn't a comprehensive job of it. And, um, uh, and it, it is a very important part of our community because it is an extension of the downtown. And I think that the deadline for when we need it is in 2026. Um, so I think we should think about what are the components that we really need to do now and are they not covered somewhere else? And then how can we work toward doing a comprehensive job um, in the time that, that, you know, before a real deadline, which to me is, is when that underpass opens. Any other comments, Councilor Showalter? No, I, I really, um, uh, was generally supportive of, of the, the uh, staff report. I thought it was very well written. I wanted to mention that. Thank you for that. And um, uh, I want to hear what other people have to say. Okay. Council Member Abe Koga. Mayor, did you want to add your comments first before we go second round? Well, I, I guess I was trying to take a full list of everything everyone wanted to talk about first, <laughs> and then and then discuss discuss them. Um, has the vice mayor spoken already? No. Um. Yeah. I, if he can. Yeah. If you want to go? <laughs> you welcome. I'm, I'm happy to hear the two of you. I'm like deep in my note taking. So if, it's, if you want to just go, Councilor Robert, because that's fine. Okay. I just wanted to respond to, and I think you know, I'll probably be trying to cover all the items that have come up. But um, in regards to the Moffitt uh, Moffitt Price Plan, I actually think the um, deadline for this had passed, and had we had done this. Um, when we did the general plan update in, in queue, um, we would have had this done and um, the gatekeeper projects that went through anyway would have been under precise plan guidelines. And I don't think we would have had that, you know, discussion the way we had it for 555 Middlefield. So I think it um, we should be moving forward. I prefer a much more comprehensive precise plan update. I know staff 
resources are limited, but um, you know, and I would ex I would support expanding the scope from central to. I was thinking there's the 85 overpass. Maybe that could be the the cut cutoff point. Um, but as much as the underpass under central is part of it, that's a lot of geography. So I think we could get going on the precise plan for um, Moffitt. And um, in terms of the, um, and I know this is different departments, but um, I, I can't remember where they put, I was put in the category with the AGT, but in light of um, where we are, um, I'm fine to, defer it or revisit it in a couple of years. Um, I, there's, you know, movement right now with um, reimagining light rail and, and other projects. And so um, I, I, I would like to see where those go and how we might be able to connect into, you know, those types of projects rather than spending a million dollars of our own funding on the next phase of the study. So um, yeah, we're looking at trade-offs. I know it's different departments, but there's a project that I'm trying to, I don't know if you want to call it drop it or defer it, but at least hold off on it for the next couple of years. Um, and then the leaf book book blowers, um, so there is a, uh, and I think you all know, there's state legislation that Assemblymember Berman has introduced, and it sounds like it's moving. There's the, we just talked about it at the Air District, and there's a lot of interest in it moving forward. So I'm, I'm kind of inclined to just wait to see if that moves forward. And then CARB, the California Air Resources Board, is also looking at um, uh, uh, policy and uh, Assemblymember Berman's legislation would have sped up that process, but there is a process happening at a higher level. So I don't know if we really need to um, work on it individually here. And then I think I shared with you that clean energy is talking with um, staff from uh, the member cities to see if there's interest in an incentive program. So. I, I don't feel like the, compel, the need to necessarily call it out. I think we can keep it apart, uh, under SAP and just monitor progress and then see where we are um, by end, year end on that. And then the legislative program, I'm going to um, advocate for it because, um, frankly, for those of us who are on various regional bodies, um, you know, we do get asked about legislation where the city stands, but also I would like, this is really my, you know, my request for assistance in, in our work on regional boards. So it's not just following federal state legislation and taking positions, but this is all really about getting some staff support for our work we do outside of the city. And so that's why I feel it's very important. Oftentimes I come to these meetings, other cities have a binder, they know where their positions are, um, you know, cities association, we have to vote on bills. I, I don't, so I, you know, I, I go based on what I think sometimes, um, and I just don't think that's really um, the way it should be, be. So I think this is important. We've been talking about this for several years, so I would like to move forward with that. But um, I think those were the three items I heard, or four items that I heard. Um, so yeah, that's where I am. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and like Councilmember Abbe Koga, I think I'm just going to respond to a handful of the items that have come up. So similarly, I'm comfortable with deferring the HET project. Um, it's it's a heavy lift, and um, I, I, you know, we're not going to see the fruits of that labor for for a very long time. And it's also not clear uh, how the project would be financed. So I, I don't. Think we necessarily have to say kill it today, but um, personally, I feel like our our money and our effort uh, would probably be better spent elsewhere. Um, so comfort comfortable with deferring that. Um, similarly, with the incentive for gas powered leaf blowers, um, I agree with Council Member Matichak, and I think she she said it well. And it, it's difficult for me to justify elevating this above all of the other SAP4 projects. There's a lot of really important stuff in there. Um, I can't remember exactly how 
each project was prioritized, but if there is some sort of internal prioritization mechanism, I'd rather use that. And maybe it's based on, you know, greatest bang for the buck in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction. Maybe this is high on that, you know, based on whatever metrics are used there. And that's great. Um, but if it's not, then I'd rather continue working on the SAP4 projects based on whatever process staff uh, is, is currently using. And it's also helpful to know that there are state and regional efforts to, to address that issue. Um, the TOT increase, uh, I, think, I think we might want to do a temperature check on that next year um, just to see whether, I mean, I don't have a good sense of what the economic recovery, recovery will look like, but um, I, I do worry that if we're finding that, you know, the hotel industry is still suffering, we might want to say, you know, let's let's consider this another time. I'm not opposed to it, but I think it's important to to just make sure that you know we can we can find community support for for pursuing that. So that that might be temperature check next year, maybe some polling just to make sure we can we can actually get it passed. Um, uh, and then the last one, this one probably will take a little bit of time to to go through. I'm, I'm still landing on for the market. Boulevard precise plan idea. We should probably have a study session before we define it too much here, because I, I'm getting the impression that there are different visions and different ideas and different scopes. Um, and in my mind, one of the key elements of, of the precise plan concept is designing development standards that facilitate redevelopment of the area. And right now, it's zoned commercial residential arterial, most of the parcels in the change area. And I was looking up uh, in uh, the municipal code, the development standards for the CRA zone, and they're quite flexible. Uh, the maximum density uh, right now for, for residential development in that zone is, uh, I think it's 43 units per acre. Um, and uh, 555 West Middlefield right now is proposed to be 51 units per acre. Um, so we're not that far off. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the, the heights and the, the setbacks, I think, are uh, height limits, 45 feet, three stories maximum. I guess we can go higher if we want. But I, I think we probably need a sense of what are we trying to achieve there before we say, let's go in and, and change the development standards. Um, you know, I'm also looking at some of the, the parcels that we might consider including. Uh, so the, the strip mall is already included in the change area. Uh, it has a commercial neighborhood zoning. So if we want to, you know, allow residential development that would require rezoning, that's fine. Um, uh, 555 is already, you know, there's a gatekeeper proposal. You know, if we want to reduce the scope of that, I think we, we need to finish work on that before we we entertain formally including that within whatever development standards we might want to design for this. The one area where I'm a little hesitant to, so the Shenandoah area is interesting, right? The, 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 the danger, I think, and I'll, I'll defer to staff on this, but if we sort of upzone it right now, it has a public facility zoning and a medium low density residential land use designation in the general plan. If we change that to uh, mixed use corridor, which is what that change area is, and either commercial residential arterial or some higher density residential designation, the value of that land will increase. And that's gonna make it much more challenging for us to acquire it. So I agree, I want it to interface you know, with the rest of Moffat Boulevard. But I think we we need to be very careful about what we're trying to achieve. Because if we if we basically upzone it, um, you know, we don't own that property. <laughs> Somebody else might say, great, we're going to come in and build something that the, you know, the city may not want to see there. So there's, there's a, a, some advantage tactically if we're interested in affordable housing or a school or something and keeping it where it is now and maybe there's some different way of like you know a streetscape plan or something there's a, probably a different way of 
making sure if that area is redeveloped, it's integrated appropriately in the, the you know, what we're calling a precise plan. So all of that, to, all of that to say, you know, I, I think before we say we're going to do a precise plan or we're going to take any particular action, we might want to have a study session and have provide staff an opportunity to inform us about what each of these would result in and whether we're really getting, I hate to use the expression again, but the most bang for our buck in terms of effort and, um, and investment, $500,000 for a precise plan. Let's make sure we're, we're, we're spending that money wisely. Uh, so those are my, oh, and then uh, Council Member Matichek had mentioned the, the distinction between wage theft and responsible construction. I support that as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I, I have a lot, of, a lot of things on the list. So <laughs> um, I'm not sure, I guess at this point, where the best is for me to make my comments. Um, I guess I, I'd like to take my stab and then maybe we could go through some straw polls if that, if that works for everyone. Uh, Council Member Hicks, did you want to say something before I make my comments here? I see your hand. Well, I was just going to say that uh, uh, for the Moffitt Precise Plan, a study session might be a good start. Um, maybe there's a simpler way of making sure that it just doesn't be, you know, I, I think that for me, the, the concern is immediate because I've heard that several of the lots that are significant may be up, and I don't want to name them, but several of them may be up for immediate redevelopment or reconsideration. Um, so for me, it is an immediate concern, but there may be a simpler way of doing it than a full precise plan. You know, I just want to, maybe it's design guidelines and streetscaping, um, maybe, you know, something to make sure that their ground floor uses and that they're at the sidewalk and so forth. So I, I uh, think I am supporting the study session idea. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So um, I think it might just be easiest if I um, look at the projects and then I think I'll probably do something similar to what the vice mayor did and just kind of make make some comments off of what I heard colleagues talk about. Um, so I do like the idea of number three. I think Councilman Lieber talked about this. So um, when we're talking about alternative crisis, um, alternative mental health crisis response efforts. I thought too that it meant the um, the county's mobile crisis response team, um, and so I'm, I'm definitely interested in that. And hopefully, that will be what's meant for item three. Um, for item five, agree with the comments about um, decoupling um, wage theft and responsible construction. I think they are two separate items, so that I'm I'm comfortable with that. Um, let's see. Um, so for item 10, which I think is the one that we did, at, we were being asked for further feedback. So um, I checked in with City Attorney Chopra as somebody who lives in the Moffat area the last six years of, of my time in Mountain View. Um, you know, I just wanted to be sure that I could comment, which is, you know, as, as uh, a, a resident of the of the area, I, I feel really heartened and excited that this is a point of conversation by our council. Um, you know, from where I live, it's less than a mile. It's like, it's like maybe three quarter mile from downtown. The walkability is excellent to transit and amenities and retail and businesses. It is part of the general plan change area from my understanding of the 2012 general plan. So I would love anything that further explores being able to make it more walkable and bikeable, especially as an artery into our downtown um, and the transit center. So that's just, I think my general comments there. I think whether it's a study session or something more formal, I just want to express an openness because I think that's general enough for me to say. Um, let's see. Um, I'm comfortable with the VTA Avalon site. I think that that's kind of just going through the natural process. So I'm comfortable with that staying on the list. And then, um, let's see, 25, the AGT. I, I do, I think I heard at least three people talk about 
um, removing the AGT. I'm comfortable with that as well. I think there's so many different transit options that are actually right here in Mountain View. Um, you know, whether it's like autonomous technology um, or you know many others. I, I feel like those are something that we can kind of support locally in, in our own community that's already happening. Um, and I think the effects of how people will get around our city post COVID is yet to be seen. So um, I'm comfortable with that. Um, for, I think there was the comments on item 31. Um, I do the comments related to the um, S. They P4 and the state legislation. I'm comfortable if this gets tackled in an alternative way, then I'm, I'm comfortable removing it from the list, which it sounds like there could be some options for that. Um, and then item 29 was already on here, which was the biodiversity. I'm very grateful for my colleagues who so eloquently added what we meant by biodiversity that I didn't need to raise my hand. So thank you very much to council members Matichek, Hicks, and Show Walter for, for using your expertise and, and leading the way on um, the biodiversity discussion. And then um, there was a different one. So and apologies, I'm just cross-referencing my list and everything. So for item 38, when we're talking about an enhanced legislative program, I just feel like we are seeing so much legislation on the state level that it's really imperative to have this be a priority. Um, and now with the, with the pandemic and um, I think we'll be talking about this in a, in a next item, talking about the, the federal funds that we'll be receiving. I just see this as being really critical for, for our city. Um, I know that perhaps our, our size may make it seem like it's it's not as, as um, doesn't rise as, as much to the top, but I think we are a small but mighty city leading the chart on so many hot topics, hot policy issues. But I really um, think that having some some focus on legislation would be really imperative. I mean, we were just talking about item 31 leaf blowers, which has legislation that's coming from the state. So just kind of digging in and having that focus, I think, would really help us be, uh, I think, nimble and be able to pivot. Um, I, I've, I've noticed that there's ever changing things with legislation where we're writing letters and, and voicing our opinions. And so being able to just, you know, you have to drop on a dime to be able to submit it for a committee hearing or for, for the vote that's happening. And so I just, I want to be able to make um, sure that happens so we can bring as many resources back to our city as, as we can. Um, and then uh, let's see, I think, I think that's, it, I have openness to item 40, which is the TOT. I don't know in what time frame that should happen, but I do have an openness to continue um, to pursue that. So um, those are my comments on, on the list of 46. And then I'll go to Council Member Showalter, and then we can start taking some straw polls. Yeah, um, one thing I forgot to weigh in on was the AGT. And I would agree with everybody that we can put off almost all of it for many, many years, and it should be fine. If we ever need it, we can, you know, we can, but the one thing that we really don't want to put off is identifying the right of way and uh, just identifying the right of way and um, trying to maybe acquire those right of ways. They, uh, I know when we were talking about it years ago, there were, there was going to be kind of large pillars that were um, uh, scattered, you know, down a, down the the um, the uh, corridor that it went, and we need to have the um, the land for those pillars. The rest of it, as far as I'm concerned, we yeah we can let it go for many many years. But I really think it would be wise for us to ask the Public Works Department to identify the right of way, and um, or, or to at least get back with us with how much effort would be required to identify the right of way, um, and um, uh, take care of that. 
And then the other thing I wanted to weigh in on um, was the, the uh, enhanced legislation program. I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I know uh, serving on uh, BCDC and when I was very active in the Cities Association, uh, we, we really didn't have, you know, we, don't, we didn't have the support that some of the other cities had. And uh, particularly with the legislation, um, there was a time, oh, maybe, I don't know, five, six years ago when the San Jose um, uh, officer in charge of legislation volunteered her time for the Cities Association. Well, she retired, and with her went that service. And um, it was a big loss. So um, we need to be able to, you know, to support our council members on that. And also, when we serve um, through the through um, the committees on the cities, uh, the the National League of Cities, there are also times where, you know, we need to be able to talk to our staff about, you know, what do these various things mean, and you know, and and get a little help with it. So I think that could be money well spent. Great, thank you. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, City Manager McCarthy to help us. Um... Thank you, Mayor. So here is what I've heard. Um, I, it sounds like we have a uh, consensus on some items. Um, so what I'm hearing is uh, removing the AGT and the leaf blower projects from, from the action plan. Um, separate the, uh, or at least clarify that the wage theft and responsible construction are two separate ordinances. Um, I've heard different feedback on the Moffitt Precise Plan, but where I'm hearing consensus is landing on a study session for that to at least determine if we move forward. Um, then as far as the ledge program, um, I've heard uh, a few council members uh, say that they um, want to keep it, but that might be an item that we do a straw poll on just to make sure that um, staff is clear. Um, then I've also heard openness to exploring uh, the TOT. Um, and I would just also let council know that the way the TOT uh, tax works is it's, it's essentially a pass-through tax that's collected from, from people that are staying at a hotel that, that goes to the city. So the hotels never receive um, that tax. So just, just to clarify how that works for um, the public and council. Then um, one more item, the um, interest in uh, exploring the other mental health response, um, street outreach, um, also heard interest in that. So those were the main things that I have. So um, if I'm missing anything, please let me know. But I think we would just want clarity to confirm the Moffitt precise plan item, study session or remove, and the ledge program. OK. Oh, Councilman Matashek. Yeah, um, I just want to clarify, I don't think everybody commented on TOT. So maybe we want to have everyone comment on that. Um, at least according to my notes, I didn't jot down everybody commenting on that. I, I'm comfortable doing a straw poll on that one as well, if, if colleagues are okay with that. So I heard three items, uh, Moffitt, led the legislative program, and TOT. So perhaps we can start with Moffitt. So um, I believe in the staff report, it said a Moffitt precise plan, but I think that City Manager McCarthy and I both heard interest in perhaps a study session and then maybe using that as a building block to move forward. So I think I'm gonna do the straw poll, straw poll as that. So um, for council members who are interested in moving forward with a Moffitt study session, could I say to explore a precise plan or just a Moffitt study session? Is there some language here that I should use, City Attorney Chopra, or is that? Just a study session to explore a precise plan in the Moffitt, the Moffitt precise plan. Okay. All right. So what the city attorney said. So for all those who are, are interested, I guess we can just do a, a visual raise of hands if that's possible, or should do we need to do a roll call vote? Just a straw poll is fine. Okay. Do oh. Okay. Thank you. All right, so all those who are interested, it looks unanimous. Okay, does staff need anything else on this item? Okay, 
So moving on to the enhanced legislative program. So um, I, I think for this one, I'm just going to say for all those who would like to move forward with an enhanced legislative program. Does that sound right? Mr. Gaines and Ms. McCarthy? Yes, okay. I think people have comments. Council Member Matichek? Yeah, um, on this one, I feel like we discussed this before. And while I think it's important to uh, keep track of bills and um, help us craft our position on bills, I very much feel that we're the best um, advocates and that we should be doing that, not um, a firm doing that on our behalf. Um, I have had the opportunity to see materials prepared by consultants that other cities have. And while I appreciated um, the work, I, I felt like there was still more work to be done and that um, the individual council members who know the topics perhaps better than the folks tracking the bills um, can certainly add to our position and then advocate one way or the other better than a consultant would. So while I absolutely support um, an, an enhanced, because right now we, we don't have a lot of resources against this, um, I, I don't support going as far as saying they would advocate on our behalf. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Council Member Lieber? Uh, I disagree a thousand percent with Council Member Medichak. Um I think that there's always folks that'll take your money in Sacramento. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that the oh, Council Member Hicks. I my perception of what Council Member Medichak said is that it's the same thing that Council Member Lieber is saying. That, that you're um, that you're agreeing that that a consultant would not be as good as someone in house. So am I hearing something wrong? Uh, that's that's correct from from my perspective. I don't mind spending extra um, money on staff, but hiring a lobbying firm, I'm not supportive of at this juncture. I think that I said I don't mind somebody tracking them for us and providing us with data, but we're the best lobbyists. So I think I said the exact same thing. Yeah, and I think maybe I can before we kind of go a little bit deeper. I just want to clarify with staff. So when we've been when we've talked about the enhanced le legislative program, can you maybe give us a little bit of what of what that might be? I, I guess I was I wasn't thinking we're necessarily discussing lobbying. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So we have um, recommended $100,000 to explore for a legislative advocacy firm. Um, so yes, that, that would entail not only helping staff track bills that we just wouldn't have time to track all of the bills, um, also provide council with very pointed updates on legislation or, uh, you know, regional bodies or bills of regional interest um, that you all participate in, and certainly helping us uh, track through a lot of the um, COVID-related bills and changes that we're seeing with um, a lot of uh, local control. Uh, so that's really what the, the enhanced piece of it is, is just that um, staff isn't able to do that level of work. So um, it's, it's, up, it's up to council as to how um, expanded you, you would want the program. But yes, we have recommended 100,000 to go towards helping us with this program. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that that clarifies some things for me, so that's helpful. Thanks. Councilmember Abikoga. So thank you. Um, my, if I recall, I think we originally wanted to hire in-house somebody to do this, but it, just because of hiring issues and recruitment and whatnot, we went this route. But my expectation, I guess, was eventually when we're you know at a point where we can, I would would like to consider someone in-house. But I agree with Councilman Matichek. I think you're right. We are probably, the, we are the best advocates. Um, and as much as we can do, we should do. Um, I guess I'm just looking for the, you know, where's this bill at? Uh, what are the talking points? And it, I look at it as interactive. So, you know, consultant, whoever can give us 
the information, but then, you know, we should be able to respond and try to tailor it to what we think is best for Mountain View. So I'm not looking at just the lobbyists going up to Sacramento for us and, you know, lobbying for us. This is really where we can do the work. We should do that. Um, we just don't have any, like you said, we're, we have no support right now. And, you know, given all that we're doing, um, I, you know, I have, I, it's a challenge for me to go search the <laughs> legislation and whatnot. And so I'm, that's what I'm really looking for is that support, um, so the, the support and assistance. But I agree with you. I think we should be as much as we can, the advocates for our city. Thank you. Council member Showalter. Yeah, I was going to say a similar thing. Um, I think the idea is that, you know, we would get information um, and advice from uh, the consultant, but we would do the advocacy. That, that's how I would envision it. Um, seems like we're all kind of saying similar things. And also, you know, the truth is, I don't think $100,000 goes all that far with a good consultant. So I'm not sure it would cover them doing any advocacy, but it would cover them providing us with information, which is what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Showalter. I, you know, I, I guess I was thinking the same thing that that's the funding is mostly for going to be for research and for tracking, and then it'll come back to Council for, you know, deciding how we'd like to best advocate for our community. So um, I think that hopefully this discussion clarified the enhanced legislative program. Um, and um, I think at this point, if colleagues are comfortable, we could take a straw poll on if we are comfortable with an enhanced legislative program um, that would be doing, you know, research and bill tracking, and then it would be something that comes back to council for, um, sounds like action and, okay. All right, so all those in favor? Okay, looks unanimous. Thank you very much. All right, so the last item for the straw poll is the uh, TOT. So that is project number 40, which is study and propose any feasible increases to Mountain View's transient occupancy tax, TOT. We'll start with Council Member Hicks. So the, the two things I've heard from uh, various council members are um, you know, whether to do it or whether to do it later because there's not gonna be enough people staying in hotels now. And, and so, I, I, if anybody has further opinion on it, I mean, I'm very supportive of it. And the only reason I would defer it would be for workload reasons. So that, those are sort of the two things I'm trying to weigh right now. And I would appreciate anybody, um, you know, giving me some information on where my, where I should land on that. Thank you. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mayor. So my, my suggestion would be that we, uh, Keep it on the work plan and wait until our economic vitality. I can't remember the name of the, the new role, city manager, if you could, if you could help me, but, but get some, uh, some insight and feedback from uh, our, our new hire and, uh, and maybe solicit some input from, from the business community. And if we, if we find, you know, next year, I, I'm guessing that if it's on, if it's on the work plan, we're looking at November 2022, uh, unless unless we're looking at a different date. But that that seems to be the most logical candidate for for a ballot measure. Um, I just want to make sure that we're we're going in eyes wide open, that we have a full appreciation for what, if any, impact on um, the hotel industry there might be, um, and and be in a position to to build some buy-in and community support before we pursue it. Thank you, Councilmember Abikoga. So this work plan item, um, I was envisioning like we've done with other ballot measures where we put some funding aside to go out for polling, actually. That's usually the first step. And, and then based on that, we could decide to move forward or not. Um, and also we could look at the timing too, what, what would work better. Um, so I was looking at this as this item as just starting that process. And then, you know, during we, we can then decide along the way when it would be best, you know, how much it should be, so forth and so on. But usually it does include at least one 
round of polling, if not two, um, to best time it um, for success. So that's really what I'm looking for with this. And the reason why I um, was thinking of TOT was um, when we've talked about our SAP, our Sustainability Action Plan, and my thought was perhaps this could be a funding source to actually move the, the plan forward. Um, but also, you know, this has been something we've talked about for a while because our tax, I believe, is 10%, um, and our neighboring cities are at 14 So just to get us, you know, up to what we're, we're missing. We're missing that opportunity, I think, and just to get us on um, equal footing and also get, bring in some funding for the uh, sustainability. And I know that we have other needs too, but that was really my main um, thought was to, to figure out how to pay for, or pay for the sustainability action plan. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions or clarifications for the TOT item? Okay, all right. So um, all those in favor of, I guess, just studying um, any feasible increases to the Mountain View's transit occupancy tax? Okay, I see. One, two, so I see six. Yes, Councilman well, Madison. Well, so sorry, I feel like, um, Council or uh, Vice Mayor proposed one thing, and um, Council Member Abe Koga pro proposed something different. So I, I'm not really sure which one we're voting on, because I think they're both kind of studying it. One is the economic vitality manager studies it versus we do polling. I, I felt like they were two different directions, so I don't know how to vote. Sure. So uh, I will turn then to the vice mayor, council member Abe Koga. Do you? I felt that it was study, studying, and staff can see how they'd like to like to see fit, whether it's polling or whether it's the economic vitality manager. That's how I interpret it, and the two of you were providing ideas to staff, um, but perhaps the two of you can clarify. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Sure. Thank you. So I, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I think we want. You know, I agree wholeheartedly with Council Member Robbie Koga that we need to know if there's voter support because if there isn't, then there's no point in pursuing it. Um, but I do want to work very hard with um, with the business community to, to make sure if you know if the Chamber of Commerce says we're going to come out opposed to it, then there's going to be a campaign, and that makes things very difficult. So I would want to work with 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 the new hire, Economic Vitality, uh, and and just do. It's, it's both, in my opinion. I think we need we need to make sure that there's support from for both the business community and also from from our voters. Thank you, Councilmember Alicola. I agree. So it, the process would include um, reaching out to our chamber and you know, a number of stakeholders, similar to what we did when we did the business license tax measure. So um, I think it's all a part of the process. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's actually all. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess that's how I interpreted it, interpreted it as well. So do colleagues have any other clarifying questions on this item? I think that um, the Vice Mayor and Council Member Alicoba have talked about different kind of puzzle pieces to, in the process as uh, this is being studied. I think staff was asking for clarification if we'd like this project to move forward. Um, anything else on, on this? All right, so I will try to take the straw poll again. So um, all those who would like to move forward and study any feasible increases uh, to the Mountain View Transit Occupancy Tax that would include outreach to the chamber, polling, and work with our economic vitality manager, et cetera. Okay. All right, it looks like this one is unanimous as well. All right, so we've made it through the, uh, the biodiversity item and the uh, 46 projects, and now we're going to be talking about those that were not recommended to move forward, and we'll start with the vice mayor. Thank you, uh, and I'll do my best to be quick. I think these are where we start encountering the, the heavier lists. So the two I want to advocate for are the community workforce agreement and performance auditing. That should be no surprise. Uh, so for, for CWAs, this is an item that's been on our work plan since 2019. Uh, you know, 
the majority of the council that supported it at that time remains part of this council. Um, I do think it's something that we need to explore. Uh, and the compromise I'm prepared to support is to uh, complete the wage theft and responsible construction ordinance first. I think that was uh, the higher priority item for the community at that time. Uh, I think we've done a little bit more work on that. Um, and to not begin work on the CWA item until quarter three, 2022. So we'll complete a fiscal year. Uh, we'll have done whatever work that we, um, you know, we need to do to complete the high priority items in our work plan. And then we can reevaluate uh, after the summer recess uh, and, um, and hopefully begin working at that time uh, to, to complete something that we've been talking about for, for a few years. So that's, that's the first recommendation. Uh, and then uh, performance auditing. Uh, I, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and make a quick pitch for it. Um, as I shared with the city manager earlier today, I'm really grateful uh, that we have uh, a city manager who values uh, periodic self-review, <laughs> you know, evaluation of CDD, I think, is a high priority for all of us based on community input that we've had. Um, and I think we all we all want to see things get better. Uh, my request is that we make that uh, a standing part of our organization's culture and that we don't just wait until we have a city manager who values that because we may not always have a city manager who thinks that that's important. Um, I don't think it has to be a heavy lift. It might be one, you know, audit per year. Um, it might be less than that, but I do think it's really important to operationalize it so that way we don't wait until things get so bad <laughs> that finally, you know, we, we build support for, you know, a, a study like this. Um, or, you know, we wait eight years or 10 years or 15 years, you know, while we have a city manager who hasn't prioritized performance auditing and then finally get somebody who, who does. Um, so how we structure that, I'm totally open. We do have a city auditor defined in the charter uh, that has a fairly narrowly scoped role. Um, that's not necessarily prescribed in the charter. The charter simply says, you know, based on the will of the city council. Um, uh, but so we can, we can start small. Um, I did come prepared with a, a list of some of the uh, audits that, um, that the city of San Jose has done that I thought might be of, of interest to the council. So for instance, if we're looking at, you know, beyond the scope of like financial compliance work uh, and get into not only auditing of departments, but also policies and programs, uh, we might learn a lot about, you know, street pavement maintenance policies, right? Which are quite internal. And some council questions have been prying, you know, into that in the, you know, the past few years. Um, you know, towing services and vehicle abatement, uh, 911 answering times, development noticing. You know, these are the kinds of things that I think are important and we don't often think about them unless, you know, we start hearing, you know, uh, a lot of concern from the public. And at that point, you know, then we, we might be able to, you know, if the majority of us say this is worth spending time on, we might be able to promote some, some additional evaluation. But I, I think just building that into the organization's culture is really important. Uh, and I'm totally flexible on how we do that. Um, but I, I would seek your support in including it on the work plan so we can develop it uh, over time. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Abe Koga. Uh, so I start with the uh, um, CWA and I uh, am in full support of Vice Mayor's comments. So um, Yes, I'd like for us to keep that on, but we could maybe wait until we finish the other items. Um, so 22, I think you mentioned, Vice Mayor. That sounds um, reasonable. Um, the performance audit, I appreciate Vice Mayor and where you're going. And we, I've had, actually we had this discussion on a, um, at the Air District too. Um, I'm just, I, I think just to say let's just do it is a lot. So, um, and in light of the fact that we've, our city manager has engaged in a, a study of uh, planning department, CDD, um, 
I'm wondering if yeah, there's some way to um, in, to formalize that. Maybe we look at one department, you know, a year, or just to to kind of break it up so it's not like okay, let's do everything, um, but to make it a part of our you know regular practice to do um, some kind of study of all of our departments because we haven't, I know Councilor Matichek has brought this up many times, we have that, those performance numbers in our budget at the you know, back of the budget book and a lot of those just don't, they seem irrelevant, <laughs> frankly. Um, so, you know, we've talked about redoing that and so I think this maybe could be tied to that. Um, so I could support something that's, again, a more focused scope over a period of time. I'd like to hear from the city manager what her thoughts so that would be, but um, I do think we've talked about it enough many years to get those numbers <laughs> updated or change them to make them more relevant. So um, I think we should engage, start engaging in that. And and this could be another item that we you know push off to the second half of this two year plan. Two year plan. Um, I was thinking because of COVID and you know going back to reopening, we may just need time to do that, and we will probably be reimagining, and we are reimagining how to do some of our you know services and how to do our business. So um, maybe we need a little bit of time to 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 let that happen before we do these audits. But I think it's something definitely that we should be thinking about. Thank you. Council Member Showalter. I'm concerned about the soft story um, uh, seismic retrofit program. Uh, I, uh, we see that it, it turned out to be more expensive than was expected. Um, but we know that earthquakes are just a part of what happens in our geography. And um, we know that, that uh, these structures make the people who live in them vulnerable. And since they are um, often rented by, uh, they're kind of naturally affordable housing. There, they, you know, there also are are the people in our community who are least able to recover from an emergency like their, you know, their house collapsing. So um, I I would really like to suggest that we revisit this for starting next year or the year after that, and perhaps. This is something that we could use part of our um, part of next year's American Rescue Plan money to do. Um, I, I think that because of the vulnerable structures and the vulnerable people that live in them, um, it may you know it's really quite appropriate as a way to strengthen our community. So I just like to throw that out there as a civil engineer who um, who serves on this council. I, I, I just feel like it's really my, it's really my duty to bring this up. <laughs> We're going to have an earthquake sometime. And um, we, all, we all believe very strongly in safety. Um, so I, I would like to, uh, to, to keep this on the list and um, get started on it, hopefully, maybe next year. Okay. And I'm again just letting everyone know I'm taking notes on what I hear too. So, all right, um, Council Member Matichek. Thanks. Um, so I pretty much agree with what the Vice Mayor and Council Member Abe Koga said. I'd like to keep the CWA on the list, even if it has a deferred start date, and we do the other two first. Um, we have been talking about it for years. It's hard to get stuff on the list, so I'd hate for it to drop off and then have to fight the battle again to get it back on the list. So let's just leave it on the list. And um, I also, no surprise, um, agree uh, with the performance auditing. Um, I, I do appreciate that we have started to do some. Um, I think the vice mayor was suggesting that we, you know, do maybe one or two a year. Um, the one that's happening right now is a big project. Um, I'm assuming there's a, other projects that are smaller, but I think it's important to look at your operations and make sure they're doing what you expect them to do. Um, so I'm very supportive of the concept of that. The actual implementation, I think, is something we can discuss and figure out what would work best. Thanks. Great, thank you. Councilmember Hicks. 
So I agree with the vice mayor's proposal for the CWA, and I, I think other council members are, so I won't belabor that. As for the, the performance audit, I'm, I'm, I think somebody else said we're in the process of um, reimagining the services that we're um, providing, you know, going online with more things and, and so forth. So I would actually, I would prefer not to audit things while we're in the process of changing them. Um, and so I would prefer to get us, I think in one of the later phases on, of the agenda tonight, we're going to talk about putting some money into reopening uh, and, and putting things online and doing things in a different way. The, the process I would like to use is to do that first and then maybe start step-by-step -step performance auditing after that. Um, so that, that would be my, and, and that's also being, I was fairly convinced by reading staff's commentary on that. And the fact that I think a lot of other uh, committees and you know our, our committees and advisory bodies didn't make it a high priority for all of those reasons, I would prefer to defer it until after we um, reimagine the way we provide our services. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Lieber. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I definitely uh, agree on the workforce agreement. I think it's essential that that we get that completed. Um, I would like to see it come back to us uh, sooner, but um, I can accept the timeline <clears throat> that the vice mayor has suggested. Um, on the soft story issue, I, I think that that's really essential that we find some piece of that that we can um, get started. And, and I think that Council Member Walter alluded to this. It's the kind of protective action that government is supposed to be taking to take care of, of the long-term uh, safety of the community. And, and so I really want to see us um, move forward in some way with that. Um, and maybe it's putting together planning for uh, low interest loans or no interest loans uh, for landlords to be able to do that necessary work. Um, but we know that we're not ready for um, even a moderate earthquake and um, that we could really be in a very difficult situation. And then um, in terms of the um, performance uh, auditing, I, I have a lot of concerns about that. I think that right now we are asking for a bone crushing amount of work from staff. They're, you know, just looking at what we're looking at under one set of plans tonight, we are, are asking for an amazing amount of work and, and I think that we could get literally run over by people rushing for the exits um, with this. And, and I would rather see people actually fulfill the work than go into the dysfunctional situation where everyone's worried about um, uh, performance auditing. And the idea of doing going department by department and being seven city managers and getting into the operations of each department is really a textbook nightmare in, in council interference. And um, I've been on council when we had a um, very extreme case of, of council interference. And it was really something that took us a lot of, of time, effort, and angst uh, to unravel, and we ultimately had the courts involved, and it was it was a real mess. So I understand the the impulse to quantify things, but I think that we have to keep our action at a policy level, and and I think that we should. Uh, right size our demands from staff first and look at the positions that have been open and unfulfilled since 2015 and start to really give departments the help that they need before we layer on um, the 
uh, oversight of an audit. And um, I am always a believer in asking for the information that we're actually going to use. And I think that staff does have a good handle on, on some performance measures and how often we're getting to do certain things. And, and I think that uh, our interference in that could have some really unintended consequences. Um, and so uh, if we move in that direction, I'd like us to forestall it until we add staffing. Um, I would rather not see us be one of those cities that puts a lot of resources um, into chasing information that will not ultimately be used. Um, but I think right now there are people that are working seven days a week. There are people that are working 16 hours a day. There are people who have been terrorized during this COVID period when they have small children at home that they're expecting to sit in front of a screen and they can't teach them, parent them and fulfill all of council's expectations. Uh, all at the same time. And it can really lead to uh, losing good people to other cities. And then we have not served the public uh, well at that point. Thank you, Councilmember Lieber. All right. So I think I heard three different projects rising to dis council discussion. One of them was the um let's see community workforce agreement um the other was the uh, soft story seismic retrofit program and the other item for discussion was the um auditing to ensure the city is performing well those were the three items that i heard uh city manager mccarthy is that what you heard as well those three items okay so i think that perhaps what we will do is um, we could do straw polls on these as well um and i think i'll just try to like give my comments now and then we can go into the straw polls I think that, if that's all right with everyone else unless there's further questions or clarification on anything yes Councilor rochelle walter go ahead yeah um i'd like to ask uh city manager uh, mccarthy to weigh in on this performance auditing i mean obviously she came to the city and she saw immediately that our development and planning process needed to be revisited and 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 looked at and we needed help with that so i'm wondering you know how she views this um and uh what she thinks would be helpful because obviously what we're all interested in is making the city function better and um so what do you think would make the city function better <laughs> in terms of this uh, <clears throat> excuse me thank you council member show walter so as mentioned in the report uh we are undertaking already um continuous improvement efforts and evaluating our best practices and uh, starting with our development review process, which includes building and planning and housing. Um, it's a very big lift. Um, it's taken the consultants over six months. Um, we still haven't finished it. Um, we're also going to be embarking on a review of our internal um, financial and administrative operations. So I think I would just say, um, Part of what I brought to this organization is the willingness to look at continuous improvement efforts. And I think we have a department head team and a city organization that is um, constantly striving for excellence. And um, this having this be uh, part of the action plan would uh, make it a little more difficult for staff to just uh, focus on all the other projects that are already underway and because this work plan or action plan is two years um, if we really aren't going to be um, prescriptive about what to do then i think the item could be deferred um, obviously it's up to council but you know i i do believe that we are uh, doing this already 
uh, may not need to be formalized and um, looking at how we can improve ways of doing things is certainly what's happened with COVID. Uh, we've had uh, many changes to our processes, procedures, doing things online. We are upgrading our systems. We are putting in place new online, um, online processes and it's, it's a heavy lift. I mean, just to be honest, it's a heavy lift. So it seems like what I hear you're saying is that there's sort of a natural progression of uh, things that you see need attention. And when that happens, you're like now with the, the planning and building, you're putting attention on that and doing a study. And then next is going to be administration and finance. And so this is an ongoing thing that isn't just going to go on for a couple years. It really will go on forever. So. I guess I'm not sure we need this in addition. I think what we need to do is um, we need to uh, make sure that, uh, that the council does have some interaction with the city manager as we do about what are the things that, that need the next attention. And then we are included in those, um, those reports and, and the, the action plans for um, you know, for following up on what they've said. And so far, I think, I mean, certainly with this one, we've been very well included. So, so I kind of feel like we have this ball in motion <laughs> and we don't need to set up a separate system for it. Um, but that's not, obviously some other people are seeing it differently than that. Or are you? I mean, am I the only one that sees it this way? That we, that really the, we, the city staff seems to be having a system in motion? Or you would just like it to be better defined or, or what? What are we missing? So I think that's, those are questions you're asking to your colleagues, right? Councilman? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I see two hands that are ready to, to try to take a stab at, at your question. But if possible, I would just love to get my two cents in on the three items that I noted, if that's okay, just trying to get in here. Um, I know that this is, you know, um, the dialogue is, is wonderful. It's, it's nice to have such robust dialogue, even on Zoom. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess what I was thinking as um, City Manager McCarthy was speaking was, um, I wonder, it, it's to me, it sounds like the city's already doing this kind of goal or some, some you know, um, some type of iteration of this goal. And I wonder if there was just a way where we could put it on our website. You know, I think when we've been doing things as a city, we've put on like the REI website, we put up things about, you know, projects like Project Home Key. And so I wonder if we could just put something about like what the city's up to and, and what we're doing in terms of our good governance practices. Um, just so, we, so I think council could share with the public too about all the wonderful things that, that staff's working on. Um, I don't, I guess I don't feel wedded to an actual like council project or goal to that if it's already happening. I just think, um, you know, providing that information to, you know, in some sort of public manner would be probably nice to have, um, you know, to council member Showalter's point, it's, it's, it's happening, we just, and you get the feedback from all seven of us. So, you know, just uh, putting, putting that out there, I think would be helpful. Um, for the community workforce agreement, I'm in complete um, agreement with, with my colleagues. This has been something we've been talking about since I joined council three years ago, and I know council was talking about it even before I joined, so I would love to, love to continue this project. Um, for the soft story seismic retrofit, um, I feel torn because the cost is so high, <laughs> high. Um, to, to move this one forward, but I think it's such a critical issue with so much of our CSFRA inventory in need of seismic retrofit. So I feel kind of stuck in how to address this, this issue. And so, um, you know, I, I guess I would be open to the dialogue in terms of what, what council can do um, to address that, that topic. So, um, those are my comments on the three items, and we will move it uh, back to the vice mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll try and be quick because I don't I don't want to belabor the point. Um, here's the way I'm thinking about this. Uh, it, 
So for members of the council who have served longer than me, it would be helpful to know how many times we have done this in the past. When was the last time we had a comprehensive study of CDD? If the answer is, this is the first time the past 20 years, what that tells me is it's probably important to operationalize this because it's only going to happen when we have a city manager who thinks it's important. We haven't always had a city manager who thinks it's important. And as much as I like Kimbra, I have a suspicion she's not going to be here for as long as the city of Mountain View exists. Um, and we may not always have a council that would value this as, as much as many of us do. Uh, that's why I think it's important. I'm not saying that we have to do you know three or four audits every year. Uh, it might be an audit every two years. You know, I think the point is that we have just a little bit of uh, a, a process that gives us an opportunity opportunity to say we think it's worth a periodic review of departments, policies, and programs because you never know what you're going to find. And I'd rather not wait until things are so broken that you know that's the only opportunity we have to do a comprehensive analysis. Um, this is a much smaller example, but uh, you know I did some poking around with the shopping cart abatement uh, procedure, uh, and uh, I appreciate staff's recommendation. I'm going to be supporting that. But how many of us knew that we were subsidizing that program to the tune of $35,000 a year? And if we had known that, would we have supported that? Or would we have said, maybe it's time to think about charging a fee? every time our staff spend time going collecting shopping carts. Um, we don't know what we don't know, and that's why I think this is important. Thank you. Council Member Ali Koga. So um, after listening to everyone, um, I think I, I might be changing, I might change my tune a bit. Um, I think it is important to um, evaluate you know, periodically, I agree, um, and I will say at least in the time that I've been on council, which is now 13 years, I don't recall us um, doing this. And and those, you know, that that book, the num performance numbers in the back, you know, the way they are, they've been that way since I started. And frankly, they're obsolete. So I mean, I would even go to the extreme to say, like, let's not even spend time fill filling those. Um, pages out because they just don't really say anything or they don't really, you know, we don't get a lot out of that data. Um, and that's where I do think we do need to get to a point where we are evaluating what's relevant. Um, but I will say, you know, we do have a city manager who is, um, who has made this a priority and I do feel comfortable in that regard to um, just work with her or, you know, and, um, and I don't know if I should say this, but, you know, it could be something when we, when we do our council appointing evaluations, perhaps to discuss more about like a future, you know, what the future plan timeline work plan could look like. Um, so perhaps we don't need to put it as a council item, but something more operation, you know, focused on operational and, and have that conversation in a different setting. Um, so I'm okay to, move forward in that regard for now but if we do you know see and i hope city manager mccarthy is here uh, for a very long time but um i think there's there's some i would like to find a way to memorialize it so it doesn't get lost if personnel staff changes or, you know. um, and i will say this is very i don't look at this like micromanaging frankly it is about performance and that's what we are responsible for and it has very different from what happened in the early 2000s on um in the city so um I, you know i think it is an important uh tool it's an important process to go through but I like how city manager McCarthy is handling it. So at this time, in light of workload issues too, I'm okay to just move forward with, with um, what she has proposed. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on the, the three items, performance auditing, CWA or soft story retrofit? All right, so I think the way to move it forward would be Let's say, we'll say 
we'd like to move forward with it. <laughs> because these are getting recommended not to move forward. So I think if you raise your hand, you would like this item to continue and be re-added to the plan. Councilman Bobby Kogler, did you have something to add here? Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot about the seismic retrofit item, oh. but um, I have a question because when, when we studied this before, one of the big issues was cost recovery, um, You know, whether to mandate, mandate it or make it um, uh, optional voluntary and then we had issues with uh, CSFRA and I'm just I, I guess my question is has that been resolved and that was part of measure D just trying to resolve it but since measure D didn't pass is there a resolution or not because if there isn't I just don't see a path to move forward with it I don't know if who's <laughs> in charge of, who knows the answer to that I see. I see Miss um, Shravastava coming on, coming in to join us. So perhaps we can turn it to Miss Shravastava. Are you there? I, I am. Um, thank you, Council. Um, um, I um, have to say that I'll have to do some more research because oh, I'm sorry. We should probably we should probably introduce. Do you mind introducing yeah, yourself? Yes. Arti Shravastava, Assistant City Manager and Community Development Director. Um, this was an item that had just been discussed in 2019 when I joined, and this was this is my understanding. In order for property owners to pass the costs to tenants, um, it would have to be a mandated ordinance, um, and that is essentially what the council had initially um, uh, landed on. But prior to that, we were um, the city. They had also wanted a two-step process. With the first step being uh, the city funding um, an assessment of the soft-story buildings. We have about at that time our estimate was about five thousand units in a number of buildings, and I think it's around four hundred buildings. Um, staff went out and um, did an RFP. Uh, to get uh, an assessment. Now, this wouldn't provide blueprints for people, but it would it would help them assess sort of the critical um, parts in their buildings that needed work, so they could go ahead and and hire folks. Um, so um, basically, um, uh, our our costs from the RFP ran between one point five to two point four million. And we really did not have the ability to fund that. Um, in addition, the building staff had uh, experienced a pretty high workload, which is why we had recommended deferring it. Um, so that's essentially uh, where we are today. Um, uh, and, and, and hope I answered your question. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other questions on the seismic retrofit item? Okay, so um, I think we'll just start with um, for those who would like to develop and consider a community workforce agreement. So this would be uh, raising your hand that you would like it to move forward. All right, that looks unanimous. All right, for Continue the soft, the sorry, continue the soft story seismic retrofit program. So this would be, I'd be assuming moving forward with some iteration of the program um, and including it into the work plan. All right, so all those in favor of, of this item. Okay, it looks like three. So that does not move forward. And then it is the establish and implement performance auditing to ensure the city is performing well. This would be re-adding it onto the work plan. Okay, I see one. I'm <laughs> sorry, Vice Mayor. <laughs> All right. So I think those are the straw polls on the three outstanding items for the projects um, that were not recommended to move forward. All right, so I think that ends the um, action plan discussion and direction. Mr. Gaines, do you need anything else from us? No, I don't. Thank you all. It sounds like if I just, just summarize what, what you all voted on, you voted to remove the automated guideway 
uh, system as well as the leaf, blow, leaf blower project and you added the community workforce agreement as well as provided clarity that you'd like to see the Moffitt Boulevard thing turn into a study session to, to provide further direction. Sounds right to me. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mr. Gaines, for helping lead us through this and uh, to staff who helped provide um, further information. So this moves us on, I believe, to our, our last item about the strategic plan and visioning, which is um, the vision. So I will turn it over to City Manager Kimber McCarthy to discuss the recommended vision, and then we'll have uh, council questions and discussion. Thank you, Mayor. So with uh, this next and last uh, se section, uh, we are going to, and I, if you could share the screen that actually shows what the vision statement is, we're going to talk about uh, the feedback we've heard from all of you um, in the last few meetings about the vision statement. So there were several themes that emerged from your feedback. Um, those were themes about leadership um, and innovation and sustainability really valuing nature and biodiversity as we've talked about this evening and green spaces, um, honoring our diverse community. Um, and also you provided feedback that you wanted it to be concise and memorable and also really try and reflect um, what makes Mountain View so unique. Um, and obviously um, being in the middle of um, the innovation hub so what you see on the screen, uh, we can go to the next slide, what you see on the screen is where we landed with the revised vision statement, taking all of that into account. Um, so the statement is a diverse, vibrant city that plans intentionally and leads regionally to create livable, sustainable neighborhoods, access to nature and open spaces, and a strong innovation-driven local economy. So at this point, what we're asking for is can you live with this? Did we capture your feedback? And is it good to move forward? Okay, so I maybe we'll leave it up so everybody in the public can absorb. And then what I might say is if council members have any questions, um, we'll do questions first and then we can go into discussion. So do council members have any questions about the revised vision statement? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Does anyone have any discussion about the revised vision statement? And and just to clarify, City Man, oh, I see some hands, but maybe City Manager McCarthy, as people are raising their hands, can you just let us know again, like what you need from us? Is this kind of similar to the principles you, you need to know what we can, can we live with this statement and move forward? Is that what you're looking for? Yes, yes. Do you, do you agree with this this statement and do you have any a strong visceral reaction about anything? But really it's are you okay with moving forward with recommendation? Great. Thank you for that clarification. So uh, we'll go to Council Member Hicks and then Council Member Matichek. So I can live with it and I'm willing to move forward. Thank you, Council Member Hicks. Council Member Matichek. I appreciate the um, the updates that have been done to it, this. Um, I I would just change one word. I uh, I like the way we described um, our diversity, and I'm assuming this when it says diverse here, it means the diversity of the residents. Um, I, I would change it to um, a welcoming, vibrant city. I think Councilmember Showalter said that earlier, and um, to me that's just a a real it. It gives you a real positive feeling, um, and given that this is a vision, um, I, I really like that. I think it's, um, I, I like it better than the word diverse. I would just change it to a welcoming, vibrant city. Thanks. Great, thank you, Councilmember Matichek. Any other discussion on this? I, I, you're right. I love the word welcoming. I welcome that change. And I think with that, I'd be happy to live with it. So um, thank you so much, Councilmember Matichek and Councilmember Showalter for bringing that spirit to our vision. Does anyone else have any other comments? Or perhaps we can move forward with that tweak of a welcoming, vibrant city. 
that plans intentionally and leads. Does that sound all right for everyone? City Manager McCarthy, do you need a straw vote or anything on this one? Uh, no, Mayor, it seems like there's there seems to be agreement on that. So I think we're good. Great, wonderful, thank you. All right, so then um, I will turn it back, I think, to Mr. Gradeska to uh, for you to close it with uh, next steps. Yes, thank you. Um, next steps are we will go back and make some of the changes that we heard uh, about the priority areas to reflect some of the uh, the final tweaks to the language. And we'll bring that back to you uh, at the June 22nd meeting for hopefully final approval. Uh, the vision, uh, really great to hear that with uh, one word, um, we uh, have your approval on that. And then um, as a uh, um, Mr. Gaines uh, shared um, the we've got an understanding of of your desires for projects, and so we'll be updating the, the roadmap with that. Next steps are we are in the process of um, developing a, um, a visual, uh, a, 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 a graphically designed visual for the roadmap. Um, so um, we'll be working with staff to come up with that and to incorporate that into uh, the planned survey for the community. Uh, the intention for the, the survey with the community is really just to, to validate that what you all are proposing um, lands uh, with the community. Um, we'll be bringing back the feedback that we hear from the community to you as a, a, a companion uh, to the staff report on the 22nd. Um, we anticipate that the community uh, is going to support what you uh, uh, have approved uh, because um, the community input that we've received to date through the focus groups as well as the public comment at meetings um, you know really is is uh, seems pretty much in alignment with with where we've landed um, if there are any major changes you know we, we can present them to you but um, our, our intention and hope here is to just report back to you that uh, the community um, you know broadly uh, supports where you've landed and uh, hoping that on January uh, excuse me June 2nd 22nd that uh, this will be your uh, final strategic roadmap uh, for an action plan for the next two years two fiscal years so uh, I commend you all thank you for the long conversations the thoughtful conversations and never easy to, to come together and land on um, something that can be uh, as you've all mentioned um, just so many different um, uh, uh, we're, we're at different meetings to different people. So um, the fact that you've all been able to, to come to some kind of consensus uh, about uh, and, and a, a, a kind of reimagining of, of the, the, the key priorities for, for City Council of Mountain View uh, speaks a lot to your, your passion and commitment. So uh, honored to, to support you in that process. And uh, again, congratulations. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Gradeska. Does council have any questions or any other items um, from staff on this? All right, so seeing none, oh, yeah, sorry. I know what the vice mayor's about to do. So seeing none, I'll close this item and then I will turn it to the vice mayor. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, I move to continue the meeting past 10. Great, thank you very much, Do we have a Carol. second for that, thank you. Councilman Matichek. Sorry, you're muted. Yeah, I'm gonna second that. Okay, great. So we have a motion to continue past 10 p.m. from Vice Mayor Ramirez, seconded by Councilman Matichek. So we'll turn it over to City Clerk Glazier to take the roll call vote. Vice Mayor Ramirez? Yes. Councilman Matichek? Yes. Councilmember Abaykoga? Aye. Councilmember Hicks? Yes. Councilmember Lieber? Aye. Councilmember Showalter? Yes. Mayor Kamei? Yes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. So with that, I think that we could all use a quick 10 minute break. How about that? All right, so uh, I will see you all in 10 minutes and we will have um, City, City Clerk Glazier put up the timer for 10 minutes.
and welcome back. So we will move on to item seven, which is our public hearing. Item 7.1 is our fiscal year 2021-22 action plan and funding recommendations. Assistant Community Development Director Wayne Chen will present the staff report. Let's see if we can bring Mr. Chen over. Let's see. I'll move him over right now. Great. Good evening, Mayor and Council. How are you? <laughs> um, let me just take a moment to share my screen. Are you able to sh see my screen? Perfect. Um, thanks so much. Um, as the mayor mentioned, this item is to um, uh, provide an opportunity for Council to provide input on the fiscal year 21-22 annual action plan and associated funding recommendations. Um, uh, by way of brief background, uh, the city is a direct recipient of federal community development block grant funds and home investment partnership funds for the purposes of investing in activities regarding housing and community development. Um, as a direct recipient, the city is required to create five-year consolidated plans and also to create annual action plans to implement the five-year plans towards achieving those five-year goals. Uh, the 21-22 annual action plan is the second year of this uh, current five-year plan. The city typically conducts um, an annual MILFA process to fund public services in capital projects uh, and when public services are awarded, the city has also typically funded those um, on a, on a two-year basis, where capital projects are typically awarded on an annual basis. For this particular NOFA and annual action plan, uh, there were some unique differences here um, that allow the city to provide additional funding to projects. First, for public services, $340,000 in CDBG public services um, was made available through the NOFA process. Um, as mentioned in the staff report, this is significantly more than usual due to the fact that the city has received program income, meaning projects that have been funded with CDBG in the past have begun to repay um, some of those CDBG funds back to the city, and we are able to use a portion of that for public services. Uh, given the, the needs in the community and with the pandemic, um, it was an opportune moment to use these available uh, funds for public services. And so that's why in this particular um, NOFA process, um, uh, this level of funding was made available. And it's actually made available automatically um, sort of on a two-year amount, which is great. Um, in addition, the city does provide general fund support for public services. Uh, in an annual amount of $171,000. Um, this is a one-year amount because the city's budget process is approved on an annual basis. And awarded applicants through this uh, NOFA process would expect the same amount in the second year of this two-year funding cycle, uh, pending good performance, meeting the requirements, and that the general fund uh, level stays the same in the second year. Um, also for this NOFA process, uh, a difference is that the funding for capital projects, um, it was not included in this NOFA process. It was not included uh, because in the past it has been challenging to find qualifying projects, whether due to timing of projects, um, not having enough funds to fund certain projects, um, the uh, projects or agency's ability um, to do HUD reporting. And HUD allows cities to be able to directly apply these funds towards projects that meet the consolidated plan goals. Staff identified a project, uh, Crestview Hotel, uh, 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 as affordable housing to be able to use the CDPG home funds for capital projects and to apply it directly for the rehabilitation of Crestview Hotel. And so that's uh, um, staff's recommendation um, regarding capital projects. Uh, it was not included in the projects. Um, the NOFA, and it will be included just as a direct um, allocation to it. Uh, this application period opened at the end of December and it closed the beginning of February. 
Um, there was a required uh, uh, pre-submittal webinar that folks needed to attend to make sure that they understood the requirements and the application procedures. Um, ultimately, 18 agencies applied for CDBG or general fund support, um, and it represented 22 activities. The total amount of funding in both groups it was significantly oversubscribed. And as a result, based on staff's review of each of the applications, it was recommended to fund the top scoring applicants. Uh, staff recommendations were brought to the uh, Human Relations Commission at its March 4th meeting. Um, and HRC at that time also uh, provided funding recommendations to council. Uh, the HRC largely supported staff recommendations with uh, some minor modifications. Uh, but one of the key recommendations was that the HRC would like the council to consider additional funding options for four agencies not initially recommended. Um, staff does recommend using other CDBG funding sources and one-time American Rescue Plan funds for this gap funding um, that we will talk about in just a moment. And that is also included as part of item 8.1 that will follow this agenda item. So let me just jump right into it. Uh, these are the CDBG funding recommendations for council consideration. Uh, you'll see the applicants, the proposed public service activity, the amount that they originally requested in the third column, and the recommended total in the fourth column on the right um, incorporates uh, the HRC recommendations. So there are um, eight organizations here. Uh, it's a two-year two total, uh, as mentioned before, and it totals 340000 uh, these are for uh, Senior Adults Legal Assistance, Community Services Agency, two projects, Next Door Solutions to Domestic Violence, Vista Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Bill Wilson Center, Catholic Charities, uh, and Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. The next set of funding recommendations are for the general fund supported public service activities. There are 11 um, agencies that are recommended for funding. Um, you'll see them there on the left. I will go ahead and read them. It does include two agencies at the bottom, YWCA and CSMA, that was not initially funded or recommended for funding, um, but that the HRC did recommend to have at least 7150 for both of those agencies, and then also recommended council consider additional funding for YWCA and CSMA. Um, even if there were not additional funds, the recommendation from HRC is to have at least the 7150 for, for both organizations. So these are one year totals, again, because these are funded out of general funds. Um, and it totals the $171,000 that is available in the city's budget for these activities. These are the gap funding recommendations for the four activities, not initially um, recommended, but HRC um, requested uh, the city council to find additional funding opportunities for the four. There's a bit of information here, but um, I will just summarize it by saying Day Worker Center and Life Moves um, is part of the CDBG uh, applicant pool, and YWCA and CSMA, again, is part of the general fund um, pool. The two-year total gap for the four, and we made this a two-year period um, because of the type of funding available, and I'll see if we get to that in a moment, is 208832 as you see in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, staff did identify um, uh, opportunities to include additional CDB funds that were not included in the NOFA process. Those funds are just over $101,000. And in coordination with the city manager's office, um, identified a, an opportunity to use one-time uh, American Rescue Plan federal stimulus funds that the city um, um, is receiving to provide the remaining $107,000 of gap for these four agencies. And the details for how they break out in terms of CDBG, ARP funds, and general funds is in the fourth column on the right. Additionally, there is a recommendation for Council to consider a one-time funding exception for the general a Junior Achievement of Northern California. Um, in the past, Junior Achievement has applied to the city's uh, um, general fund bucket under the NOFA process, but they um, missed the, the deadline this year. Um, because of the availability of ARP funds, 
um, it is recommended that a uh, one-time funding exception be made to junior achievement uh, based on the proposed public service activity, their long history of providing um, these services to the community, and again, because there is this ARP resource available, and it is um, being recommended for a $9,000 um, funding amount uh, as a two-year total for junior achievement. Uh, so the funding recommendations are as follows to allocate an estimated three hundred forty thousand dollars of cdbg funds for the original applicants for, for that nofa process number two is allocate one hundred seventy one thousand dollars from the general fund for those general fund applicants number three is to incorporate additional in other cdbg uh, public service funds in the amount of one hundred one thousand two hundred and also uh, the city's ARP funds in the amount of $116,632 to provide gap funding for the four agencies plus junior achievement. Number four, to allocate approximately what $3.7 million of CDPG and home funds for Crestview Hotel for affordable housing. And number five, to provide any input you may have on the draft um, annual action plan. Our council's funding recommendations will be incorporated into the final annual action plan. And if council approves the gap funding recommendations and staff will make the appropriate uh, modifications to make sure that we're distributing the CDPG funds appropriately across all the CDPG um, uh, agencies. And just as a note, and we do this every year and every time, if the actual amount of any of the funding sources differs from the estimated amount, then there will just be an increase and decrease in, in um, the appropriate uh, proportion across the nonprofit agencies. The final annual action plan and final funding recommendations will be brought back to council on May 11th. And um, per HUD requirements, uh, there will be a quick turnaround to uh, finalize the uh, uh, annual action plan to submitted by HUD by the May 15th deadline. Uh, so that with that, that concludes staff's uh, presentations and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. So first we'll um, start with council questions and then we'll move it to public comment. So do any council members have any questions for staff? Council member Abikoga. Thank you. With the, uh, public, the public service programs supported by the general fund, um, I think I missed it. I, well, I know we usually do a two year cycle, but um, is it possible to just fund possibly potentially fund some programs for just the first year just because of the you know our our uh, budget um, to be safe if we need to be um, is that a possibility uh, th thank you so um, it is noted and it has been noted in the NOFA process that there would be um, again, a proportionate increase or decrease if the funding amount anticipated is not the same amount. Mm -hmm. but there was an expectation um, at the outset that these would be two-year funding um, cycles for public services. Um, but however, if council does um, end up in the uh, two, um, two years from now in that budget cycle to modify that amount, then it would just uh, be applied proportionally to um, to, to the um, applicants. The applicants were asked to include a two-year expenditure plan. So I think we would need to go back and, and work with the uh, applicants to make sure that we can understand that they can operate um, as planned based on the submittal information that they provided. Okay, thank you. Because um, I'm familiar with almost all of these programs. They've been with us for a long time, these nonprofits, except for one, the um, Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto project. And could you um, share with us what more about what that is? Um, and then do you have a sense of how many Mountain View residents would be served? Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to provide a, a, quick, a quick overview and then I will follow up. Um, we have our uh, CDBG consultant uh, assisting us on the CDBG program with some staff transition. So I can um, pull some of that information to um, uh, during ensuing questions. But uh, community legal services is to provide um, legal assistance 
really in response to the fair housing uh, goal that is included in the consolidated plan. Um, I know there was some interest uh, by the council in terms of funding uh, legal assistance, and that's that's some of the information and resources that they would be providing to tenants or residents in Mountain View. In terms of the proposed number of folks that they would serve, this is something that I can pull up um, in a moment when I get an opportunity. So in the um, staff report, it talks about workers' rights. Um, is that, it sounds like that's different though from fair housing or is it one and the same? Yeah, if I can uh, make sure to pull up that information in just a moment, I can see the breakdown of the services that they would be providing and uh, make sure to clarify um, the scope of activities. Okay, and I'm, I'm sorry, normally I, I used to have all the applications and I know we're trying to cut back on all that. So. I, I assumed it was in the packet and I didn't see it, so that's why I'm asking you now. So apologies for that. Um, but yes, if you can um, provide more specifics, I, I, it just isn't very clear to me based on this information what this program really is. Thanks. And I can, you can come back to me if you need to. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councilmember Matichek? Thanks. Um, my questions are also for Mr. Chen, so I'm not sure if he's still looking up the other one. Um, <coughs> so um, when we receive CDBG funds, do they have to be spent in the same year they're received? Yes, they, they are placed under an, uh, uh, an agreement um, typically for one year. We do have some flexibility, again, with the type of CDPG funds, but um, in the typical case, it would need to be um, um, dispersed and then spent in, in the year that it is given. So um, typically, that's a one-year period. Okay. Um, and how much do we have left of the... American Rescue Plan funds? I would defer that question to the city manager uh, to provide information on the ARP funds overall. Council Member Matichek, can you clarify um, what you mean by how much do we have left just in general as related to the next agenda item or uh, just for this I item? Guess what I was wondering is, instead of using um, general funds to supplement CDBG, could we use more American rescue funds, um, or even the ARPA funds <laughs> rather than the general funds? So yes, you you could choose, and it's, it's and it's kind of linked to the next agenda item. You could choose to uh, lower the funding that's recommended in one or more of the items. Um, you could choose to change it around, um, but I think for now, that's what staff's recommendation is. But if you have an exact amount, you do have the ability to to change it around. I guess to me, it seems like our general funds are more flexible in terms of what they can be spent on than either the um, ARP or the ARPA funds. And so um, I would rather use more restrictive funds in places where we can than, say, general funds that we might need for something else. And, and the amounts are in here. I, I'm just curious, is that something we could do? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Lieber? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I do have some questions about um, the uh, some of the choices uh, on here, and I'm wondering if um, these are just the folks that applied in terms of the CDBG or um, is did everyone who applied uh, get represented in this this graph this uh, spreadsheet? Uh, th thanks for the question. So 
there were um, a couple of agencies that um, were not recommended for funding. Uh, it's not on the table, but it is in a description of the staff report. So for example, the uh, Ravenswood um, COVID-19 vaccine program uh, was one of the activities not recommended for funding, and uh, but it is not on this table. Uh, um, but for the most part, the um, applicants who did apply through the NOVA process is receiving uh, funding at some level. Um, okay, because as I, as I went through here, um, I kind of did wonder, Vista Center, they have a, a very large um, facility in Palo Alto, but I wondered what kind of services they do in Mountain View. Um, and then um, the Catholic Charities on the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, um, I looked that up and on their website, and it was very fuzzy on their website. It's sort of like we help and um, there was one staff person um, noted as a connection. And then um, on the, the general fund um, things, I had a similar question to um, Council Member Abe Kogas about the community legal services in East Palo Alto, and I, I looked on their site, and I noticed that uh, maybe it's an artifact of them being in a different county, um, is when you click on their link to um, housing help in Santa Clara County, it resolves to Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County, but it's a broken link. And um, so... Um, it seems like, a, in some ways, kind of a non-intuitive list of, of organizations. Um, and, and I'm wondering, I'm more used to, in terms of housing help, maybe we would have Project Sentinel, um, but I didn't know if they just didn't apply or, or anybody else who is like a service provider in our county. Because I know that sometimes it really helps to run with the services that are in your home county um, because you kind of get that cross-pollination and you get referred to um, other kinds of things. But to me, um, many of these things didn't really, uh, weren't, weren't what I was exactly expecting. And then um, in terms of the junior achievement, um, it's hard to say anything bad about junior achievement because I know that they're a very reputable outfit and I definitely knew kids when I was little that um, made crafts and, and got experiences um, through there. But I'm kind of triaging this year for the desperately needed help around food, housing, um, COVID, disabilities, um, things like that. And um, so I, I don't know exactly what to do with the list that we've been given. Sure, I'm happy to provide a little bit more context. So the city does provide funding for Project Sentinel through um, other means and um, for example, Project Sentinel provides mediation um, services for renters and, and, and tenants. Um, what staff does typically when there's a NOFA avail available is to send the information out to its, um, its list, its outreach list, and to try to get the word out that there is funding available. And then from that point on, um, it is really a matter of folks wanting to apply for the funds. And um, this was primarily the list of folks who did apply um, for for public service funding. Most of them are agencies that the city has funded before, but there are some new programs, for example, the, the, the COSPA activity. Um, so 
That that is um, out of our hands in terms of who applies, but we do try to make an effort to make sure that folks know about it and then give them the opportunity to to apply. Uh, we did have a slightly extended uh, application period this time, as well as that pre-submittal uh, uh, webinar that we required folks to attend to make sure that they understood the requirements. Um, there was an application process with uh, various components that they had to fill out and being clear with the target population, the goals that they're meeting, um, and the Mountain View residents that they would serve, uh, as well as their expenditure plan. So um, each of the applicants needed to provide that information clearly, and then they were evaluated, evaluated against that. And so the funding recommendations were based on the evaluation of the information that was provided to the city through its application process. Yeah, so I, I guess maybe part of what I'm thinking is that um, next year, I, I'd like to be a little more uh, directive, possibly, and kind of like saying what we'd like the buckets to, to be, um, and maybe even going out and, um, uh, you know, soliciting an application from entities that we think are particularly effective that might not think that they'd get anything from Mountain View. Um, but some some entities that I would have never guessed it are getting pretty pretty well compensated here. If the council wishes, at the next um, time that there is a, a NOFA for public services, uh, we can incorporate into the process um, some additional prioritization of the types of activities that um, the city would like to fund. There are six priority goals that are identified in the consolidated plan. So any activity would need to meet those six goals. Um, they include things like increasing affordable housing, responding to homelessness, um, um, facilitating fair housing, um, supporting economic resiliency and the like. Um, but within that, we could provide some additional um, specifications or parameters as part of a, a next cycle NOFA process, if that's the council's desire. Okay, and, and I'm getting a note from um, someone in the community that says that the, the, um, the legal services in EPA actually do have a Mountain View office, and they have been um, helping tenants in Mountain View since 2016. It's kind of hard to see that from the information that we have. And if it's not on their website, then it's difficult to tease that out. Yes, we, we tried to provide information here in a summarized form. There, there's a, a fairly extensive um, application material that has been submitted and um, but to, to say a little bit more about the legal services, uh, the funding is to provide um, services to at least 110 uh, Mountain View residents for um, economic advancement. And there is a link through um, housing and, and um, immigration programs. So um, it is providing sort of a suite of services that does include um, uh, in, in employment and worker issues as well as well as housing. Um, items in response to council member um, Abe Koga's question earlier as well. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from council members? Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mayor. One quick question, uh, and I think this was substantially answered in the staff responses to the council questions, but um, just just to make sure I understand. So the the newly established eviction prevention and defense program, uh, I think should be included in the annual action plan. And I'm wondering if you need formal direction from us tonight to do that, or if you are already planning to amend the annual action plan to include reference to that program. Thanks. No, no direction is needed. We can just go ahead and include this under the section that talks about um, other public services that are being funded without CDBG funds. There is a section and we can include that program under that section. 
you know, we would just go ahead and do that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, there's no other council questions, so we can turn it over to um, public comment. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on your phone. We'll display a two minute timer on the screen. First is Teresa Johnson. Hi, thank you, members of the council. And I wanna thank the staff and members of the Human Relations Commission for all of their work on this. Um, we're very grateful for the staff recommendation to provide funding for our Meals on Wheels program. Just to put into context what's uh, happened in our community over the last year prior to um, the COVID-19 shelter in place order in March 2020, we were serving 1,700 meals per week, mostly to isolated seniors. Three weeks after the shutdown, we were serving 9,000 meals a week. And by the end of June, we were serving 12,000 meals per week. Uh, things have settled down a little bit, but we are still serving more than 7,000 meals per week to um, uh, residents throughout Santa Clara County. Uh, the need is not really going down as quickly as we thought it would. And we have great concerns about being able to continue funding um, these homebound seniors who have now found a source of healthy, good food. So we wanna thank you for your consideration um, of our application. And I want to assure you that the funding uh, that you provide will be spent only on our vendor cost for the meals. Um, we provide very fresh meals with no added salt. We're a heart healthy DASH diet. They're very tasty um, and our clients really love them. And we serve those hot meals for people who need those every day or they can get them delivered frozen once a week. We also provide socialization services. We have a friendly visitor program. Uh, we do medical assessments on them. We have a, a rich resource and referral service that we uh, refer people to many of the other agencies that are here also tonight. So again, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Kathleen King. Thank you very much, Mayor Kamei and Council. I appreciate you taking time at this time at night to hear from each of us. And I wanna thank you for the many years you've supported Healthier Kids Foundation. Um, what we always try and do is take what you're funding and leverage it. So you're funding 300 kids to get vision screen. We're excited about that. We're going back to that now and we're finding many children are either with broken glasses or glasses they've grown out of, but we also add uh, dental and hearing with leveraged funding from others. So I appreciate you doing this every year. And, um, you know, I, I can tell council member Lieberman, uh, many of us have gotten to know each other through these meetings and um, Teresa and I are working on vaccination efforts together. So uh, you not only give funding to each of us, but you also help us partner in how we work together. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Madeline Musconte. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm uh, with Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto. I'm the manager of institutional giving, and I just wanted to clarify a few things um, about our proposal. So uh, Community Legal Services, our mission is to provide transformative uh, change through direct legal services. We operate areas of housing, economic advancement, and immigration. But I wanted to highlight that for this proposal, we applied specifically for funding for economic advancement program, looking at the economic resilience uh, goal that the city had laid out in its plan. And with this project, we are going to be targeting low wage workers who have lost jobs due to the pandemic and who are now either applying for jobs or trying to return safely, safely to work. So answering questions about you know, what to do if an employer violates COVID safety protocols. And we will also be doing reentry services, helping community members who have made up for past uh, criminal convictions to clear their record. Um, 
we anticipate serving at least 110 clients in Mountain View uh, each year. So, and this is based off of clients numbers that we have seen. Uh, we, in partnership with the Palo Alto Public Defender's Office, we filed close to 350 expungement positions in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties combined. Uh, about 20% of those were in Santa Clara County last year. We saw a really huge um, rise in need in Mountain View last year, particularly in areas of workers' rights. So that's why we are applying for uh, funding for economic resilience. And Katrina Logan, my colleague, is also on the line. So I'll defer uh, to her uh, later. I yield the rest of my time to her. Thank you. Pilar Furlong. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Pilar Furlong and I'm with Bill Wilson Center. And I'm here this evening to speak with you about our family advocacy services program that we're proposing to provide in the Mountain View Los Altos High School District. So FAST is a school-based homeless prevention and intervention service. And the program goal is to support families and connect them to community resources so students can remain in school giving them the best chance of academic success. To begin services in the Mountain View Los Altos District, we requested a total of $70,000 over two years to fund a part-time case manager that would be dedicated to the district. Um, this is the minimum that we, we needed to get the program up and running. Um, our proposal is supported by the district and we received a really strong letter of support from the district wellness coordinator. The Wilson Center has been providing FAST in other school districts, districts since 2012, and our staff work really closely with the district McKinney-Vento liaisons to identify students who are struggling due to housing instability. While some families may need housing, others just may need connections to services. For those who need housing, the case manager works with them to complete the county's VI SPDAT assessment, which puts them in the county queue for housing. But Bill Wilson Center goes even beyond that, and we can provide temporary shelter programs for families and for youth, as well as our own rapid rehousing programs for which they may qualify. And then lastly, to address issues that may arise from the trauma of living on the street, we provide counseling. So with 14% of the district's students identifying as socioeconomically disadvantaged, plus a number of homeless and newcomer students, there's definitely a subset of students that need our services. So I'm very happy that we were recommended for funding and I hope you'll take the staff's recommendation this evening. Thank you. Georgia Bussell. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. This is Georgia Basile. I'm the Directing Attorney of Senior Adults Legal Assistance or SALA. Uh, as many of you know, we provide free legal services to Mountain View residents 62 or older, targeting clients that are very low income or at risk of abuse or loss of independence. Our current CDBG funding supports our services to Mountain View seniors, and we do thank you. We're pleased the action plan does recommend funding for next year. During times covered by COVID health orders, we will continue to provide our services to seniors remotely and primarily by telephone, per the guidelines of the California Department of Aging. When in-person services can be reinstated at senior centers, it's our hope that solo appointments will be available again at Mountain View Senior Center. We've been located there for over 30 years and we very much miss not being able to be at that site. Legal assistance continues to be a critical need for seniors. We continue to assist clients with legal problems involving public benefits they rely on to shelter in place and meet basic needs, such as SSI, Social Security, Medicare, and Medi-Cal. We're also seeing clients that are worried about evictions even during COVID moratoriums. We're also assisting clients that are victims of elder abuse. Many of these cases involve abusers living in the homes of our clients and sheltering, <clears throat> excuse me, in place with them. When warranted, our attorneys provide full legal representation for clients in court proceedings for elder abuse and domestic violence restraining orders to remove these parties from our clients' homes. And lastly, we're seeing clients that need to do very basic legal planning for incapacity or end of life with powers of attorney for health care or for finances. This is really important now during COVID if they are gravely ill and their family members can't be with them. 
Your funding helps us provide the highest level of service possible to Mountain View seniors. So I do hope that you will approve the recommendation in the action plan. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry Burns. Good evening, American May and City Council members and uh, Mountain View staff. Um, this is Sherry Burns. I'm the Executive Director with Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. Um, and SVLC has been providing housing assistance services to people with disabilities, um, including older adults with chronic health conditions, uh, for over 44 years. Um, we've had a long-standing relationship, um, which we greatly appreciate with the City of Mountain View. And through our uh, project, the Housing Program for Persons with Disabilities, will assist 70 low-income Mountain View residents with disabilities, including seniors with disabling conditions, in learning how to locate affordable, accessible community-based housing in which to transition from homelessness, nursing facilities, or unstable temporary housing. We do this through individualized service provision from our housing coordinators that specialize in housing services. And we also offer housing workshops usually in the community, including at the Mountain View Senior Center. But during the pandemic, these uh, services uh, workshops have been offered online on a twice a week basis. Um, we also, uh, through these workshops, teach clients how to perform a housing search and what tools are available to manage the process. Um, we also connect uh, the participants to our other 12 services, such as rent relief, food access through our food pantry, independent living skills training, benefits counseling, and peer support, as well as to our other partner organizations, many of whom are here tonight, that offer other support services. We greatly appreciate your support in the past, and we look forward to working with you as a partner in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander Brown. Hey. Uh, Looks like a lot of these organizations are doing great things, and I'd love to see it. I'd like to see money going to where it's actually being used to help people directly uh, and serve needs. I just wanted to speak to my experience with CLASPA. Uh, they have been fantastic, and I've had many people in the community who have been helped by them in the housing area get advice. And I wanted to point out that when it comes to workers' rights, if you pass a wage theft ordinance, but there isn't an organization ready to try to help people understand what their rights are and how they can take advantage of the ordinance that's supposed to protect them, then it's not much of a protection. Uh, and organizations like CLASPA that are there in the community doing help for the people who need it the most, who like, don't understand the legal system, can't understand it, don't want to. Why would you? It's terrible. Uh, people like that, are doing great work and they deserve way more than they're getting uh, both in money and prestige. Thanks. Thank you. Jordan Dancer. Jordan, are you there? Good evening. I'm Jordan Dancer, Grants Manager at Next Door Solutions to Domestic Violence. We've requested $15,000 for the two-year grant period to provide support services to 70 survivors through three core programs. Our services are at no cost, at will, and provided by trained and certified DV peer counselor advocates, with the majority being bilingual. The safety of victims of domestic or intimate partner violence and their children is our primary concern. As batterers isolate their partners, victims become increasingly vulnerable socially, economically, their health and wellness, and missed opportunities and advancement in life. At the start of the pandemic last year, we shifted quickly to remote services, communicating with our survivors by phone, text, email, and phone or video conferencing. And our shelter and hotline remained operational 24-7 throughout. Many clients report escalations of violence within their relationships and others spoke of how the stress and anxiety created by the pandemic and its numerous impacts on our lives re-triggered the previous trauma. Community and systems advocacy services address crisis safety and stability needs through crisis intervention counseling, lethality risk assessment and safety planning, legal advocacy that focus on legal rights and how the court systems work, 
uh, restraining orders and referrals to our internal legal counsel. Support groups, currently 12, are in English and Spanish and includes group for male survivors, LGBTQ, and for teens. Facilitators lead a series of specific uh, discussion topics, and support groups provide a larger circle of support through shared experiences and help to increase resilience, knowledge of resources, increase safety strategies, and reductions in isolation. And in self-sufficiency case management, survivors work towards maintaining or increasing their level of self-sufficiency, focusing on eight essential life domains of income, food, housing, employment, education, health care, wellness, and domestic violence, which is abuse and safety. Thank you for considering our, our requests, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Alba Garza? Hi everyone, thank you for your time City Council. My name is Alba Garza and as one of my roles in the MBLA school district, I work closely with homeless students as a McKinley Vento district liaison. I'm in favor of the Bill Wilson Center Family Advocacy Services Program. I have firsthand seen the devastating repercussions that this pandemic has had on our most vulnerable student population and strongly believe that this program would bring relief to these families. This grant would allow us to have an an on-site case manager designated solely to our homeless students and provide intensive case management services. This access to a county approved case manager immediately removes barriers such as being screened for the vice bidet in order to enter the county queue. The vice bidet stands for vulnerability, index, service, prioritization, discussion, assist decision assistance tool, which prioritizes the need for housing using different risk factors. The ability to provide this in-house at our school sites would be one of the many benefits. The knowledge and expertise from this well-established agency and case manager would ensure that students have an alternative option to homelessness. It would also alleviate the high demand being placed on our local community agencies as the demand for housing support rises. In, in addition, Sorry, um, as mentioned earlier, the VISPADAT would be provided by the case manager. We would like to join efforts in providing access to housing options, maintaining housing stability, and preventing homelessness for our students and families in our community. This program would add an additional layer of support to our students in such criti critical times. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Myers. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Mayor Kamei and council members. Uh, I'm Tom Myers, Executive Director at Community Services Agency. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be here with you this evening uh, and to uh, uh, present the three programs that we have presented to the city for funding. Uh, I uh, wrote a letter uh, late this afternoon uh, adding to the data that you're seeing uh, from uh, the city staff uh, and uh, am, uh, uh, in addition to that, I, I am uh, pleased to uh, let you know that our, our programs uh, are uh, moving into a phase where we are starting to think about uh, what is life going to be like for our clients after COVID. Uh, in addition to all of the information that you uh, probably already know and have seen from the data of what's going to be supported by the CDBG proposals tonight, uh, there is one thing that I think that is incredibly important, and that is that we are starting to look at uh, opening up uh, uh, and uh, when, for example, the senior center opens up one more time uh, and we are able to start providing lunches inside uh, once again, uh, what is our capacity going to be? Uh, we have to look at whether this is uh, uh, the numbers that we're carrying now of clients uh, that uh, is really uh, overwhelmed our system uh, in the beginning, uh, and uh, we've been able to start uh, serving now from, uh, are we going to continue to be able to serve that in the future, which is why support from the City of Mountain View and the support from our very generous community is so vitally important. And that's why we partner with many of the uh, groups that you uh, see here today, as well as many who are not uh, a part of this process. Uh, because those partnerships are vital for us to be able to provide services. So thank you very much for your consideration. Great, thank you. William Blair. 
Good evening, council members. My name is William Blair. I'm the MVLA Wellness Coordinator, and I came to speak on behalf of the funding for the Family Advocacy Services Partnership with MVLA. But I also just want to say thank you to the City of Mountain View for all of its support for MVLA schools throughout the pandemic, for all the support with the Teen Center, um, CSY, uh, CYSC, um, Senior Center, and so thank you for all of that. And I, you know, I think my colleagues. Alba and Pilar have already kind of explained uh, the benefits, but I just want to say thank you for uh, for considering it, and I really commend the City Council for really prioritizing people. We know that our most vulnerable populations have been the most disproportionately affected, and so we really appreciate um, giving the space and time to consider these proposals for all of the organizations. We know that the, the interagency support um we need far more coordination and interagency partnerships than we've ever had in the past and so we're really grateful for this opportunity thank you thank you all right that concludes our public comment so we can bring it back to council for deliberation does anyone have any comments or um i believe we're going to need a motion for this item Councilmember Matichek. Thanks. So I'm supportive of the um, organizations that and the amounts that staff has recommended. Um, the only change I would suggest, if other council members are open to this, is to use the uh, funds we got from the federal government, the ARP funds instead of the general funds and that was hundred and seventy one thousand dollars but the total would remain the same so i would make that motion that um oh, do i have to read something you can just refer to the staff recommendation with the proposed modification that you okay so the staff just... recommendation um with the the one change which is instead of using one hundred seventy one thousand from the general fund use 171,000 more from the um, America, America's Rescue Fund. Thanks. Thank you. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I, um, I'm, I, I'm, I, I want to move on because I think the, the next item is going to take a, a little while, but uh, I would encourage the maker of the motion to, to just pursue the staff recommendation if there's otherwise general comfort with uh, the proposal and the allocation. The reason I say that is that the federal funds and the general fund are virtually interchangeable. My understanding, I'll defer to staff on this, but we can use the federal funds to offset lost revenue resulting from the impact of the pandemic. And if that's the case, it's it's functionally equivalent to general fund money. If we could say we lost this amount of revenue from sales tax or TOT, we could supplement it with this and use it for any purpose, then they are the same. Um, and the, the, the self-interest I have in this is it makes the math a little bit easier for the next item, because otherwise we're going to have to sort of be mindful of whatever it is, $170,000, I think, roughly, from the uh, from the federal funds that we're going to have to sort of take out of the allocation from, from consideration. So um, I would second the motion if you make that change. I guess I'd ask staff. I mean, I was under the impression that the... Um, Federal funds were not as flexible as our general fund, but if that's um, not the case, I guess I'd like to know. Uh, Councilmember Matichek and Ramirez, um, so the funds have to be used for a specific purpose, which we will describe in further detail in the next item. Um, and it is accurate that the funds can be used to replace any lost revenue, which is very broad. Um, so in the sense that the city has lost almost 20 million in revenue over this past fiscal year, um, the ARP funds 
could ostensibly be used to backfill that, although we have made other recommendations for that because we are going to be balanced this year. Uh, so it really is up to council. Um, the ARP funds can be for a variety of things. Um, and I believe that these, these uses would be covered based on uh, what we have in the staff report, but it, it's really um, depending on whether you wanna use 170,000 towards this, which might give you less money for other items um, in the next agenda item. So it's really up to council. Um, there, you know, you, you could do either or. I did also want to know that the 171,000 amount is for um, just the first year of the two years. And so if council were interested in funding the same set of organizations for the second year, it, it would really be 171,000 times two uh, for a two year funding amount. Did we want to hear from council member Michelle Walter? Sure. I mean, I heard anything on this. So I, I, I want to call on her, but Vice Mayor asked you a question, Councilmember Matichek, so I want to be responsive to his question, which is if you were amenable to join. Because um, we have a motion, but no second, and so I... Yeah, I guess I, I was interested in hearing if other council members had a perspective on um, we use the general fund or we use the other funding. Okay. I just, I wasn't sure if we could proceed. I know that there was a motion. So I, we're getting into a discussion without even a second on a motion. So that's that's fine. I, I, I don't know. If there's a point of clarification, City Attorney Chopra, can we continue this exploration? Or, you know, there was a motion and then no second. Yes, you can continue the, the discussion about the the use of the of the funds. Okay. Councilmember Schalter. I, I was going to, um, I was going to second, that's what I was going to say, uh, but um, I, I think that I would feel a little more comfortable going with the staff recommendation, um, but it, if so, if you're willing to change to the staff recommendation, um, Council Member uh, Matajek, that's better, <laughs> but, but um, I'm willing to second it either way. Let's, let's take a vote and see where we are. So I'll leave it as is, and um, we'll see where we are. Okay, so the motion is to move forward with the stock recommendation, but instead of using the general fund money, we would be using our American Rescue Plan funding times two. All right, Council Member Lieber. Um, I was just gonna say that I'd feel more comfortable with um, uh, going with the staff recommendation is the funding sources uh, are right now and uh, t to give us the bandwidth to fully consider the next item. Um, and so if there is not a second to the, the current motion and the vice mayor doesn't wish to make a substitute motion, then I, I'd be comfortable with making that motion. Sure, so I think I heard a second from Councilmember Showalter on Councilmember Matichek's um, motion, but if you would like to make an alternate, um, or sub sorry, a substitute motion, then um, you can, the time to do so I think would be now. Okay, I, I'd like to move the, um, the staff recommendation with the funding sources as, as they are. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a substitute motion back to the original staff recommendation. Councilmember Hicks. I would like to second the staff recommendation with the, as originally put forth, with the funding as originally put forth by staff. Okay, great, thank you. So we have a substitute motion from Councilmember Lieber and second by Councilmember Hicks for the original staff recommendation. Um, I think we can take a roll call vote if folks are comfortable with that. Okay. Um, City Clerk Glazer. Councilmember Lieber. Aye. Councilmember Hicks. Yes. 
Councilmember Ali Hoga? Aye. Councilmember Matichek? Sure, that's fine, yes. Councilmember Showalter? Aye. Vice Mayor Ramirez? Yes. Mayor Kamei? Yes. Substitute motion carries. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So this concludes item 7.1. So we can thank you to staff and to our uh, public commenters who are staying with us into the wee hours of the night. It's uh, We can move on to item eight, which is new business. 8.1 is our fiscal year 2020-2021 third quarter budget status report. Our fiscal year 2021-22 preliminary general operating fund forecast update and American Rescue Plan Act funding update. City Manager Kimber McCarthy and Finance and Administrative Services Director Jesse Takahashi will present the staff report. After the staff report, we will have council questions and then we'll move to public comment. I'll turn it over to you, City Manager McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. So our uh, Finance and Administrative Services Manager, Jesse Takahashi, is joining me for a very brief uh, abbreviated presentation given the late hour. Um, I believe he's going to start sharing his screen soon. If not, um, I can share mine. Let me just pull this up. Okay, so as you all know, uh, we came to council in February with the mid-year update and at that time we were projecting our deficit would be around one and a half million dollars. Um, we also talked a lot at that time on about how much there was still a lot of uncertainty, how we were still assessing revenues and there was a lot changing with the reopening of the economy which was impacting our revenues. So although COVID does still continue to impact our economy, there are uh, changes that have impacted our budget more positively. So uh, we all know, as we talked about at the beginning of this meeting, that uh, we have moved to a less restrictive economic tier. Uh, there are uh, more vaccines. Uh, so things are looking better, although there is still uncertainty because we don't know yet specifically when things are going to change um, in terms of all of the diff different economic sectors opening up. So the governor did announce June 15th as a target date for the state reopening. That's based on uh, less folks going into um, the hospital and also based on how many people are vaccinated. So um, with that, one of the other major um, developments since the mid-year was the adoption of the American Rescue Plan Act. So we've been talking about it um, quite often this night, tonight. Um, and the American Rescue Plan provided direct funding to cities, counties, and school districts nationwide. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but at this time I'll go ahead and turn it over to our finance director, uh, Mr. Takahashi. And I'll drive the presentation too. Jesse. Okay. Go ahead and uh, skip that slide. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is essentially the update for our fiscal 2021 general operating fund. Uh, as you can see, revenues expenditures are pretty closely matched at this point. Um, and we would otherwise have a $300,000 uh, positive balance, which was the, the new um, bottom line were it not for an additional one-time fund of what we are calling the excess ERAF, and it's a, a form of property tax that comes to us through the county um, that is only for another couple of years. And uh, because of this one-time infusion of funds, which is almost $4.9 million, our uh, revised uh, uh, general operating fund net balance is now estimated to be $5.2 million. So um, that's quite a bit um, to the better from our last update to council. Um, and although there is still a lot of uncertainty going on. So that's where we are on the current year. And looking ahead to uh, next year, fiscal 21-22 forecast assumptions. Um, the significant uh, highlight here is the first um, item, which essentially the property tax base, which is our largest revenue source is only scheduled to increase by just over 1% um, compared to the normal 2%. So it will be a, a smaller increase and that's probably the most significant, although we do uh, expect overall property tax revenue to still um, show growth. 
Next slide. And now looking at the uh, forecast for next year, um, uh, including all the updated revenues and expenditures, uh, the initial operating balance is actually a deficit of 3.99 million, just under 4 million. But uh, as I had mentioned, the excess ERAF, that um, uh, revenue source from the county that we're expecting to go away uh, beyond uh, fiscal 22 is almost uh, $5.8 million that we're expecting. And so when we infuse that into uh, the balance, it will actually make our balance uh, positive 1.8 million. And so that's what we are currently looking at based on um, the most recent information that we have available. And really the kind of the highlight I think of this uh, um, uh, item tonight is the discussion on the American Rescue Plan. Um, <clears throat> the American Rescue Plan uh, was enacted last month uh, by the president. Uh, it allocated $65 billion to local governments, $8 billion to cities within California, and Mountain View share uh, is just under $15 million. Um, dollars. And that is uh, spread over two, uh, two years. So we will get half of that amount, about $7.4 million roughly uh, this year and uh, another 7.4 um, next year. Um, some of the things that uh, they could be used for are to replace lost revenue, uh, which was mentioned earlier, uh, to mitigate negative economic uh, impacts from the pandemic, uh, assisting small businesses, households, hard hit industries and to aid in economic recovery. Uh, also permitted are investments in water, sewer or broadband infrastructure. And uh, one of the uh, um, provisions is that these funds have to be spent by the end of 2024. So there is a number of years in which uh, these funds can be used. Um, and it should be noted that um, the Treasury Department is still in the process of uh, developing regulations and procedures to clarify and define how uh, these expenditures can be used, the eligibility rules. Um, but staff did want to get Council's early direction on how it would like to see these funds uh, utilized. Uh, and staff has put together uh, a listing of recommendations, uh, which you see in this slide. So that, as you can see, there's a variety of uh, different uh, uh, uses of these um, funds. And some of these recommendations uh, that are being re uh, recommended include uh, rent relief, uh, safe parking and homelessness services, uh, developing economic vitality strategy for the city, uh, and providing residential small business relief for delinquent utility bills, uh, as well as providing some of the gap uh, funding that was mentioned in the last uh, item. So staff is going to be looking for council's feedback tonight on how uh, the funds may best be utilized. And I would also like to point out that um, staff is recommending that uh, the full amount not be allocated uh, just yet because there will be uh, needed room for change. Um, and also, uh, the city is not absolutely sure that that 7.4 will be the final amount allocated because they are still finalizing uh, this information and it's possible that it could be uh, less than the, the amount that we indicated. So uh, this will be brought back to council in June at the uh, recommended budget. So uh, there will be another opportunity to finalize um, uh, the decisions on this. Uh, and, and here just really uh, quickly the next steps that are left in the budget process. Uh, finish up the CIP, uh, another study session, as well as adopt the CIP. Uh, and also in June we'll have the recommended budget, uh, as well as um, public hearing for utility rates and uh, the budget adoption at the uh, 22nd uh, June meeting. And that concludes uh, staff's presentations. Uh, this last slide is really just the two recommendations for this item to uh, accept uh, and file the report and then to discuss and provide feedback on the uh, ARP um, recommendations. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so um, at this point, we'll bring it back to council questions before, before going to public comment. So do any council members um, have any questions that they would like to ask of staff? Council Member Walter. 
Yeah, I have two questions. Um, when do you think we'll know the amount? And when do you think we'll know what the rules are? Um, <clears throat> sure, thank you for the question. So the, uh, the uh, legislation requires that the um, Treasury uh, issue these within 60 days. Um, and so we are actually expecting by uh, May that uh, they will be coming out with uh, these these rules as well as the, the final amount. But um, we have not heard otherwise. So we are expecting it to, to be coming soon um, by, by next month. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ravi Koga. Thank you. Um, in regards to our budget, um, I'm excited that we got the ERAF funding to um, put us not in the negative or out of the negative and into the positive. Um, but I realize that that's um, limited funding. It's um, not ongoing. So um, it, will we see the in the next budget discussion the five year forecast? I am. Um, you know, my concern is that I don't, based on past practices is not necessarily a structurally balanced budget. Um, and so I'm, I'm just uh, concerned about that and whether that's something that will continue or, or will go back to a deficit if once the ERAF funding is over. Um, so will you be able to provide that information next time we talk about this? Yeah, the five-year funding um, or the five-year forecast will be uh, provided with the recommended budget on June 8th. So we will see the rest of the remaining years. Um, st staff had, you know, built in um, uh, some its preliminary assumptions that, um, you know, the recovery would continue in those out years. And so while there is um, some potential issues in year three, um, you know, going beyond that, uh, that some of that is, is um, provided for with additional growth in, in revenues. So, um, but we are still going to be finalizing that and it will be brought back uh, at the June meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for council members? All right, so seeing none, we can turn it over to um, public comment. Would any member of the public on the line like to provide comment on this item? If so, please click the raise hand button in Zoom or press star nine on your phone, and we'll display our two minute timer. Fernando Romero. Hello, good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Fernando Romero. I have been a Montby resident for about 19 years. I am on the Human Relations Commission and I'm a graduate of the city's Spanish Leadership Academy. Um, this evening, I'm not speaking for representing the Human Relations Commission. I'm speaking and representing myself only. Therefore, um, I'm speaking tonight in support of the MB Solidarity Fund uh, I met most of the leaders of, of MB Solidarity Fund through the academia, including Paula Perez, Olga Melo, Nadia Mora, Azucena Castañón, Sonia Sequeros, Marilu Cuesta, and Nura Bonhoff. I have always been in, impressed with their heart, passion, and experience leading in the community. I recently learned about their work with the MB Solidarity Fund. I am so excited and grateful that these incredible women from our community have been quietly supporting and documented families who have fallen through the cracks in this hard time. I really hope that they can get more funding to do more of this work. I saw on the City Council agenda item 8.1 for uh, this evening that you will decide how to allocate $7.4 million from the American Rescue Plan, including $3 million that does not yet have a staff recommendation. I know so many people in my community, especially in the community, mixed status families have been struggling this time. And I know that racial equity in our community for, has been part of what our city has been working towards. So I ask that you commit $3 million in funding for flexible financial assistance for Latino families who have suffered greatly during the pandemic. And all, also, I hope that you allocate half of that funding to the MB Solidarity Fund. Community leaders like Paula Olga, Susana, Sonia, Marilu, Nadia, Nura. 
Thank yeah, you, Fernando. I understand the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Philip Cosby. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Philip Cosby with the Kappa Cito and St. Athanasius. Each week our Kappa Cito meets and we hear stories of struggling families who have lost income due to COVID and are struggling to pay their rent. And we're very grateful that the city has provided rent relief funds and also additional funds are coming from SB 91. But these funds go directly to the landlords to pay unpaid rent. What we don't know is that many families have been striving to pay the rent, striving not to receive those eviction notices, and have borrowed money from friends and relatives, have run up big balances on their credit cards to stay current with rent. And while that's admirable, there's really no relief available to them because sending a check to the landlord doesn't reduce the balance on their credit card. So I was going to suggest that we use some of the ARP money to be more broadly available to relieve struggling families. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Tim McKenzie. Hi, thanks for unmuting me. Um, I'll first start and say echo uh, what Bill just said. I think that like uh, helping the actual people that we live with is really important, um, and not just funneling money towards landlords. Um, and I just uh, seeing that this that we're recommending for the budget for approval and meeting in June. I can't help but remember. A year ago in June, when we again stayed up to the wee hours of the morning um, talking about the budget, and there was huge public outcry asking for a reduction in the police budget. Um, I've continued to talk at any time the budget has come up asking for this. Um, I, one specific item that's come up in recent weeks is removing SROs from schools. Um, that's, uh, I would just like to. Again, reemphasize the uh, uh, the the need to reimagine uh, how we keep our community safe and uh, stop funneling money towards uh, carceral and punitive methods and uh, move money from the police budget towards things that will actually uh, better serve the needs of our community. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you, Alexander Brown. Okay, now you can hear me. Yes. <laughs> you missed my whole intro. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody said the magic words. Jesse, municipal broadband. Oh, oh, that was so exciting. I want it. I want it so bad. But I wish that we were in a position that we could actually get it because we didn't need to spend so much money to help people who are facing issues with their housing because we've been running in circles for years, people struggling to pay rent and just stay in their homes and be a part of the community. And, you know, we keep facing the same issues of not, not no affordable places where they live. They get burdened. They can't pay rent. They get forced out. Places get redeveloped. And we lose uh, valuable neighbors and people who we love. Uh, but yeah, no, I really want musical broadband. Uh, I, wish, I wish that we didn't have to spend so much money on housing all the time and just funnel it to land barons. And instead, we could use it to help the people who are actually within the city living here to enjoy their lives more with fast internet so they can stream Godzilla vs. Kong on HBO Max. I'm not sponsored. I, I, I haven't watched it yet. All right. Uh, but no, this, this, this is good. Most of these organizations are great. And uh, thanks. thank you for, again, giving money to people who actually need it. Uh, this is this is the part of the city thing that I love, where we're doing on the ground work to help people who need help. That's great. Thanks. Thank you, Olga Mo.
Hello. 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 Hi. Oh. Hi. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Mi nombre es Olga Melo. Soy parte del fondo del grupo de solidaridad. Gracias por permitir expresar nuestras ideas. Después de probar una redistribución de fondos liderada por nuestra comunidad en mayo y junio del 2020, decidimos asociarnos y obtener el patrocinio fiscal de los Altos Community Foundation para fortalecer nuestra infraestructura financiera y administrativa bajo el 501C3. En los últimos meses recaudamos y redistribuimos 50 mil dólares en asistencia financiera flexible a 50 familias indocumentadas. Tenemos otros 50 mil en promesa. Nuestra limitación es financiera. Tenemos toda la capacidad para aumentar significativamente nuestro alcance a cientos de familias. Imag Pensamos que hay mucha necesidad financiera en este momento. Creemos que la recuperación económica Creemos que la recuperación económica, perdón, está bien, te puedes seguir, está bien. Debe, debe centrarse a los más afectados de la comunidad, la cual incluye inmigrantes latinos de clase trabajadora, familias indocumentadas y estatus mixto. Vemos que las familias están regresando lentamente al trabajo a medida que escuelas y negocios reabren. Por lo tanto, podemos imaginar que las familias latinas clase trabajadora en particular, necesitan meses para recuperarse y que asistencia financiera flexible sostenida durante un periodo puede ser lo que nuestra comunidad necesite. Tenemos la siguiente recomendación, que el Consejo dé la oportunidad a Fondo de Soledad de ser un método más para distribuir parte de los fondos del Plan de Rescate Universal, ya que somos personas de la comunidad más impactada y así tendremos más de una oportunidad para autodeterminar la administración y recurso y diseño. Sabemos que hay muchas organizaciones lucrativas como C6, Centro Obrero, Rich Potential Movement, iglesias y grupos comunitarios que trabajan arduamente para apoyar a la comunidad más vulnerable. Y apreciamos mucho su gran labor, así como nuestro grupo de fondos de solidaridad, el cual responde a las necesidades entiende y respeta las diferencias culturales y lingüísticas, ya que este proyecto surgió de la gran necesidad, creando un gran liderazgo interno. Montenegro siempre se ha caracterizado por estar siempre en la vanguardia de los cambios. Esta es la oportunidad de ofrecernos como grupo un espacio para llevar verdaderas soluciones a la comunidad hispana que se apegue a nuestra realidad. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Olga. Y yo pienso que Anthony va a tra traducir, ¿sí? Sí. Ok, gracias. muchas gracias. Ok. Great, thank you. Ok. So, um, colleagues, we weren't able to get um, Spanish translation for tonight's meeting, unfortunately. Um, Olga is one of the uh, leaders of the Mountain View Solidarity Fund. And um, I believe Anthony Chang, who is also part of the group, uh, will be speaking later and will be providing, I think, a bit of context and a little bit of translation um, about Olga's statement. So I just wanted to let everybody know about that. All right, uh, pa Paula Perez. Hola, ¿me escuchan? Sí. Hola, Paula. Hola. Buenas noches a todos, estimados concejales de la ciudad de Montenvio. Mi nombre es Paula Pérez. Vivo en Montenvio por más de 20 años y soy una líder comunitaria activa. También soy graduada de la Academia de Liderazgo Cívico en Español en el 2017. Hoy quiero decir gracias a ustedes por todo lo que hacen por nuestra comunidad y me dirijo a ustedes respetuosamente en representación de siete compañeras líderes y nuestro compañero Anthony Chan. Todos somos líderes voluntarios de Fondo de Solidaridad de Montenvio. Y quiero enfatizar que Fondo de Solidaridad de Montenvio es solo un paso más reciente en un arco largo de más de 20 años de organización comunitaria por la comunidad y para la comunidad. 
Sabemos que hoy ustedes están dando re recomendaciones al personal de la ciudad sobre la financiación del plan de rescate americano. Y nosotros tenemos las siguientes recomendaciones para la financiación de este plan de rescate americano. Primero, utilizar 3 millones de los fondos del plan de rescate americano de la ciudad para respaldar los fondos para asistencia financiera flexible y o un piloto de ingresos garantizados para promover la recuperación económica de las familias más afectadas por la pandemia, incluidas las familias inmigrantes latinas indocumentadas y de estatus mixto. Así como también asignar la mitad de estos 3 millones de fondos, o sea, un millón y medio, al Fondo de Solidaridad de Mountain View, para que las personas de la comunidad latina que están más cerca de los problemas que enfrentan las familias indocumentadas, que son las líderes voluntarias del Fondo de Solidaridad de Mountain View, tengan la oportunidad de distribuir estos fondos a través de procesos que pueden funcionar bien para la com comunidad. A continuación se muestran algunas de nuestras consideraciones al realizar estas recomendaciones. Primero, necesidad en la comunidad. Como un grupo de inmigrantes latinas, principalmente de clase trabajadora y padres de niños en edad escolar que han vivido en Montenvío entre 5 y 20 años, vemos todos los días la devastación económica y el estrés que la pandemia ha dejado en nuestra comunidad, la cual ha sido la más impactada en este tiempo. A pesar del aumento de las vacunas y la reapertura gradual de escuelas y negocios, sabemos que la comunidad latina aún tiene un largo camino hacia la recuperación económica durante el próximo año. Así, oportunidad para los líderes, para el liderazgo latino, para satisfacer las necesidades de la comunidad. Gracias, Paula. Hace tiempo. Lo siento. Es tiempo. Salve. Gracias. Gracias. Sí, muchísimas gracias. Laura Blakely. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I'm here this evening speaking in my personal capacity and wanted to echo support for the Mountain View Solidarity Fund that was put together by members of our Latinx community who have graduated from the city Spanish Leadership Academy to help other Spanish speaking families in our community who are suffering in this current environment, especially those who are undocumented and mixed status families who have not had access to much of the federal aid that has been offered so far. I've personally known Paula, Olga, and other leaders in this group for many, many years through their you know, relentless volunteer efforts at our local schools. They are pillars of our school community and just incredibly reliable and caring people. And I'm so impressed by this fund that they have put together. Um, it's exactly the kind of thing that I think the city's leadership, Spanish Leadership Academy was um, formed to help develop and they are really, you know, carrying that promise to help our community. And I'm, I'm, I'm super proud of them. Um, I understand that there may be some legal um, restrictions in the ARP that prevent certain portions of the funding to go to undocumented families. But my understanding is there may be other portions of it that are available to help. And so I hope that the city can allocate money that is permissible under that law, um, a significant portion of the unallocated funds to help the effort that the, um, that the fund is putting together. Um, they truly know our community and are in a great position to help those people that are most in need. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Anthony Chang. Hello. Thank Hello. you, City Council. Oh. 
Thank you, City Council members. My name is Anthony Chang. I'm here supporting the Mountain View Solidarity Fund. My colleagues Paula Perez and Olga Melo spoke earlier in Spanish, and I want to reinforce some key points they made. First, Mountain View Solidarity Fund is a group of primarily Latino volunteers who are graduates of the city's Spanish Language Leadership Academy and working class parents who have 20 years of experience organizing the Latino community here in Mountain View. We are here to make the following recommendations as you give staff direction on the American Rescue Plan funding. We recommend $3 million go towards flexible financial assistance and or a guaranteed income pilot to promote economic recovery for families hit hardest by the pandemic, including Latino undocumented and mixed status families in our community. We also recommend that the city consider allocating half of this $3 million to Mountain View Solidarity Fund so that most impacted communities can have an opportunity to design and run programs for their communities. Our considerations in making this recommendation include, first, there continue to be huge needs among the most vulnerable in our community because of the pandemic. Second, there's a huge opportunity to center the leadership of the Latino community leaders who come from our most vulnerable communities in designing solutions that best meet their needs. Third, Mountain View Solidarity Fund through fiscal sponsorship by Los Altos Community Foundation has the capacity to meet financial assistance needs of hundreds of families in our community. Our biggest limitation is funding. Fourth, we believe that economic recovery in Mountain View needs to center the most impacted in our community, which includes working class Latino immigrants, undocumented and mixed status families, single parents, essential workers, and more. Next, we recognize that $1.5 million is a large ask. At the same time, we see it as a bold continuation of the $4 million in rent relief fun funds channeled through CSA over the last year. We see an opportunity for Mountain View to think bigger and more creatively. For example, a community-led universal basic income pilot could put Mountain View on the forefront of how to support economic recovery for most vulnerable in, the, in our communities. Lastly, we want to be clear that we're advocating a both-and strategy of supporting groups like CSA as well as Latino-led efforts like ours. Thank you. Great, thank you. So that concludes public comment. So we can bring it back to council for uh, questions and deliberation. Council member Abe Koga. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions to start out with that came up um, after yes for questions. Um, I'm looking at the list of recommendations for possible uses. Um, I, I saw the transit center master plan um, in light of us um, earlier um, deciding to re just defer or remove the um, AGT project. I'm wondering if we could divert those funds to the transit master plan because it just seems more like a capital project item. Uh, good, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. This is Don Cameron, Public Works Director. Uh, yes, that's certainly possible to do, because as you mentioned, uh, we will be defunding that CIP, which included $500,000 of city funds that we could redirect and fulfill that $100,000 need for the Transit Center Master Plan Additional Study. Okay, great, thank you. And then um, I noticed the CHAC one-time funding and was hoping to get more details of what that entails. Thank you, Councilmember Abikoka. So the CHAC one-time funding is to um, help CHAC with additional uh, needs related to mental health work that they're doing in the community and also for um, internal efforts to address diversity and inclusion for their own team. And uh, CHAC has uh, requested a 5% increase to their ongoing funding, which, which will be included in the recommended budget. Uh, so this is uh, supplemental funds that I understand they have requested from all the members of the uh, JPA, including the city. Have they um, requested the same amount from each of the JPA members or is it based on, usually based it on population or use or some, some criteria? From what I understand, they have not asked for the same amount from each um, entity in the JPA, but I cannot confirm the exact amounts uh, that the other agencies were asked for. I do know that this ask was based on uh, what they assessed was their proportional um, share of uh, Mountain View residents um, based in Mountain View. So uh, their percentage that they equated to the city might have been different than the percentage to the other JPA members. 
And then I third, I seem to recall we, we received a request for one-time funds last year, was it? Uh, in, in previous years. Is that right? I, I'm trying to... That is accurate. Okay, thank you. Um, so those are my questions and then um, comments. Um, I want to, again, thank staff for all of your hard work. The budget is always a, a big effort, and um, it takes a whole in organiz entire organization to, to come up with it. So um, I appreciate this. And I know because of COVID, we've had to review this more frequently. We agreed to do it quarterly. So I um, appreciate the work put into the, these documents. I am very pleased that we are in a pos uh, looking at a positive uh, situation, um, getting out, out of the negative uh, category. So that is very promising. Um, and um, you know, thank you to the federal government and the new administration for the ARPA funds. Um, I appreciate the recommended uses. Um, I would just. Uh, suggest as I my question um, referred to the master plan and, and maybe looking at using um, CIP funding um, from the AGT project if not others um, to to fund that that item um, my interest with ARPA and reading the guidelines for ARPA um, and also just in terms of um, you know our situation with the pandemic um, is really to try to get as much assistance to um, folks, businesses, individuals, families, um, as directly and quickly as possible. Um, that was why last year when we got, went into sheltering in place, um, I had um, advocated for the rent relief program to be enhanced. And, and I think that that, ha that program has shown success. Um, so um, that is my, that's been my primary interest. I support the um, other items on here um, because they do provide relief for residents with utility bills, um, continuing rent relief, um, small business and whatnot. Um, and then I guess there's a, a, the question of um, if we have any other recommendations. And um, this is where um, since last year uh, with COVID, as I as we talked about the CARES Act funding and, and the various assistance, assistance that was coming in, um, I started to think about um, whether we could engage and embark in a pilot program for universal basic income. It's something that um, came up in the last presidential election. And so I took very, um, interest in that. And um, you know, since then, there have been very many uh, cities that have engaged in pilot programs. Um, they tended to be larger, but uh, most recently, South San Francisco, with a population of about 70,000, so a little smaller than us, um, is engaging in a UBI pilot program. And so that um, made me think that if they can do it, maybe we can do it too. Um, I did a little bit of um, asking around. I asked the Silicon Valley Community Foundation if they um, had been engaged in uh, UBI programs, and they have been. Uh, they they uh, referred me to this uh, group called the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, which is uh, national. Uh, you probably, many people probably have heard about the Stockton Mayor doing a UBI program, and he has been leading this um, organization, and they provide technical assistance. And the Community Foundation um, said had has said to me that they would be open to just get talking with us um, to maybe um, provide some technical assistance or evaluation assistance and so forth. So um, my hope was to, if, if I'm hoping to get support tonight from my colleagues to um, explore a pilot universal basic income project. Of course, it would be um, limited, but it's a pilot program. I think the you know, big piece of this is to track success and 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 have measurables and the data and and then and knowing that there is this national movement i think we might benefit from being a part of that um so my hope um my ask um i i don't have any uh, why real i guess backing on you know why but my thought was um, looking at other programs, if we did $500 or around $500 a 
person or household for a year since this is year's funding um, and equating to about a million dollars set aside for a pilot program um, that might be a, a, a robust enough program for us to um, get some good results and good data. So that would be my request. Um, I certainly um, am interested in the Solidarity Fund, but um, I remember last year when I was in conversations with various groups about the Silicon Valley Strong Financial Assistance Program, there were some restrictions with the funding, federal funding. And so my ask would be to um, ask staff to look into what the guidelines are um, and come back to us with more information as to how our, the ARPA funds can be accessed. But um, yeah, the, my other, my, my big ask is a universal basic income pilot program. Thank you. Great, thank you, and, and apologies. So just um, as we're taking more notes on, on things people are suggesting as I pull my pen out here. Um, so staff has presented you know, pre preliminary recommendation on how to use these American Rescue Plan Act funding for various programs and priorities. So if a council member wishes to modify any of the recommended allocations for these items, uh, we, meet, we may need to take a motion to determine if there is majority support for any modifications. Staff will assess the final American Rescue Plan Act funding amount and then incorporate the uses into the recommended budget, which will come back to Council um, on June 8th. So um, apologies for that. All right, so next I saw the Vice Mayor's hand. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Echoing the sentiments uh, expressed by Councilmember Abe Koga, I'd also like to thank staff for uh, all of your work on preparing the budget and the analysis necessary to uh, generate the recommendations that we rely on. So thank you. Um, and, and very similarly, I think just sharing our goals and intentions for the federal funding may be instructive. Uh, personally, I think that two priorities I have are COVID response and relief uh, and then poverty alleviation. I feel like the highest and best use of the money is to get it back in the community as quickly as possible uh, to help people address whatever financial concerns that they have to stabilize businesses, keep people employed, keep people housed. Um, so those are, those are, the things that I'm hoping we can we can commit the, the funding to. Um, I did want to put on my uh, John McAllister hat and try and make a comprehensive motion and do my best <laughs> to accommodate all of the uh, the interests and concerns of all of my colleagues. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Uh, I did request uh, of staff um, in advance of the meeting, I don't know if you had a chance to do this, to prepare a spreadsheet just so that way we can better track um, the any modifications provided by the council. If that's possible, great. If not, no worries. I'll try and be as clear as I can. Um, so I'll go ahead and move uh, as a starting point the staff recommendation for the use of the federal funds. Um, but I'm, I'm going to make it a little bit uh, a little bit broader in saying that we're simply providing staff direction to figure out how to make our recommendations possible and to return in June with those recommendations. So uh, this will primarily be the federal ARPA funds. If there are creative things we have to do to make some of these things work, then uh, we would be open to, to seeing if, if, if there, there are other things we might have to do, other sources of funding that we can tap into. Um, so that's that's the starting point. Um, so I uh, really appreciate Councilmember Abikoga's suggestion to explore universal basic income. I think this is uh, a great opportunity to try an innovative program like that. Um, and one of the things that we've seen in other communities that have tried it is some success in leveraging private philanthropic funding and I'm hoping that we could do something very similar here that's true for everything but I think there's there's something attractive about UBI that has been 
you know, more successful in, uh, in, you know, leveraging foundation money and, and corporate funding. So that's one of the things I'm hoping we can, we can do with that. So, um, here's the grand compromise. $1 million for a universal basic income program. Staff would flesh out the details. And if we could work with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation or similar uh, uh, foundation to make this happen, I think that would be ideal. Um, $1 million for the Mountain View Solidarity Fund. We've gotten very strong community support for exploring this. I like the idea of supporting a grassroots organization. Um, that can deploy funding fairly quickly. Um, and again, that's just trying to uh, provide direction to staff to see if we can make that work. And then uh, the $1 million that's currently recommended for rent relief, we would provide to CSA, but with slightly different parameters. My strong recommendation would be that we allocate 750,000 of that for direct financial assistance. And the reason is the Solidarity Fund will help some number of people, but CSA has been a tremendous community partner who can access other groups that the Solidarity Fund may not benefit. And I think it's really important that we reach out as, as expansively as possible uh, to every group within our community who needs assistance and CSA I think has a demonstrated track record of doing that. So instead of $1 million for rent relief, it would be 750,000 for direct financial assistance. And then the remaining 250,000 we would leave to CSA's discretion. That could be rent relief. That could be homeless services, but the intention is to give CSA knows their clients. They know the need. And I want to give them flexibility to determine how best to use that funding. Uh, and then the, uh, the additional component of this is that we would provide staff the authority to negotiate an administrative fee consistent with prior direction the council has given when we've allocated rent relief funding because there's a cost to administering these programs. So those are the big asks. Um, I do agree with Council Member Abekoga that the Transit Center Master Plan is important, but I think there are other ways we could fund that. And so my recommendation would be that that one hundred thousand allocation, one hundred thousand dollar allocation, instead be used for the Small Business Grant Program. And if not all of that is allocated for Small Business Grants, then Small Business Relief, whatever may make sense. So we want to make sure that we're able to maximize our assistance to, to the small business community. Um, and then uh, the, the last modification would be that $50,000, so a relatively small amount, would be subtracted from the technology equipment, hardware, and IT contracts item, and instead supplement the eviction uh, prevention and defense program. And the reason I think that's important is the 45000 that has been allocated so far is a great start, but I think that the expiration of the eviction moratorium will generate far greater need for uh, legal assistance, and I want to be prepared for that. Uh, so that's the motion. It leaves a million dollars as a buffer consistent with a staff recommendation not to allocate the full amount um, and uh, it provides staff the flexibility to return with modifications as need be in order to help implement the programs that were and the and the services that we're, we're, we're trying to um, to support uh, so I'm happy to go over that again if it's helpful um, but uh, I'll, I'll go we'll go ahead and stop there hear comments and modify as, as needed thank you okay so um before we continue i just wanted to check in so city manager mccarthy do you have that spreadsheet that we can share so that people can see what the vice okay great okay 
I think now it's too small. Perfect. Okay, so I see you making some tweaks. So I think before we go into my colleagues who have their hands up, I just want to double check with the vice mayor. So let's just go through this. So is this correct? Um, the one, so the transit center master plan would be, would be eliminated and that funding would be reallocated for the small business grant. So the small business grant is correct at 235,000 but we would have to remove the transit center master plan. Okay, so it looks like the changes are in red. Is that right, City Manager McCarthy? Okay, does this look right, Vice Mayor? Um, y yes, but I think we, st we still have number 25, line item 25 still lists the transit center master plan. So we would just delete that 100, that, that whole row, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then I think that's, that's correct. Okay. All right. So is everybody, I guess everyone can see the, the new proposal. So Vice, Vice Mayor, this is your proposal and you're looking for a second, right? Is this your motion? Yes. Okay, all right. So we have a motion from Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Ramirez on um, these funding, um, this new funding um, allocation. All right, Council Member Hicks. So I'm not ready to second it yet. I had a few comments of my own. So would you like to look for a seconder first? It looks like it's council member Abikoga seconding. I can't see her, I'm sorry. Let's see. Okay, council member Abikoga, thanks for the second. Perfect. All right, so we have a motion from council member Ramirez with a second by council member Abikoga, and then we can go back to you, council member Hicks with your questions and comments. Yeah, so I like the direction this is going in. Oh, I wanted to keep seeing the spreadsheet, though, <laughs> because I haven't memorized it. So um, the additional things that I'm wondering is whether, uh, is whether safe parking and homeless services need, as I've, I've heard from uh, homeless providers that there's been uh, sort of an, an, an increase in the individuals affected there if that might need some augmentation. Um, and, and, and I should say, maybe I sh should start by saying what other council members have said. Yes, I want this money used for, um, I want it used for relief from the pandemic and to get to, out to people as quickly as possible. I um, am very supportive of, you know, the suggestions of the Solidarity Fund. Um, I have, have felt that I, we, that the Latinx community is very impacted and that we haven't heard enough from them when, during these discussions. So I'm, I'm glad that we're now doing so. Um, so then looking at the line items under that, I spoke to safe parking. Uh, I would agree with the CSA direct financial assistance. I like that it's getting more flexible than giving um, just rent relief. I like that we're moving in that direction. I also agree that the, yeah, the small business grants, economic vitality, Castro Streets, that getting those businesses up and running, those you know provide a lot of jobs, particularly, frankly, for some of our more vulnerable population that have been laid off. So I like getting those up and running again. Um, and the utility. So then um, I'm not going to comment on every item. I agree with uh, switching the technology to the um, to the eviction, a portion of the technology items to the eviction defense. Um, I am, 
I'm uh, hoping to hear a little more. The, the universal basic income programs that I've heard about have been uh, fully funded by foundations. So I'm hoping that we, when this, I'm wanting to know a little more about how this will come back to us and how these various funds interact and how they'll be dispensed. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering, the universal basic income programs that I've read about have been uh, a, um, they've been randomly given out, they've been sort of names have been drawn out of a hat. I'm not sure, and it seems like they could be duplicative of people who are applying for other forms of assistance. I'd like a little more, I'd like a little, it to come back to us with a little more information on on how these various funds are working and how they're working together. Um, and also how other populations can access some of them. I'll give an example. Um, I know a lot of uh, Turkish immigrants who work as uh, busboys and waiters and so forth because my husband's Turkish, who've been laid off. Would they have trouble? How, could they access the Solidarity Fund because they're not Spanish speaking? So how would other populations access that or would they go to CSA? I feel like there's some questions that are open to that are that are that I um, don't have answered at this point. So those are my comments on what's been laid out. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Matichek. Thanks. Um, yeah, I feel like I need more information on um, the basic income. Um, you know, if you have a pilot, um, what happens at the end of that pilot? Is this something that we're envisioning the city fund ongoing, or as Council Member Hicks was saying, a foundation? Um, I guess I worry about doing a pilot and then really not having the funds to continue it when folks have potentially, you know, come to rely on it. And so I really want to understand what that whole program would look like. Um, I also wonder, um, you know, the state now has um, a lot of funding for rent relief, and that if a landlord accepts 80%, 20% is forgiven. And I'm kind of wondering how this that factors into all of this, both in the programs that CSA is running, as well as, well, in what staff originally proposed, and then potentially through the Solidarity Fund, and um, how, how would that be factored in? I kind of feel like I would like this, maybe the city to help educate folks about that program, because if we could use um, other money to help pay the rent, then we could use the money that staff originally proposed for rent relief for people who might not be eligible for this state program. It's my understanding that that goes up to 80% of AMI and that 80 to 120 is kind of a gap. Um, and then, um, you know, how, how do we, as sort of council member Hicks was saying, how do these all kind of fit together? Um, because I, I kind of want to make sure we're optimizing what we're doing and um, not overlapping, so to speak, and that we're taking advantage of resources that are available from other you know, sources um, so that we can maximize the impact. Um, I'd also like to understand more about the Solidarity Fund. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish. Um, and um, I have not had the opportunity to have a, a meeting with them yet. Uh, we are trying to find a date. So I don't really know much about it. You know, I'd like to know um, how the folks are identified who might receive help and what is the, the um, help being provided for? Is it rent, food, something else? Um, you know, what sort of um, tracking or, you know, we get a lot of metrics from CSA. Would, would we have any from the Solidarity Fund to understand the impact of the 
the resources. Um, I appreciate uh, the suggestion for more resources for our small businesses, uh, given that um, 135 would be quickly absorbed. Um, I think it is important to add more there. Um, and I, I actually support even more going to our small businesses. Um, so in some ways, I feel like I have more questions than I have answers. Thanks. Thank you. Vice Mayor Ness. Thank you, Mayor. I think there were a lot of good questions and, and reasonable concerns, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to speak to as many as I can remember. Um, so uh, regarding the, the utility of the Solidarity Fund, it's pretty similar to the concept that I think will also be addressed with CSA Direct Financial Assistance. Um, both are basically one-time payments to families in need. Uh, and CSA and the Solidarity Fund may have different parameters for their programs. I don't know what the maximum grants or checks from CSA would be. I think we heard from the Solidarity Fund that it's $1,000 that they provide to the households that are selected for assistance. Um, it's, they both have utility in stabilizing families who have some immediate financial impact or who have to pay off debt right now. Um, and I characterize those, they're, they're both important. It's, it's different from universal basic income in that UBI is more a poverty alleviation tool, right? So a family might be, you know, just barely scraping by, you know, multiple jobs and that kind of thing. And what UBI can do is buy folks some space and time to complete, you know, a certification program or a, uh, you know, a, a maybe get enough credits at a community college to get a degree or something like that. But it gives people some time and space uh, to, to get out of poverty, something that direct financial assistance will never be able to do, as important as that is. Uh, the, other, the other advantage of shifting to direct financial assistance is it empowers the household to decide how to use that funding. Rent relief is great. But you can only be used for one thing, and that's getting out of rent debt. But if you've got credit card debt, or uh, I think we had examples of folks um, uh, borrowing money from friends and families, they, they want to stay on top of their rent. But now they've incurred different debt that rent relief can't assist with. So that's, that's where I'm thinking direct financial assistance can be especially valuable as the eviction moratorium expires. I think there's going to be a lot of need for some quick assistance. Um, and uh, and direct financial assistance has the advantage of, of being able to go directly to the household where with rent relief you have to you know work with the, the landlord. Not that landlords are bad, but it just takes some time. You have to contact them. They have to be willing to accept the payment. Um, I think you know Tom and CSA have done a great job, but they've also been very honest about how logistically it's just a little bit more challenging than direct financial assistance. Um, and so, so having three different programs, I think, allows for uh, access to different communities, different program parameters that address different kinds of need, um, you know, and some space to, to better understand, you know, how we can engage certain communities and, and how we can meet those kinds of need. Uh, I think there was a great question about what happens at the end of the pilot. Um, I'm thinking that if the pilot is successful, We've got uh, the second tranche of funding from the federal government that we could choose to supplement any of these programs or all. Or if we find we don't have that kind of immediate financial need, we can transition to some of the things that staff was looking at for you know, capital improvements and that kind of thing. But we do have another roughly $7 million that um, we'll have access to next year, uh, which I think can help build on the work that we're doing right now. Um, so I think I, I, I think I'll stop there. there. I think there were some other questions, but I can't remember what they were offhand. Maybe something that Robbie Koga remembers. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. So um, I, th I thought I'd just maybe share a couple things that I heard from the the public comment from our from our two speakers in Spanish. So, you know, the the two women are. Um, 
two of the, the leaders in the group. I think there are about eight women um, from the Latino community. Um, and they, the Mountain View Solidarity Fund um, has been around for over 20 years. And so some of the things they were talking about was how the, um, you know, the Latino community has been the most affected by the pandemic, both in terms of the virus, but in terms of also the their families and the, the workforce. Um, and so they've been able to raise uh, $50,000 and been able to redistribute to that to over 40 families. And then they're also raising another $50,000. Um, and so um, I think we've got a letter too from the Los Altos Community Foundation. So the Los Altos Community Foundation is the fiscal agent for um, the Mountain View Solidarity Fund. So it's just a little bit about kind of what they were talking about and um, you know, one of them was was mentioning that they're they're graduate of the 2018 class of the Spanish Language Academy, um, and you know, kind of their involvement in the community. I know some of them um, were part of a, a group that um, did a pop up vaccine site for the Latino community, signing up over 300 people to get their vaccines. Um, so um, that was was part of the history that they were sharing, and just kind of wanting to find ways to be able to. Um, and if we distribute funds back into the community of those who are hardest hit. So hopefully that helps. Um, Council Member Abby Koga. Um, if Council Member Showalter would like to go, I, I don't think we've heard from her. Um, happy sure. to be yeah. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there were a couple things I wanted to say. Um, recently, I, I read a book uh, for a book club called um, Good Economics for Hard Times. It's by two MIT professors, um, Banerjee and Duflo. Uh, not terribly light reading, but not horrible. <laughs> anyway, they have a big section on UBI and how um, its effectiveness compared to more traditional um, assistance programs. And I, I really found it um, quite convincing and, and fascinating. So I, I would just, you know, I'll send. I'll send this out to everybody that people might want to read this this book. It's it's for an economics book. It's well written, um, but I I'm, I um I like these ideas, but I'm a little um, I'm a little uh, uncomfortable with the magnitude of the contributions that we're giving um, or, or we're talking about giving until we have a little bit more information. Um, for instance, the UBI, who would administer that? Um, it seemed like in the conversations we were having, the, the, the Solidarity Fund was saying, well, we would like money that we can, um, you know, we can just give out in the manner that we've been giving them out, or we could do a UBI. So is this, would this be, would both of these be through the Mountain View Solidarity Foundation, or would be, it be a second entity of the of the Los Altos Community Foundation that would do it, or would we administer it? I mean, it seems like there are a lot of questions about the logistics that are, are really pertinent that we would want uh, before we made a final uh, a decision on that. So tonight, well, that's my other question. So tonight, we are giving direction to staff to come back to us with um, uh, sort of logistics about how we would handle these things. Is that correct? I see, I see thumbs up and nodding heads. Mayor, Mayor, I may. Sure, of um, so we have about one month between now and bringing back the budget report. So realistically, I'm not quite sure that staff would be able to unpack how every program would work. Um, we actually will publish the report and it has to be in the system within three weeks. So we will find out probably by May 11th from the Treasury Department, because that's exactly 60 days from when the ARP was passed. May 11th, what the very specific allowable uh, uses are. And so we'll be able to at least take a deep dive into that with some of the questions that council members have raised. But as far as how an actual program would work, I know that UBI is very extensive. It often involves a lottery system, um, data as has been mentioned, if we're looking at a match. I, I don't realistically think that, that staff would have the answers on how the program would exactly work, but what we would be bringing back is your direction for you to you know allocate the funding where you've set your priorities. Staff will bring it back 
with all of the ways that we can fund it. And then we'll still need to work on what a program might look like. And we would still need to bring that back to council. Okay, then two more things I would like to mention. One, I'm really glad to see the um, money in there to pay for utility bills. Um, and, you know, in work that I do through Water Now Alliance, I, I hear from uh, other people around the country that, you know, people getting their water cut off or their power cut off during COVID has been a huge issue. And that hasn't happened here because we, we basically, you know, just said we're not going to do it. But now, you know, we're backfilling here to pay um, the costs of what, you know, what that has cost us. And I think that that is a really important thing to do because as well as people needing um, shelter, which of course they do with rent relief, they also need water and power. So, you know, I'm really glad that that's there. And I, I just wanted to bring that up because we hadn't mentioned it yet. And um, then the other thing I wanted to talk about is the language uh, talking about documented and undocumented people. Those are federal terms. In Mountain View, we don't ask anybody whether they're documented or do undocumented. Everything we do for the city, we do for residents. And, um, you know, that's, it's just, do you live here or not? That's, that's all, you know, that's how we distinguish. So that's, personally, I think that's the way it should be done. And that's how I want to go forward. So I would prefer that as we move forward, we talk about helping residents that need help. And um, uh, they're, um, you know, their status, uh, immigration status, is none of our business. And um, uh, so I, I just really feel important. That, you know, that was one of the things when Trump came into power that got to be so frightening for people. And that we just don't do that. And um, I'm really proud that we don't do that. I think that's great. Um, but let's continue. We help residents who need help. Not um, we, and that's and that's how we describe it. Well, that's how I like. Uh, that's how I'm going to describe it. And I hope you'll join me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilman Michelle Walter. And you know, your comments make me think of the visioning statement where we taught where we changed it to be a welcoming, right? A welcoming and vibrant place. And I think that's that. It harkens back to that what we talked about four hours ago, maybe. Okay. So, um, Councilmember Libra, and then Councilmember Matichek. Yeah, I, I'm pleased to see kind of a, a diversity of approaches in, in what's been put forward here. And also recognition of um, the complications of people's lives in, and shaping our approaches around their lives rather than expecting people to shape their lives around our approaches. And I think it's it's really, really important because we have a lot of residents who have had to tap out their credit cards, who've had to go to relatives uh, to get money, and then those relatives are short on money. And, and so I think that this is a very good um, basket of, of approaches. And we're also just very lucky to have the, the women and the men of the Solidarity Fund because going through those names, they're the same folks who show up to do the work on everything in the community. You know, you see, you see those same names over and over and over again. And um, I, I think that we're just very lucky to have their guidance and um, to have the ability to pursue these, these kind of uh, approaches. I think it's really going to help people in their lives. And, um, you know, so many of the people who are hurting right now have children. And that, that stress that people feel and that they try to shield their children from, uh, it does bleed through and it does impact all the different aspects of their lives. And um, if we can do anything to help relieve that, then I, I think it's just a very, very good thing to do. So I'm thankful to see this approach. Thank you. Councilman Matichek. Thanks. Um, one question is, um, do we have to allocate um, this money at the same time we finalize the budget? 
Councilmember Matashek, so no, technically you do not, but the budget will come on the 8th. It will be finally adopted on the 22nd, and then you take a summer recess until August. Um, so no, technically you would not have to allocate it with the budget, but um, the thought was that we would take the direction that you all give tonight and incorporate that as part of the recommended budget and then staff would then have to work on the programs um, and bring back to you how things would actually work at least with the ubi program since that would be something brand new and then obviously we need to look into the solidarity fund and how that would all work as well yeah, because I'm thinking there's some things here that I'm guessing many of us would feel comfortable with saying, okay, but for some there might be, um, we want a, a, just a little bit more information, um, even though we are saying, yes, you know, odds are we're going to do this, but um, we might want a little bit more information. So I was just kind of wondering. Um, I'm actually hoping that at some point we can talk about um, if any of these funds, not necessarily in the first tranche, but the second tranche, um, could go toward affordable housing. Um, there's always a need. We're always looking for funding for that. I'd love to have that conversation for the second tranche. Um, and um, I um, appreciate Councilmember Showalter's comments um, about residents. Um, I, I think the only time we do talk about um, documented or undocumented um, is when we're asking organizations if they ask if someone is documented or undocumented and if they say they do it's like well then you know that's that's not for us so um i appreciate that csa doesn't ask and the other organizations that we support don't ask it's not it's not important as you said these are residents and they need help so thanks great thank you so um Let's see, we had, we had had a motion and we had had a second. A motion from the vice mayor with his proposal, a second by council member Abe Koga. Um, is there more discussion? Is there more that, that staff needs from council at this point or? Uh, thank you, mayor. We would just need your um, go ahead with the recommendations and, and the motion, I believe. Um, that was made by the vice mayor. Okay, great. All right. Well, um, I, I don't have too much more to add. Um, you know, I, I think it's all been said and it's almost 1 a.m. So I want to be sensitive to time. Um, so I'm hoping when this comes around on the 8th, it won't be such a late hour so I can have a little bit um, more time to, to say what I think. Um, you know, when it comes to universal ba basic income, I've also heard it called you know, AGI, which is the guaranteed in, you know, adjusted guaranteed income. I think there's many different names for it. I think anyway, the cookie crumbles, you know, it, it just makes sense to be able to, like Council Marshall Walter said, it, financially, economically, it just makes more sense to, um, you know, provide assistance to, to residents. Um, and, and so I'm interested in the in the pilot program, whatever the, the iteration of that pilot program looks like. Um, you know, changes um, that the vice mayor and um, council member uh, Abe Koga put forward in terms of what we can explore. I think that, you know, part of what the American Rescue Plan funds are supposed to be are for, you know, COVID relief are supposed to be for how we navigate our community through the pandemic. And I see all of these items as rising to the top. I think, you know, our community was already suffering from a housing crisis and, um, you know, m many different other crises. And then we had the pandemic layered on, on top of that, which has been prolonged. So, um, you know, really seeing this as um, an opportunity to help all of our residents, as was discussed. So I think we can turn it over to our city clerk um, to do a roll call vote. Vice Mayor Ramirez. Yes. Councilmember Abicoga. Aye. Councilmember Hicks. Yes. Councilmember Lieberg. Aye. Councilmember Matichek. Yes. Councilmember Showalter. Yes. Mayor Kamek. Yes. Motion carries. Great. 
Thank you. All right, so this that concludes item 8.1. So we can move on to item nine, which is our council, staff, and committee reports. Um, as council um, decides if they have anything to report, I'll just like to announce that the city is accepting applications for our downtown committee that has openings for a downtown property owner and or a representative of a downtown business. The Performing Arts Committee and the Senior Advisory Committee also have openings. You're invited to apply on our website, which is mountainview.gov. Any council members have anything for item nine to report? Okay, seeing none, I'll move to item 10, which is our closed session report. City Attorney Chopra, do you have a closed session report? Yes, I do. I have one report tonight. Earlier this evening, the council met on a closed session. Taibi Tomasebi, claim number 21-5, and council voted unanimously to authorize the city attorney to reject the claim. Thank you very much. And I will move on to item 11, which is our adjournment. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next city council meeting will be May 11th, 2021. Until then, stay healthy, mask up, and our meeting is adjourned at 12.59 a.m. Thanks, everyone. Have a good morning. <laughs> Bye.